All right, I'm going to wait. Pe people are coming in. It takes a moment for them to come in from the waiting room. So I'm going to wait till everyone seems to be in the meeting before I welcome you all. Still got a few more. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Oddly enough, it's the amount is going up. I don't know how that works. Let's try it again. You know, let me just disable this. Hold on. Okay. We are just waiting for everyone to be able to come in from the waiting room. Hold on still, I still see more people. I'm trying to get them all in, almost there. Almost there. It says they're joining. I don't know if they're having their own sort of technical difficulty joining. I'm going to give them a couple more seconds. There are four people that I want to make sure are actually in here. I don't see Councillor Labarge. But... Um, when we do a roll call, we'll know for sure who's here. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna, it says they're joining, but they're not in yet. So I'm gonna assume that's that that's on their end and hopefully they will be able to get in here as soon as possible. Um, so I'm going to welcome you all. Good evening. Welcome to the June 3rd, 2020 budget hearing on the FY 2021 Northampton city budget. I am Gina Louise Shara and I will be presiding this evening. This meeting and all who participate in it with us on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. I am gonna open this evening by acknowledging yet another troubling chapter in a long history. The recent murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and those that have come before have no other explanation than racial hatred. And we have those in highest leadership that are not only sanctioning racist violence, not only stoking it, but are actually ordering it. There are peaceful protests demanding justice that never comes and protests that have erupted in yet more violence. When people take to the street en masse, it's always for a reason. When they do it during a pandemic from a virus that we know disproportionately kills people of color because of the inequality that is layered in every strata of our society. And when people take to the street anyway in that time, risking their lives in this additional way, it is hard proof that they do so because their reality is that their lives are always in grave danger. I'm gonna ask that we take a minute before we proceed um, with the rest of the meeting to think of these names that I mentioned and the many before them and think about a personal commitment to be a part of the change. So I'm gonna ask us to take a moment to reflect. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. 
I am going to go over the agenda and the process for this evening now. This is a public budget hearing, and we want to get to the part where we hear from the public. Um, for most of us on here right now, this is likely our first budget hearing. I think for all of us, this is our first remote budget hearing. This hearing is not the time that we, the council, are deliberating and voting on the budget. This is the time when we hear from department heads about their budgets, and the public has the floor to share their thoughts. We will begin with public comment as we do at all meetings. This is outside of the hearing on the budget and before the public hearing has been opened. You may speak during public comment on any topic, but if you are here to speak to the budget, that is the purpose of the hearing. And the public testimony that you give during the hearing becomes a part of the record of the hearing. Um, after general public comment, we will open the hearing with presentations on their budgets from the five invited department heads. Once the departmental presentations have concluded, we will open the public testimony on the budget. I want to make sure that the person speaking has the screen and the microphone. Zoom is a very awkward platform for these sorts of interactions. With a meeting of this size, with background noise, and with the way that Zoom functions, which focuses the screen, what's being viewed by people on sound, all participants Hello. will be muted until called upon for the hearing to function. Yes. Um, Hold on one sec. The link agenda? Sorry, apparently. Oh, sorry. Laura's getting a call. Um, so everyone is muted right now and can't unmute themselves. This is not how I like to run a meeting. Uh, it's not a way that I'm particularly comfortable, but there's no other way to have this many people and let anyone be heard. Um, in, this council has also previously experienced a very disturbing Zoom bombing incident a couple months ago. Um, and as the information for this meeting has been shared widely on social media, we need to protect against another incident. We will do our very best to act quickly if someone's acting clearly in a way that's inappropriate, deploying profanity or slurs and outside of what we would expect in council chambers. And I will remove anyone that needs to be removed from the meeting. An important principle that we adhere to is that everyone is given an opportunity to speak that wishes to. This hearing is already scheduled to be continued at the council meeting tomorrow at 7 p.m. And this will be that will offer an additional opportunity for public testimony then. We'll hear from as many people as we can this evening until we reach a time that the council adjourns until tomorrow's meeting. You can always choose to comment at tomorrow's continuation. You may also email us your testimony, which is equally part of the public record as speaking before us. And you can email us at citycouncil at northamptonma.gov. To be able to see the council, which is the body to whom all comments and testimony should be directed, I request that you turn off your video unless you have the floor. That's a request. Um, if you don't wish to make a comment, we encourage you to watch on channel 15 or by streaming on Northampton Open Media. The recording of this meeting will be available on their government video archive channel on YouTube. And I thank them as always for their amazing partnership with us in providing um, the access to the public that they do. Um, if you know that you wish to make a public comment, either a general comment now not pertaining to the budget or in the hearing about the budget, please use the raise hand feature. That is how I will know you wanna comment and can recognize you. To raise your virtual hand, you click on participants in the horizontal menu bar at the bottom of the screen. A column will open with the participants of the meeting. The raise hand feature is at the bottom of that column. If you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. If you're having trouble, you may also use the chat feature to send a message to me and to Laura Kretzler, our administrative assistant. We will do our very best to monitor that but that's the only purpose for which we will use the chat function. I will unmute each raised hand one by one and ask if you would like to make a comment, if you'd like to, and if you would like to have your video turned on for it. You may comment with or without video. When you begin, you must state your full name and your city or town of residence for the public record. According to council rules, we do not respond during public comment and it is your time to speak. So while your comments should be directed to us, you will understand when we don't respond. To ensure everyone has an equal opportunity to speak, we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. In council chambers, we would have a timer up for public comment on the monitors, but the camera would be on the speaker. With Zoom, we can't share a screen with a timer, yet privilege the speaker, which is what I wanna do. So um, 
what we're gonna do is just have an audible timer. You, we will begin the timer when you begin speaking and you'll hear a tone at three minutes and I will ask you to please finish your sentences. Uh, there are many people here tonight that wanna speak. We wanna hear from as many as possible. Please do not go over your time. And if what you wish to say has already been said, we recognize and add to the record if you say that you were in agreement with previous statements. Please try to allow time for others to be able to speak. So that's how we're gonna do this process. Um, we are gonna start now with public comment. Again, this is general public comment that does not pertain to the budget. If you're here for the budget hearing, then um, that will start as soon as public comment is over. I see a few hands. Oh, I see hands changing, okay. I'm going to start with oh, sorry, people keep lowering their hands. Okay, I'm going to give everyone one more moment to decide whether you want to comment now or you want to wait till the public hearing. I see one hand left. I'm trying to mute it. It's not letting me unmute it. I'm trying to unmute. DSA. I'm trying to unmute. Yeah. So, Richard, I have asked. Oh, Richard, you're now unmuted. Would you like to give a, make a public comment? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm really not sure if I'm in the right place for the for, for the comment. I'm, I'm feeling that wherever I make the comment would be okay with me. Uh, it's just important that I make the comment. This is my first time using Zoom, and first first time uh, connecting with you folks. Um, I'm, I'm a new resident. Uh, my, my wife and I are new to Northampton. We live on Main Street. So this is my also my first time um, connecting with government. Um, the, the short story for me is I think that any consideration of, of monies to the police department at this particular time would be almost, almost in a, it would be, it would be seen, I think, and perhaps is a an affront to what would be going on now. This is just not the time for for this kind of consideration. Almost almost aside from the from the question of the need for the funds and 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 for the good work of the police department or the challenges of running the police department and, and those kinds of things. I think it's just just an inopportune time. My educated guess is that probably is on the agenda, agenda before things have cascaded the way they have. Um, not knowing the process, I'm, I'm a little surprised maybe it's still, still on the agenda because I, I think it's so obvious that this, this, this monies to the police at this particular time just should not be considered. Um, I know there's some, you know, I know, I know that the economy, the, the economics are, are going to change throughout all the cities in the country, throughout the whole country. Uh, everyone's going to be short of money and those kinds of things. Um, I don't think money's also at this particular time should be going to the police department. I think there, there, there are many other places that really would need this. I'm a proponent of the preferential option for the poor. I think that always has to be looked into in any kind of a, a, a situation like this particular process. And, and we have to consider that. So those are my words. Thank you for sharing those. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, How do I get out of here for you? <laughs> I'm gonna mute you again. Okay. Thank you. Um, I There is one other hand that is raised that I'm trying. Okay. Gaza Abazi, I am, oh, I think you are unmuted. Would you like to make a general public comment? Um, again, the public hearing for the budget 
will be starting soon. But if you have a general public comment, would you like to make that now? Uh, yeah, I'll just start with the, can I speak again then in the budget section? Sorry, hold on. Um, uh, if you- I wanna speak about the budget so I, I can lower my hand. Okay, then if you um, spoke during the public, during the hearing in a minute, that would be great, thank you. Okay. Okay, um, so I, unless there's any other, anyone else who would like to speak and provide general public comment right now, I'm going to give a moment and look for hands. I'm not seeing any other hands. Um, so seeing none, we can convene the meeting and um, Laura, will you please take the role of the council, please? Sure, Councilor Dwight. So, oh, here's the thing. There, okay, hold on guys, hold on, hold on. I'm on it, I'm on it, okay. Um, yes, yes, here. Councilor Foster. Here. Councilor Jarrett. Here. Councilor Labarge. Here. I, I think that's, she's here. Okay. Councilor Maori. Here. Councilor Nash. Here. Councillor Quinlan. Here. Councillor Shara. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you so much. Okay. Figure out that. And okay, so now we can begin with um, we're gonna oh this is gonna okay, counselors, this is what we're gonna have to do, counselors. When you are going to make a motion or second, I need you to raise a hand real quick, okay? Can you do that? Thank you. Because um, what we need to do now is... Move to open the public hearing. Someone raise a hand. Councillor Mayori. A second. Okay. I'm going to unmute you all again. Does anyone know what's causing that? Oh, Liz? Yeah, um, I think it's because, Bill, you're, you have your iPad with the audio on as well. So if you, could, if you want to just turn the audio on that off entirely, I think that'll fix it. And if not, we'll figure okay. it out. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to leave it. How's that? Does that get rid of it? That's great. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, counselors, we need to do a roll call on opening the public hearing. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. I heard her. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. All right. Hold up. Councillor Nash's face. There we go. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay. Um, we've opened the public hearing. I'm just going to make the announcement for it. So uh, tonight's public hearing is being held in accordance with the Charter of Northampton, Massachusetts, Article 7, Finance and Fiscal Procedures, Section 7.4, Action on the Operating Budget, a public hearing. The City Council will consider the proposed FY 2021 budget and hear all persons who wish to be heard thereon. 
Um, the proposed FY 2021, FY fiscal year 2021 budget of Northampton is available for inspection by the public online on the city of Northampton's website at www.northamptonma.gov. Um, so the hearing has now been opened. The first, as I said, we are gonna start with departmental budget presentations. The first scheduled presentation is from Superintendent Provost, and I am going to scroll to locate him. Um, one moment. Here we go. Okay. Oh, it keeps moving. This is a really tricky guy. Okay. Superintendent Provost. Thank you very much. Um, and for those of you who want to see me, you could pin my image. My Zoom keeps uh, crashing today, so I'm sorry. I know there's a large number of people on this meeting which may be contributing to it. I would just like to begin by thanking Council President Shear for the way that you began the meeting tonight. Um, I come to you tonight as we are really in the midst of three overlapping crises. As you put so eloquently, we are in the, experiencing an acute outbreak of violence against communities of color. There's also a health crisis, which is having a disproportionate impact on communities of color. And then there's the looming economic crisis that threatens the viability of all forms of public and private enterprise. And so with that, um, I have to say, that I come to you very gratefully and um, humbly with a request for $32,162,012 for um, the public schools. I know that it is a large ask. Um, it is a larger increase than we've had at any time in the history of the schools. But when you think about um, the scope of the problems that come before us, I don't think that we could ask for any less. Um, I really wish that members of the, the city council could have heard the school committee meeting that took place last night because one of the points that was mentioned again and again is uh, the relationship that exists between the schools and the city. We as a committee were discussing the results of a district review which is an accountability process that takes place approximately once every six or seven years. And um, one of the strengths that was noted in, in our report was the good working relationship that the schools have with the city council and with the mayor. Um, and I personally am grateful to work in a city that values education as Northampton does. Um, also, w last night we were discussing what were the weaknesses of the district identified in the district report as well as its strengths. And um, it was clear to us, not that it was a surprise, that we do not serve all students equally well. Um, specifically, we have difficulty helping English language learners and Hispanic and Latino students achieve at the same rates as their white peers. Um, in fact, we even have difficulty have, allowing them to access all of the coursework that's available within the district and the full range of, of uh, learning experiences that are available to students. So our um, budget that we put forward was developed with the district, with district review in mind and with those priorities in mind. And um, many of our recommendations made it through to the final budget that was recommended by the school committee. I would add that um, the problems that were noted in the district review have become exponentially more profound since the time of COVID-19. We just we're in the in the midst of a shutdown. Um, we're attempting to do remote learning. It's certainly not an ideal learning methodology for many of our students. It isn't able to maintain high level of engagement for many of our students. And um, we find that some of the students who we had difficulty reaching 
when we had in-face instruction on a daily basis are disproportionately impacted by disengagement in a remote environment. So our expectation is that the deficiencies that we sought to resolve um, prior to the school closure are going to be that much more profound as we begin reopening. Um, we are also in the process of developing a new district improvement plan. Our goal is to have the district improvement plan blended with a plan for reopening and recovery, a process that we believe will take at least three years. But I have to say that one of the documents that we have prepared um, for, the, for the beginning of this DIP looks at some of the effects of school closures that took place in earlier parts of the century. And um, the data is grim. Um, there were a series of school shutdowns in Argentina in the early part of the, of the 20th century that were about as long as our school shutdown has been. And one of the things that we learned it, from, from studying that cohort as they grew up is that there were detectable impacts for those students for the rest of their lives. There were um, lower levels of educational attainment. There were low levels of lifetime income. And we, the, the, the researchers even found that there were effects detectable in their children. Um, so this may be a multi-generational um, problem that we're trying to recover from. And so I think that the resources that we're requesting are essential um, to getting our students and families back on their feet and back on the path of learning. So um, with that, I just wanted to, to reserve some space for any, any members of the council who had questions to ask concerning the budget. Thank you so much for that presentation. Counselors, um, can you can, counselors, I think I can see all of you. So you can raise your actual hands um, or you can raise your virtual hands if you would like to um, ask, comment or ask Dr. Provost a question. Okay. Counselor Quinlan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Counselor Shara. Uh, and Dr. Provost, thank you very much for being here with us and presenting the budget. I wanna compliment you on the process um, from what I understand, I think you work very hard at getting many voices involved, and I think that's a great thing. You start very early, uh, and I'm 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 impressed with that. What you uh, what I wanted to talk about tonight was, you know, I was a student athlete at Northampton High School. I'm a proud alum, and I'm a big Blue Devil fan. My father was the baseball coach in the '80s and the '90s, and my sons were both athletes at Northampton High uh, on the track teams, soccer teams, and basketball teams winning multiple state and Western Mass championships in soccer and uh, track, pardon me. The athletic uh, program means a lot to our family. When my dad was a coach and then I was a student athlete, we had a part-time athletic director, Jeff Boudway, who taught halftime and was the athletic director halftime for full-time employment. And after he retired, Jim Miller became the AD, again, teaching half and athletic director half for full-time status. This is the sixth budget, I think, that has increased the position to full-time after Mr. Miller's retirement. Do you think that that investment to full-time has been worth it? So I, I was part of the process of professionalizing that, that role by making it full-time and focused solely on uh, the athletic director position. I do think um, the results have been good. Our participation in athletics have increased over the past six years over both, uh, the, both Karis Sheridan and Mark Morrison. Uh, we actually just had to shut down the largest spring season that we've had since, since the time I've been there. Um, I, I think that another, another component that, um, that I look at in terms of the reason why I wanted to increase the position is the complexities of MIAA have become much more involved in recent years. Just to give you an example, 
we are looking at a possible solution to um, to reduce the number of courses students might have to be on campus for. But in order to find out if we could do that, we had to have a conference call with um, two two rules specialists from the MIAA. So I think that um, it's a it's a complex and involving field, and having someone who can have their their finger on the pulse of that um, is is helpful to me for sure as an administrator. The other thing that I would say is our support of the athletics program has not been limited to that single position. Um, one of the things that I found in coming to the district, it was actually as Jim Miller was leaving that, that um, I was coming in, they were running a budget, or they were running a program without a sufficient budget to, to land the program every year. So they had to rely upon a tremendous amount of fundraising, gate receipts, et cetera, um, to run the program, and that led to a, a great deal of instability. It also led to a great deal of um, entrepreneurship that, um, that was unknown to me. So, for example, um, last year I ended up receiving a check from a, a organization I didn't know existed, and it was for sale of athletic equipment bearing the Northampton logo. Um, and that was a relationship that was entered into during that time when the athletic department was so underfunded it was scratching for its survival. I don't criticize um, any of the directors who, who may have uh, started that relationship. That was what they had to do given the, um, the status they were in. Um, but so our goal was to, to try to have a uh, athletic program that was uh, more, more administratively professionalized, that um, also had a sufficient budget to provide predictability for its athletes, and also um, to provide a sense of, of being able to build from year to year instead of buying whatever equipment you could at the end of the year based on um, what, what money was left in the budget. So. You know, the position I think was important, but I think it has to be seen in the context of all of those reforms for athletics. Uh, thanks, I, I appreciate that. Um, and I wanted to mention that, um, I, you know, I was gonna ask you what you thought the very best thing accomplished uh, since the change to the full-time athletic director has been. Um, but I think I'm gonna skip that question and just tell you what I think it is, uh, which is the addition of the unified teams to our, to our school. Um, for people not familiar, uh, Unified is a school-based partner to the Special Olympics, and I think it's been a great addition to our athletic offerings. Um, you know, I have a friend whose daughter ran track. Uh, she has Down syndrome, and, you know, the joy that they have felt from having her participate in athletics for the school is, is really great. It's, it's wonderful. Um, and, you know, I think that the point uh, of Unified is obviously inclusion of all students, which is, which is great. But I do have some concerns about athletics and I'm, I'm gonna, gonna ask you, just tell you a couple of things here. When my older son was a sophomore and he went out for the indoor track team, uniforms were issued and he was given a uniform that didn't match everyone else's. Uh, he got an older version because there were too many kids and not enough uniforms. That was a long time ago, six, seven years ago now. This year I went to a JV soccer game and the kids on the team had to buy their own shorts. So they would all have matching shorts because the school couldn't issue matching uniforms. In addition, I went to a track meet this year where I saw a kid run a race and when he finished, he took off his sweaty jersey and handed it to another kid to run in a subsequent race. Because again, there wasn't enough uniforms. I note that we're spending now about $56,000 more on the athletic program than we were six years ago when my son couldn't get a uniform. And I'm wondering if the investment has been worth it because it doesn't seem like the problems that we had then are, are getting resolved. My only concern with that is I see the brand new scoreboard on the football field, but not every kid has a uniform. So I would ask you, do you think the kids whose families paid a user fee that then had to go to Dick's and buy a, a, a set of shorts felt fully included in the system? So let me start by answering your first question, just to say that my response immediately was the same. I do think that the unified athletics probably have been the greatest accomplishment over our last um, several years. Uh, I would agree with you that the shortage of shorts or uh, students sharing uniforms is not acceptable. Um, I did not know that was happening. Um, and it, it 
potentially um, speaks to need to add more money to the budget for athletics. I will follow up with the athletic director on that. Um, I also think that it, it could be a, a consequence of us expanding um, athletics and maybe not keeping up with our purchasing. And obviously we need to do that because we don't want families paying a user fee and then also buying their own uniforms. Um, the right. idea is that our, our fees should cover the cost of uh, the sport so that students can participate without additional expense. So I'm very sorry that that, that is happening and we'll look into it. Yeah, I mean, I might note that I, I know the budget um, includes a mention that about 16% of the student athletes in Northampton High get free or reduced lunch. Those kids didn't get free or reduced shorts at Dick Sporting Goods. Um, and that's a concern for me. Um, you know, I just, my final question to you is, um, as we look at this budget, you know, I, we see, I, I, I mean, this is something that we have increased the investment by 56,000 tax dollars from six years ago to now, every single year, 56,000. So, you know, I think, I wonder if this, if the athletic department is an anomaly in this budget, uh, when I see that it makes me concerned about the entirety of the budget, because I think you're, you're really, I mean, it's $32 million. It's a lot of money. I, I admire the way you put the budget together. I think you've got a lot of things going on here, but is this, are we getting a good return on the investment of the entire thing? Well, it's certainly my goal. Um, you know, our, our goal is to try to give the taxpayers the best return possible for their investment in all aspects of the program. You know, what, and when I look to, to what we're getting, I, I go to things provided by external sources, such as the district review. The district review certainly identified a lot of things that we're doing right and a lot of ways in which the community is benefiting. Um, the other thing I look at is our comparator districts. Um, one of the things that happened, um, happens every year is the Department of Education identifies a number of comparison districts for each school so that you can see how you compare. Um, and this year we moved into a different class and one of our comparator districts is Cambridge. Cambridge is spending more than twice per pupil that we are. So if you take our $32 million budget and translate in that into to Cambridge terms, that's a $64 million budget. And in some areas, we're actually ahead of Cambridge. Um, in other areas, we're trailing them in terms of student achievement by just a little bit. So I think if you, you look at it in that, in those terms, uh, I think that we are providing a good value for the taxpayer dollars. Uh, another, another, um, Rubric we look at is the USA, or um, yeah, the USA Today uh, school rankings. Northampton High is rated second in Western Massachusetts. Um, the school that comes out of us spends considerably more per pupil, uh, but I think that on a dollar for dollar basis, we are delivering good value. Um, certainly, always looking to make it better. Certainly, it's not perfect. Uh, and I know we have a long way to go and are, am committed to trying to um, continue to improve the value proposition for our taxpayers. But I do think that um, for the size of the investment, we've been able to provide some good achievement and good outcomes for our students. Well, that's great. I, I really appreciate you, you being here again and answering my questions tonight. Uh, I'll look forward to seeing you again in 12 months because I think that's about how often the city council reviews things with the superintendent. Um, and again, thanks very much uh, for your continued work. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Quinlan. Next, um, Councillor Nash, I am getting you unmuted. I think I'm unmuted. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Council President and um, Superintendent Provost. Um, could you speak to, um, you know, the, the preparation that uh, that you and school committee and the, our schools as a whole are going through in, uh, in regards to remote learning. I mean, it, it, my view is that of all of the departments we're gonna hear from tonight, none have a more challenging uh, 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 commitment in front of them than, than you. You don't know if you're gonna be in school, out of school, partially in school, uh, learning from home, um, and um, could you just speak to 
that what's in front of you there and whether or not the this budget has the resources to tend to all of that. Uh, so there are a few pieces there. Let me start with our budget process. Um, the, the budget process is extensive, lengthy, and involves many voices. Um, we began building this budget in December, really, and um, hit full force when we came back from winter break in January. Um, and had actually at that time presented two budgets because we had to um, have the school committee take a look at what scenarios we would be facing if the proposition two and a half override passed or if it failed. Um, so uh, we, after that process, um, we began moving forward with a, with a budget based on the proposition two and a half override success. And then um, COVID hit. And so looking at the predictable financial impacts of that, we went back to the drawing board and developed a new budget that tried to pare back as much as we could, knowing um, what the fiscal constraints on the city would be. So um, we had at least three budgets, maybe more, that were prepared over the course of this. And then, as you said, we were faced with the complexity of trying to start remote learning. Remote learning um, is something that we began with almost zero preparation. Um, just so you know, uh, the, the shutdown that took place was initially uh, initiated by superintendents. Um, the day we closed schools in Northampton and most of, the, most of the superintendents closed schools across the district, we were actually on a conference call with the director of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health who was sharing the advice at that time that um, they felt there was no need to close school. In fact, they felt that even if you had a positive but asymptomatic student in school, you could remain open. Um, but we made the determination as superintendents that that didn't make sense, and so we closed schools. And then later that weekend, the governor ordered schools closed. Um, so we entered, and entered this period um, basically starting with a recommendation that we keep schools open and um, trying to implement everything after the fact. Uh, I, have to just, I have to just pause here to really um, to give respect to our teachers. The, the work they have done uh, to try to stand up a completely brand new system of education has been amazing. The, the effort has been Herculean, um, and the creativity has, has just been astounding. However, this is not the way any of us would want to do something like this. You'd want to begin with a pilot. You'd want to um, try to work out some of the kinks, but we didn't have that luxury. We had to do it as we were going. And then um, in the midst of it, we had a change of status in terms of the remote learning plan. So we developed an initial remote learning plan based on the idea of a short-term shutdown and focused on the idea of enrichment. Then um, it became obvious that it was going to be a long-term shutdown, and so we had to transition to trying to move the curriculum forward um, in some way. So we developed a second remote learning plan. And now we're in the context of trying to um, plan for September. So what I can tell you about all of that is that this is an amazingly resilient team. We are able to improvise and um, make adjustments on the fly, but um, the, the future is somewhat unclear. Uh, I shared with the school committee last night that we had nine potential reopening models that I would be sharing with them uh, at the June school committee meeting. I've begun uh, a series of town hall meetings with faculty and staff to share those models with them. Since that time, um, I've developed another model, so there's now a tenth potential model for reopening. And uh, one of the things that I think is important to remember is we've never done this before, so there's, there's just no roadmap. The last time we had a global pandemic, there were school closures, but it was before the common school era. 
So it was a time when it was mainly private schools that were being closed. We had nothing like the mass system of education that we have now. So we are truly the innovators and the pioneers in this area. And the reality is we're figuring out a lot as we, as, you know, as we go along. Um, so obviously we can't fully explore nine or 10 potential reopening scenarios. Um, my goal right now is to start the community conversation to see if we can narrow down the universe of options. We may get some guidance from the state that'll help us to narrow down the universe of options. Uh, but one thing is clear, uh, it won't be business as usual in the fall. Um, the limitations of social distancing significantly impact building capacity. We probably have capacity for about 50% uh, of students at, at most in a social distance scenario. And that is with making major adjustments to the school. Uh, lunch is a big problem. Um, in a, just to give you an idea, one of the sort of model cafeterias um, put out by um, some analysis of the CDC guidance shrinks the number of students you can feed at a time from 250 to 40. Uh, the, current, the current guidance for transportation says that a 70 passenger bus can take 12 students and a mini bus can take one student. Um, so there are tremendous challenges we're facing in terms of reopening. There are a number of ways that we can, uh, that we are preparing to, to do that in different scenarios that we're looking at, but all of them are gonna require an immense about, amount of continuing flexibility from the staff and a great deal of continuing flexibility from the community. Thank you. Um, we have, okay, I, so I've got Councillor Thorpe, Councillor Labarge, Councillor Foster, is that a yes? And Councillor Dwight. Okay, Councillor Thorpe first. Thank you, Councillor Sear. Thank you, Dr. Provost, for being here tonight. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more why you did not recommend renewal of the Clark School lease at the Leeds School. Yes. Um, prior to uh, prior to the the economic impacts of COVID-19, we were actually hoping to uh, staff that school with some additional teachers. Um, we did have some large class sizes this year that were impacting, uh, impacting some of our grades. And the, I, the, the limiting factor we had was not only financial, but also space. Um, even if we were able to provide the, the additional staff, we had no classrooms to put them in. Um, as it turned out, when we, when we presented our COVID revised budget, we no longer felt that we could ask for the additional teaching staff for lead school. However, the space issue still um, still presented. We um, Leeds is the only school right now that doesn't have uh, a separate space where students who need time to to regulate themselves can can um, can be moved to. So what was happening was students were uh, going through some extreme emotional distress in the front office, um, or they were. Uh, or they were having difficulties in the hallway, which were exposing them to, you know, peers and and all of the the uh, all of the the difficulties that goes with them processing that with the peers, what they had just seen. So um, when we when we found that we couldn't support the position in the budget, we felt that the least we could do to provide some relief to leads was to at least provide them the space. And that was space that we could only um, find from uh, taking back some of the rooms that were, were um, leased to, to uh, the Clark School. Uh, it's, I will say that over the course of the summer, Leeds, when I say summer, I mean the last summer, Leeds was the school that experienced the greatest um, change in population. Um, they are, have, over the course of the past several years, uh, in terms of change in population, had the most significant change in increased need. 
And so we felt that um, having more space where we could break out with small numbers of students to provide therapeutic interventions would be beneficial. Um, and that, that was the, the driving reason behind that. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, Councillor Labarge. I've, you need to unmute. I've, there you go. No, I can't, we can't hear you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Provost, you are saying that we are having an increase in the budget, correct? Yes. And how much is that increase? Uh, it's a little over 5%. Okay. But there are no layoffs, correct? There, that is correct. We did, we did do some reorganization and we did um, eliminate some positions in order to create other positions, but we were able to uh, move staff around so that, so that we did not, um, did not have any layoffs. Can you explain that? You eliminated some positions, but you moved staff around? Could you explain that? That's right. So, so, in, this, so in, this, in this proposal, there are two and a half special education positions that were reduced in order to create some other positions. We had um, vacancies in special education um, positions in other schools that we were able to move the people whose positions were being reduced to. In, in one case, we actually had a vacancy in the same school. So we were able to move the person to another special education position within the same school. So there were reductions, but they were reductions that didn't result in layoffs. I'm glad to hear that. Um, because you did talk about three budgets that were prepared with what you have presented us and i'm very pleased to see what's happening with the school budget i want to thank you and all your staff for working tirelessly to come up with a, a very good school budget i have to agree hearing you dr provost that the future is so unclear and it is definitely unclear for everybody in our community and in, even in other um, states they're having the same problem of a future of being unclear. I also um, want to thank you and especially all the teachers in our school areas of Northampton, Florence, and Leeds. To do remote controlling at home is very, very difficult, even for teachers who are giving our youth and our young children the best education they can get. The parents, it's become very difficult for them with their children, but they're doing an excellent job and they're sticking right with it. So I was very glad to hear also with Councillor Quinlan talking about sports because I think sports is very, very critical. I mean, both of my sons, right through Northampton High School, right through college, playing football right down the line. And even with my son Richard, nobody still has not broken his track record at Northampton High School, and he's a two-time All-American runner. So sports is very critical in our family, plus a good education. I want to thank you, Dr. Provost, for everything that you are doing, and especially the school committee. It has not been easy for them. It's not been easy for us counselors or even everybody here in the city to try to make things work. So thank you very much. Thank you, and, and thank you for your kind words. I just wanted to correct. I think I uh, had gone to an earlier version of the budget before the COVID um, reductions. So we're actually asking for a 3.6% increase. I just wanted to clarify that. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Labarge. Councillor Dwight, you are muted. No, I'm unmuted. Dr. Provost, thank you for your time and thank you for your energies invested in this. I really do appreciate it. 
I um, uh, one I have a, a, a question, and one another thing I want to take advantage of the fact that we have an unprecedented attendance at a budget hearing. This is never ever have we ever had more than four people, as I can recall. And um, well, actually, that's not true. Actually, there were budget, there were well attended budget hearings last year as uh, you were undergoing negotiations with the teachers union, but. This is unprecedented. And so at this point, I, I think it's worth noting proportionally how much Northampton invests of its general fund into schools. Um, the slice of the pie, and I don't know if this is going to help folks, you can see that large green square, this is like Trivial Pursuit, represents uh, the education investment just, but it doesn't include also, as you said, over into... Uh, employee benefits such as insurance and, and, and retirement. So ultimately, we invest over uh, significantly over half of our, our, our municipal budget into education, and which is, I believe, why the mayor has opted also, of course, in, in this particular session at this in these extraordinary times to um, not only hold the school harmless, but in, in fact, actually reinvest in education at a time when the resources seem urgent. And this brings me to my question. The, um, the, the social disparity that occur, that exists uh, in access, um, systems access, equipment, um, uh, uh, broadband access, there, I would imagine that that definitely impacts children of need much greater than children with privilege. And that would include, I would assume, also uh, the transportation pressures that you, you explained, uh, folk, ki kids who might have an opportunity to um, get to school or to get a ride. Uh, would There are other kids whose parents don't have access to a car or a single parent who can't, who has to take care of other kids who doesn't, who won't have that same access and same ability to get to school. So with these shifting sands, the appropriation that we described, do you, are you anticipating having to, well, I would assume, having to reassess as, as the systems change, as we end up committing to a particular program, particular rollout, or a particular way of educating our children in the context of uh, the pandemic? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, I think one of the things that has become so critical and so apparent as, as we've looked at shutdowns across the nation is what a linchpin role education plays in everything. It's not possible to restart the economy without schools getting back on their feet. It's just not possible because uh, one of the reasons why so many people are working from home is because they need to watch their kids. And so um, I think that that puts the, the investment in an entirely different light um, and, and shows what, what an even larger return on investment we get for educational dollars than we knew before. Um, think of in terms of opportunity cost, there's a projected six billion dollar statewide deficit and a lot of that is because people aren't working and there's no way they can get back to work unless we get schools reopened in my opinion um, so there's that and to the, the piece of um, uh, how this how these multiple and overlapping crises have magnified the inequities in our society it is just so clear that the work that we have when we return is so much larger than the work of addressing institutional racism and inequity that we already um, we're, we're preparing to continue to work towards. Um, it is is so true when we look at um, when we look at students who are disengaging. As I mentioned in, in my opening comments, there are students who we were having difficult reaching, difficulty reaching and possibly not being uh, 
as culturally responsive to as we should have been when we were, were open. And so now that, that's only um, expanded. The, I, I will say one thing we were able to do proactively that helped with this tremendously was instituting a one-to-one -one program in the district. So having uh, devices for each and every student, grades three through 12, put us in a much better position to provide digital equity than many of our neighboring districts. However, that doesn't address the issue of broadband. Um, fortunately, because of our one-to-one our, um, -one program, we knew that not all kids had connectivity at home, and we had mobile Wi-Fi spots that we were able to purchase, that we already had purchased, that we were able to deploy at the time that, that we went into remote learning to help address that barrier. But we found that we didn't have enough. I would say there are, even to this day, about 20 families who we haven't been able to find a real satisfactory solution for. So we're looking at every possible option from just paying their, their cable bills to get them online um, because we now have a, a nationwide shortage of Wi-Fi hotspots and have difficulty even when we can get our hands on Wi-Fi hotspots, finding ones that will work with our equipment or work in this area. Uh, another another uh, aspect of our inequities that became apparent right from the start were the um, tremendous number of families that rely on schools as part of the puzzle for feeding their students. Um, we our first response to the, the pandemic and the shutdown was to stand up a remote feeding program. And we are distributing more than a thousand meals every week um, and plan to continue to do that through the summer because we're a critical part of the food security solution for many families. Um, and so, so that has just come so much more into stark relief than maybe it is in the context of your typical school lunch program. Um, and so to go back to the, the uh, go back to the comment that I believe the first public commenter made about having a preferential option for the most disadvantaged, that is one of the components that we're looking at in our nine um, or 10 models for reopening. So we talk about, you know, maybe we'll do an A day, B day, where you have half of the students one day and half of the students the next day, or a week on, week off, where you might have half the students present one week and the other half present the next week. But we've been thinking all along that in order to resolve some of the pre-existing issues and remediate some of the gaps that have grown over the shutdown, there may be some students who have to go every single day, regardless if we're doing an A day, B day model for most of the students. Um, so as we reopen, we very much do have a, an eye towards trying to uh, reopen in a way that for once puts the needs of those who are most disadvantaged in every way by our society first. And that's, that's what we really hope to do as we, as we move to reopening phase. Thank you so much. Dr. Provost. Um, okay, next I have Councilor Foster and then Councilor Mayori, did I see a hand? Okay, hold on, Councilor Foster. Thank you, President Shara. And thank you, Dr. Provost for being here. Um, I just wanted to, you just touched on it, um, but wanted to really highlight the work and the partnership that the Northampton schools were doing around issues of food security. Um, the survival center operating out of Jackson Street School and the mobile um, meal sites um, and bringing the food to where um, some of the pockets of greatest need in the community are has been has been tremendous um, and uh, it's, it's been great to see and I want to commend you for that. Um, one more question I had for you is um, it looks to me like charter school sending tuition is remaining relatively consistent through the years. It's, I see a projected increase of about one and a half percent. And I just wanted to verify or, or check on the, the actual numbers of students um, who are going to charter schools and, and just double check that I'm reading that correctly. Um, so my, my belief is that the initial cherry sheets that came out for Northampton were showing a decrease in numbers of students 
attending charter school and also a decrease in the assessment for charter school. Um, I will use this as an opportunity to talk about um, the funding formula for charter schools. So um, one of the issues around the whole charter school issue is reimbursement. And so it, it, the benefit of having reduced numbers of students going out of district to charter schools is somewhat offset by reduction in um, reimbursement to the city. Because in order to have um, a, a stable or growing reimbursement model, you have to have ever increasing numbers of students going to charter schools because the model only funds the first five years. Um, so um, I would I will ask Cami to, to correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the initial cherry sheet showed a reduction, actually a pretty substantial reduction in the number of students attending charter schools from Northampton and uh, a reduction in the assessment due to that, but also a reduction in the reimbursement. Um, would you like me to unmute Cammy? If she can answer it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, Cammy. Sure. Um, yeah. So I did take a look at our um, original charter school registration. What we were showing and projecting was that it was the same number on the cherry sheets. I believe the increase that was being shown for the dollar amount is because it's based on per pupil expenditure numbers. So it will cost the city of Ham Northampton more to send the same number of students, but we're not seeing a large increase or decrease. It actually had gone down from fiscal 19 to fiscal 20. It went from uh, 193 students down to 169. And so for fiscal 21, they were projecting the same 169, and we don't have any information different than that at this moment. Thank you, Cami. Glad I found you in the list. No <laughs> uh, Councillor Foster, I see that you've muted yourself again. Does that mean you have no further questions? OK. Um, I am going to move to Councillor Mayori. Good evening, Superintendent. Uh, thank you for all your hard work on this very challenging budget season. I just wanted to confirm briefly, so it looks like all the negotiations with the with the Northampton Association and school employees that were done last, last year are going to be honored and are able to proceed, correct? Thank you. That's correct. Awesome. Yep. Okay, counselors, any other comments or questions for Superintendent Provost? I don't see any others. Superintendent Provost, thank you so much. I, I think I speak for all of us when I say this is, I can't even begin to imagine the, the job you've been doing and the job you have ahead of you. And um, immense thanks to you, your staff, the teachers, um, the school staff, everybody. I, this is a really a remarkable moment and um, and we, I, you know, the idea that you've created 10 different scenarios for the fall is really overwhelming. Um, and thank you for all those hard conversations you're having and the work that you're putting into it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I, I also just, if I could mention there, there is one thing that I thought of in, in uh, relation to Councillor Dwight's uh, question, and I just want to put out there. One thing I'm very concerned about is the, the budgetary impact of PPE. Um, one of the things we were told to plan for is an order of 90 days of about 10 different items of personal protective equipment that we'll need to reopen school. And so when I look at that um, in terms of, of even a half day, a half 50% student model, I still think I'm going to need between four and 500,000 pieces of personal protective equipment to get through the first 90 days of school. And I'm, I'm concerned that that could limit the resources that I wanna to put towards achieving greater equity. Um, I really, 
I really would want to put that money into teachers, into remediation, into helping the students who've been most significantly impacted by the shutdown and do feel somewhat concerned and daunted with the the amount of budget may be consumed with, with purchasing the to protective gear that might be needed to reopen schools. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Thank you for telling us that. Okay, thank you again, Superintendent Provost. Um, so before we move on to the next department head, um, first there's been a request from someone to sort of know the schedule for this evening. I, I'd be happy to go over that again. Um, we are we are hearing so how the how our budget hearings work are we hear presentations from um, invited department heads they're usually the five largest departments in the city and that is the case this evening and we will hear those presentations from them and the council has um, an opportunity to ask some questions and then we open up the public um, session the public testimony and we. Um, we have already scheduled that this is going to be this public session the public hearing part where you speak is going to be continued tomorrow at the council meeting which starts at 7 pm um so that's the schedule for this evening we'll, we're getting through it as quickly as we can we have uh made it possible for 500 and now 60 people to be on right now and we'll be on tomorrow um and you know, you again, you can, we will do the best to get through as many people as we can today. We will do our best to get through as many people as we can tomorrow. You can always submit your testimony by email. Um, and I gave that email before. It is um, city, I believe it's just city, I'm trying to scroll through, uh, city council at northamptonma.gov. Um, you can just, you can email us if you would, would rather do that, but we're going to do our very best to get through everybody. Um, before we move on to the next department head, which is uh, DPW Director Donald Spellia, I'm, I'm going to briefly give the floor to Councillor Jarrett, who has a statement. Hi, everyone. Um, I have a conflict of interest to disclose. So as a member of the Pedal People Cooperative, I have a financial interest in the decisions that are made regarding the Locust Street Transfer Center, uh, which the DPW oversees. So I can't participate in this item. Uh, I know there are many aspects of the DPW, but it's unclear exactly when they'll be, we will be talking about that particular aspect. So I've been advised to just not participate in this item. So I'll just be turning off my video and audio. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jarrett. Um, I'm just gonna answer a couple more questions. Um, the so the order of the department head so we just heard from the superintendent of northampton public schools uh, superintendent provost next is uh the dpw director donald spalia after that is the police chief jody casper then we have fire chief john davin and then uh last is director david Pomerantz of central services so that is the order for this evening um so i found Director Lascalia before and I will find her again. One moment. Okay. Hi, Director Lascalia. Are you, can you hear me? I can hear you. Good evening to everyone on the call. Good evening. Hope Good to see you. Hear me okay. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to speak about public works operations and our proposed FY21 budget. I'm going to speak about each public works division and its responsibilities, and then give a brief overview of budget highlights by division. The DPW general fund in FY21 is broken into four divisions. We have administration and engineering, snow and ice, streets and fleet maintenance, and forestry parks and cemetery. We'll start with the administration and engineering division budget. So this DPW division captures engineering and clerical support for the department's operations, including the city engineer who creates reviews and stamps plans used in our paving and other projects. Um, we have a dedicated traffic engineer to support transportation improvements. And the modest OM budget is to support, is to support the maintenance 
of the 125 Locust Street Administration Building. An overall reduction in this budget has been achieved by eliminating one principal account clerk for the coming year. So I'll move to the next section of the budget, which is the highway division. So this includes streets and fleet maintenance. So the responsibilities of this division include the maintenance of 150 miles of paved and unpaved roads, 85 miles of sidewalks, 38 bridges, 30 plus signal controlled intersections, and more than 150 vehicles and pieces of specialized equipment. This year, there is a modest overall increase in this budget, which is the result of the following actions. We have reduced two staff positions within streets, one laborer and one equipment operator. We have made very small cuts to the operating budget, primarily in the electricity line due to a savings from solar endeavors. And we have uh, recommended a modest increase in OOM to accurately reflect the costs associated with purchasing asphalt for roadway repairs, maintaining the signalized intersections that I spoke of just a moment ago, um, doing line painting throughout the city. So these are our, our center line striping, arrows, crosswalks, and also disposing of street sweeping debris. Um, so moving on to the next division, snow and ice. This budget includes the overtime required for plowing, contractor assistance with plowing as needed, depending on weather events, and the salt used to treat the city's roadways. We used about 2,000 tons of salt last winter, and we have roughly that amount on hand at any given time so that we can be prepared for whatever the weather brings us. The next section of our budget is forestry parks and cemeteries. This division responsibilities include the maintenance of more than 10,000 public shade trees, 225 plus acres of athletic fields and parks, four cemeteries, all of which are active burial grounds with over 20,000 monuments and 11 plus miles of bike paths and associated green space. And I'll also note that as a general rule, we support the Parks and Recreation Department and their endeavors um, there are more than 2,400 participants in organized sports, 128 organized teams, and more than 2,500 folks who use Musanti Beach every summer. So in this division, we typically run seven days a week, April through November, to support these recreation programs. And, you know, Florence Field alone totals 24 acres. So it's, it's quite a massive operation that we run with a very small number of people. Um, I also wanna say a few words about the tree program. The city has planted more than 1000 new trees since 2016. And we have been named Tree City USA in consecutive years for over a decade. And just last year, we planted more than 400 trees. So I'd like to thank the volunteers of Tree Northampton for their support of that particular part of our operation. This year in this budget, there is a decrease, an overall decrease due to the following actions. We have reduced staff positions by two, but we have also increased the OOM line to fund contractor support for complex tree removals or height work that exceeds our in-house capabilities. We also have to be mindful that as the weather changes, we have more severe and frequent storms, which could require us to need to do a large scale cleanup um, in the event that we have a, a severe windstorm or something that could cause widespread tree damage. And it would be beneficial to the city to have a contractor on call for that. I'll next move on to the water enterprise. So within the water enterprise, we're responsible for the operation and maintenance of 150 miles of water main, 5,000 valves, 1,400 hydrants, three drinking water reservoirs and dams, two wells, the water treatment plant, and 3,900 plus acres of watershed land. So I have a couple of comments on utility rates and revenue first before I get to, to the expense portion of this budget. 
more than $2 million of this $7 million enterprise is dedicated to debt service for the construction of the plant, which was built in 2006. And this debt service does not fall off the debt schedule until 2028. Additionally, we are planning for large capital investments in our dams and transmission and distribution systems. We also project that the COVID-19 crisis and associated shutdowns may reduce revenues by 5%, although the ultimate impact is unknown at this time. Utility rates and fees are unchanged for the coming year. This is a conservative budget in that it has been built to ensure our goals of capital investment, but most importantly, enterprise stability. So in that vein, there is an overall decrease from last year, which was achieved through the following actions. The reduction of one position on the water distribution staff, cuts to operating expenses, most notably watershed operations, and targeted cuts to certain capital expenditures, such as vehicle replacement. Next to the SOAR enterprise, where we are responsible for the operation and maintenance of 5,000 sewer and drain manholes, 110 miles of sewer lines, and a wastewater treatment plant on Hockenham Road, which treats about four and a half million gallons of wastewater per day. As I mentioned with the water enterprise for sewer, we also project that the COVID-19 crisis and associated shutdowns may reduce revenues by 5%, although the ultimate impact is unknown at this time. Utility rates are unchanged for the coming year within this enterprise. This is a conservative budget that has been built again to ensure our goals of capital investment, but most importantly, overall enterprise stability. I will also mention that we are on the cusp of a substantial upgrade project that will total just under $15 million. Principal and interest on this loan will be a major factor in next year's budget that due to timing were not expenses that needed to be captured this year. Next, I'll move to the solid waste enterprise. Within the solid waste enterprise, we are responsible for the operation and maintenance of two transfer stations, a capped landfill, and we provide third-party oversight of a 3.17 megawatt solar array and a gas to energy facility. The solid waste enterprise faces both declining revenues and increasing expenses. We have seen a steady decrease in transfer station permits sold from 2013 to present. We've gone from 4,028 sold to 2,925 sold. Additionally, we have seen increases in disposal costs for trash compost, and most notably, recycling. As I mentioned with the water and sewer enterprises, in building any budget, our focus is on enterprise stability. This budget has several changes. Permit, increase will, permit fees will increase from $25 to $45, which is a projected revenue increase of $50,000. This fee increase is the first since FY 2009. I will note that even with this increase, we are still regionally the lowest cost municipal transfer station. And where we used to receive revenue for our recyclables, we are now faced not only with the loss of that revenue, but with a projected cost of $110,000 based on tonnage estimates for the coming year. There are contractual increases per ton by year for the duration of a five-year contract, which starts July 1st. And finally, the stormwater enterprise, where we are responsible for the operation and maintenance of 120 miles of drain pipe, 5,000 catch basins, 350 outfalls, 150 culverts, six miles of channels and ditches, two levee systems, and the flood control station at Hockenham Road. All of this infrastructure is supported by a $2 million utility. Our operations for stormwater collection are governed by the conditions of our MS4 permit and the Army Corps of Engineers governs our flood control operations. There are no appreciable budget changes 
year over year within this enterprise. Thank you. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Director Lascalia. Um, counselors. Counselor Thor. Minute. Oh, still, still muted. Okay. Thank you, Donna, for being here with me. Can you hear me? Yes. Got a quick question for those out there who are looking at the budget and looking at how it's set up for the DPW. Um, and looking at it, it looks as though there are more employees such as yourself who are listed more than once across different enterprises. So can you tell us a little bit about why that is? Yes, yeah, so these are called the allocated employees where they are performing functions across multiple divisions. So a good example of this would be our fleet maintenance folks, the folks who work on our vehicles. Um, so we have vehicles that are supported by the general fund, like for streets and forestry parks and cemeteries. And then we have vehicles that actually belong to and are funded by the water enterprise. So the reason that these folks show up in multiple locations is because we take their salary, the lump sum of their salary, and then we assign a percentage to it based on the sort of work that they do across multiple divisions within the DPW. So we wanna make sure that we are apportioning their time accurately in that when they're fixing a water vehicle, the water enterprise is supporting that. When they're fixing a sewer vehicle, the sewer enterprise is supporting that solid waste, stormwater, so on and so forth. Thank you for that explanation. Other counselors, Councillor Foster. Thank you, and and thank you, Director Lascalia. Um, the way you lay out the budget, um, it makes a lot of sense to me. I had one question for you. Um, you, the, for those who are watching and who are not on City Council. DPW um, spent some time showing us around the different facilities. Um, and one thing that struck with me is that one way that DPW has been able to save money over the years is by consolidating operations into different buildings rather than build a new facility. And as I think about um, sort of how closely folks are working together at the at Locust Street, um, I'm curious, I, 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 I know that the building is currently closed to people working but I'm curious what the long range plans are for if, if you have long range plans or, or how that might work of bringing people back to work in a building where they're working so closely together. I think, you know, overall for the DPW, uh, we have more than 100 employees and most of them work outdoors. Um, even the folks who work in that administration building our field staff. So we have an engineering division um, and those are the folks who actually oversee our large capital projects, you know, paving, wastewater treatment plant, construction and so on. So in terms of desk duty, if you will, um, the time behind the desk is often very limited, particularly during construction season. And construction season, you know, definitely uh, stretches from, you know, early spring to early winter. Um, so we're very mindful of the fact that that definitely is close quarters. We have the oldest buildings and, and you know, the tightest spaces. Um, but we are a unique department in that we're very flexible and we do a lot of field work, myself included. Um, you know, you, you can't uh, manage an operation sitting behind a desk. So I think that moving forward, you know, in this new reality, um, you know, we have the capability to do an awful lot of field work and we will be able to establish, um, you know, an ability to keep folks separated and safe. Um, those plans are obviously in development and nothing's been finalized, um, but due to the unique nature of our work, I, I think that it's, it's gonna be okay. Okay. Councillor Foster, any other questions? No, thank you. Okay. Councillor Labarge. 
Besides the counselors, they know the Louise. Be Shara. You're welcome. Where'd Dana go? She's there. <laughs> I'm right here, counselor. Okay. Are you home? I see all these pine trees. It's a nice background, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, I have some questions. And as a counselor, I received an email from some of the people from the um, pedal people about concerns about bringing their trash with their bicycles and so forth into the recycling center. Now, apparently, I am being asked about, well, there is an increased fee on the use of the recycling center. And why was the day taken off the week for recycling? Well, I got my answer. Um, I went to our financial director on some of the issues that I've seen. And I'm hearing that the fees for the transfer station have not increased since the four year 2009, which is 11 years ago. The current annual fee of $25 is the lowest among regional municipal transfer stations and our current hours of operation are more than double any other regional municipal transfer station. And I have an example that Amherst charges any $85 annually for the use of the transfer station and is open 18 hours per week. Beginning July 1st, we will be charging $45 and will open 43 hours per week. Even with our fee increase and reduction in hours, we will still be the lowest cost municipal transfer station with the most hours available for trash and recycling disposal in the area. In addition, the cost to operate the transfer station have increased as the cost for disposal of recycling and trash have increased. And I had asked Susan Wright on some help on some of these questions. So I feel good about it, hearing what she had to say. And she also noted that the usage of the transfer station has gone down with 44% less stickers being sold in the year of 2020 than in the four year of 2013. The decision to increase the fee and reduce the hours is obviously an operational and financial decision. The solid waste in the price fund does not bring in enough of revenue to offset its operating costs which requires filling the gap in revenue with retained earnings, free cash for enterprise funds. Even with the increase in fees and the reduction in hours, there will still be a need to use retained earnings to balance the solid waste enterprise budget. This cannot continue indefinitely as retained earnings will run out. So I've been going back and forth with Susan to find out what exactly we are getting an email on that there's a lot of traffic there. There's going to be a cut of a day and so forth. And on the bicycles of delivering trash, there's not bike lanes and something should be done there to help the pedal people with a bike lane place with lines on it. And they're also was concerns of why we have a police officer doing traffic there. And as long as I've been a counselor, we've had a police officer there every Saturday for a long time. So that was some of my concerns, um, Director Donna Lascaglia, of the operation of what is occurring here with at the recycling center. So if you want to answer some of this, um, can I just interject one second? Uh, Director Scully, I don't know if you got all that. Councillor Labarge, I don't, your sound is kind of, it's um, 
getting very soft and very loud and kind of modulating in a weird way. So I don't know if there's any way to work on that on your end um, while Director Lascalia is um, is going to talk. But it's it's very quiet and hard to hear you. But then suddenly it'll be very loud. Um, because I'm pushed back. If I come forward, can you hear me better? I think so. Are you sure? We can right now, so we'll give that a try. Okay, um, okay. I have one question to ask Donna Lascalia about the request we're hearing about to do away with a police officer who does a traffic there near the entrance of DG DPW. So that is my concerns here of using a police officer, which was on an email that I received. Why we have a police officer there. So maybe she can talk about that officer that does traffic detail at that transfer station. I would appreciate that. Uh, sure, I could address that, Counselor. So we have had a police officer who directs traffic at the intersection of Locust Street and the DPW driveway on Saturdays for many years. And that is a difficult intersection, even under good circumstances. And, you know, on a day where things are busy, like a Saturday, it can be a little bit challenging due to uh, the configuration of Hatfield Street, where it meets Locust Street. Um, the police officer is there to ensure an, a, an, an orderly traffic flow and to avoid accidents for folks who are trying to take a left out of that driveway. Um, so that's just a standard safety precaution that we have had in place for, for many years. It's nothing new. So we do have reserve police officers. Has, has that ever been looked into? That's cheaper, correct? I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to that question. You know, we communicate with the Northampton Police Department and we ask for someone who is qualified to direct traffic at a public intersection. And so we have a police officer who's on duty to do that. Thank you. You've answered my questions. One more, please. I'm looking at the book and I see that there was one vacant position only in your report here. Is that it? Just one vacant position? Only one. So in a layoff, besides you did not fill that position, correct? So we are not filling multiple vacant positions within the DPW. Yeah, but there's not many vacant positions. There's only one now. It, that is correct because we have removed them from the budget. Okay. All right. Because there was quite a bit before. That is correct. We have removed vacant positions from multiple locations within the budget. Thank you very much. And thank you for all you do and all your staff. Thank you, Counselor. You're welcome. I see Counselor Quinlan. Anyone else wanting to queue up? Counselor Mayory, or is that a hand <laughs> you're pointing this way? Okay, uh, Counselor Quinlan and then Counselor Mayori. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and Director Lascaglia, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, like Counselor Foster mentioned earlier, I'm grateful for our tour. Uh, it really gave us a hands-on approach to kind of really get a good understanding of, of everything that TPW does, which is so much. Um, I want to tell you, I'm, I'm very impressed with your presentation because I, I think, you know, you just mentioned to Councilor Labarge that you're not filling vacancies. You talked about a reduction of, of positions a couple different times, yet there's no reduction in service, and I'm grateful for that. I think your, uh, your efforts to serve the people of Northampton uh, really shine through in this presentation, so I wanted to thank you. Um, I also uh, wanted to just give you a chance to speak a little bit about the vehicle replacement program, because I understand I had a conversation with our financial director, and she mentioned that there was going to be some modifications made that was a concern for some residents, um, you know, how often vehicles were being replaced and so forth. So I was wondering if you could just speak about that a little bit. Sure. We have over 150 vehicles and pieces of specialized equipment within the DPW, and they are spread across the general fund and our enterprise funds. Um, this is an equipment, you know, this is equipment that needs to be ready to roll when we need it 
to move somewhere. Um, you know, when there's a sewer backup, uh, we have to be able to respond and we have to be able to handle that situation. Um, so downtime isn't an option for us, much like it's not for other city departments. Um, so one of the things that we have done over the past several years is, is that we have created a vehicle inventory and a vehicle replacement schedule, whereby we ensure that we're really spending the city's resources responsibly by eliminating old vehicles within our fleet that become unreliable and basically our liability to the service that we provide. Um, but they're also a liability in terms of maintenance and repair costs, you know, so there's, there's really two costs. There's the direct cost and there's the indirect cost. The direct cost is that, um, you know, I have to pay X number of dollars to replace this widget. The indirect cost is the sewer is backing up somewhere and I can't get there because this vehicle doesn't work. Um, so what we have done is we have created a vehicle replacement policy where we know the year and the mileage and the make and the model of every vehicle that we have. And again, there's over 150 of them. And we assign general values to, to a replacement cost, but also to the number of years that we expect to be able to get out of a vehicle. So for example, like everyone here knows, you know, after 10 years, your pickup truck is probably going to start giving you some trouble. It becomes unreliable. You know, it becomes a little more trouble than it's work. So, you know, we then need to replace that vehicle and, you know, the old vehicle comes out of the rotation. So a lot of the investment that we have made in our fleet over the past five, six, seven years is to rotate out vehicles from the 80s and 90s. And there were vehicles from the 80s and 90s that the DPW was running, uh, many of them, pages of them actually in an Excel spreadsheet um, that have been taken out of the rotation. And those costs are reflected you know, in the vehicle maintenance budget. So the, the city's resources are paying for this sort of one way or the other. And when you are trying to maintain a fleet from the 80s and 90s, relative to making an investment in a new, in a new vehicle that you now don't need to think about for five, six, seven, eight, nine years, um, that is, it, we're, we're not only saving money, we're saving time and we're saving opportunity cost as well. So that's just kind of the theory behind the vehicle replacement schedule. Um, we need to be mindful that it's something that, you know, if we don't adhere to it, um, we sort of end up back into the same cycle that we have just broken out of, which is we're running vehicles from 1988. So we just want to be careful that we don't say, oh, we have, you know, a really nice fleet and everything's great and we're not going to buy another vehicle again for 10 years because that is not going to benefit anybody. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that's great. Thank you. I, I really just wanted to get that information out there because I know it was a concern for many uh, residents that attended, for instance, the mayor's town halls on the override, the vehicles. I, I, I attended three of them and heard comments about the DPW fleet a couple times there. Uh, so I wanted to just let you get a chance to, to explain that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Quinlan. Other councillors? Um, I'm going to go to Councillor Mayori. Oh, yes. There yeah, we go. I got it. Um, yes, thank you again for the tour. That it was awesome. Even though I didn't like sleep very well that night, dealing with the ominous uh, expanse of your duties. But um, in any case, uh, just one, just a couple of things. One thing is I'm just trying to find the cold storage uh, facility that was approved in last year's budget. Is it on the? Is it in the forest parks and cemetery part of the budget? So that would be a, a capital expenditure that was oh, funded oh, okay. last That's year right. that is yeah. not included in this year's money. Okay, good. I just wanted to, I couldn't find it. So, and uh, yeah, my Ward Seveners are really excited about North Farms Road. And I did tell some residents I would convey to you uh, their concern about the um, short, shortening of the transfer station hours and the uh, wild raising fees. There's a concern that it's going to lead to dump um, you know, people are feeling, we're all feeling financial pinches, and now with that, um, is that, were you saying earlier that's kind of brought on by our current crisis, that, that, that now that we're getting decreased, because, uh, and, and do you fear uh, dumping as well, or? 
Uh, no, so regarding the solid waste enterprise as a whole, you know, one of the things with, with these enterprise funds is we need to be very careful of what is our revenue versus what is our expense. So what's happening at the transfer station starting July 1st is unrelated to the current COVID crisis. It is really a, a combination of many factors that have been uh, in existence for quite some time, um, but also new factors unrelated to the COVID crisis, such as the cost of recycling, for example, which is now a cost for the first time. Um, you know, we've been getting paid for recycling uh, prior to July 1st, 2020. Once July 1st, 2020 comes, we pay by the ton to dispose of recycling. Um, so these are market forces that are really outside the city's control that are unrelated to, you know, a virus environment that we're functioning in now. Um, and, and like anything else, um, you know, when, when we have declining numbers in the number of permits that have been sold, and that has been on a downward trajectory since, you know, 2012. Um, and it's it's not just over the past couple of years. I mean, this, it, you know, again, I think I mentioned that in 2012, we sold 4,028 permits. Um, and this year, we've sold 2,925. So, um, you know, that is a loss of revenue to us. And then we look at the increase in recycling costs, um, you know, it would be financially irresponsible of us to not make an adjustment in price, specifically when we look at other municipally run transfer stations in the region and determine that our price is less than half um, of, of, you know, other stickers and, uh, you know, other costs of stickers elsewhere, um, and that our hours of operation are more than double um, the, the next closest, uh, not necessarily competitor, but, uh, but municipality. Um, so with that being said, you know, I think that these adjustments are very reasonable and they are rooted in data and analysis of the services that we are currently providing and how can we sort of tighten things up to stabilize this enterprise which it, again, as Councilor Labarge noted, is heavily uh, drawing on retained earnings, which is not a sustainable model. So it is, it, this is an effort to make sure that this enterprise is sustainable. Um, and we have to do that by really making a modest increase in the sticker fee um, and, and then just sort of tightening up our operating hours. Okay. Wait, hold on. I just want to say thank, thank you, Donna. Thank you. Other counselors. Oh, Councillor Labarge is has her hand raised again. Thank you, Councillor Gina Louise Shera. You're welcome, um, Donna. I have one more question because you were talking about the recycling. There was an article in the Gazette with the mayor from Hoyle. Alex Morse, in regards to that they apparently had a consultant, but an estimate about what it was going to cost that this does happen. And you mentioned about the cost and how high it's becoming to recycle and so forth. They had an estimate of over $325,000 just to remove they're recycling out of their city of Hoyoke. So I'm waiting, hopefully, that I see him in Hoyoke sometime to talk to him because I said, I couldn't believe how expensive that is. So I don't. I think Hoyoke is smaller than Northampton, correct? But, well, the recycling contract is, is based on tonnage of recycle, recyclables generated. Um, so Holyoke generates significantly more tonnage than Northampton does, um, you know, probably a, a full 60% more than we do. So therefore their expenses are going to rise accordingly. So I think ours will eventually continuously rise if this does happen because apparently we're hearing that there might be a problem about how it's going to cost city 
or towns to have it picked up and bring out? Well, we have a five-year contract with fixed unit prices per ton. Okay. So it, at this point, we have a, a fairly good idea. Well, we know with certainty what our tonnage is, rate is going to be. What we don't know is how many tons will the residents who use the transfer station generate. So what I can do is estimate based off of prior years um, and, and sort of try to make an educated guess, but you know what actually happens is what actually happens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, counselors, any other questions or comments for Director Lascalia? Seeing none, I offer you our great thanks for the work that you do. I know this has also been a very hard time for your department. Um, and thank you for being here with us tonight. It's always, always remarkable to hear the scope of the work the DPW does. So thank you so much, Dr. Lascalia. Okay, thank you all. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna give Counselor Jarrett a moment to be able to come back. There he is. Hello, Counselor Jarrett. Um, so next up, we have Police Chief Jody Casper. She's going to present her budget. Chief Casper. Uh, good evening, all. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank Great. you for joining us. Yes. Thank you for having me. Uh, I, I can't start any discussion on on the budget without first acknowledging where we are right now. Um, Council President Shara, thank you for your opening statement. I know these are difficult times. Uh, I understand the outrage of many people in this country, in our local community. Um, I share in the outrage with what we all witnessed last week. Um, I acknowledge the role of policing in past and present injustices. Um, and at NPD, we'll continue to be guided by the six pillars uh, identified by President Obama's 21st Century Task Force in Policing uh, by taking action to improve the way that we're providing services to you all, uh, to, our, to our community. So I didn't feel like I, I could talk about the budget. I, I, this is what we're all thinking about. This is why everyone's you know, watching in addition to budget talks, but this is where we're all at right now. So I just wanted to put that out there and acknowledge that. and. Um, move on to talking a little bit about the budget since that's why we're here. So I know some of you city councilors, uh, I haven't gotten to meet with in person just because of uh, everything that's going on with uh, <laughs> everything in the world right now with our health pandemic and we haven't had as much in-person communication, but uh, welcome aboard. And I just wanted to introduce you a little bit to our police department so you would know uh, how we operate. Uh, we have 65 full-time sworn positions we have seven civilian support staff, including the animal control officer. And we also employ special police officers who provide per diem police services whenever they're requested. So that's just an overview of our staffing. Um, usually at this, I like to give a little bit of an overview so you know what we do. Uh, we gather our call activity by calendar year. So this is calendar year 2019, so you can learn a little bit about us. Um, we handled about uh, over 35,000 calls. That's a combination of things that were self-initiated by officers and also calls for service. So just over 35,000. Uh, we had uh, over 1,200 major crimes that we investigated. Uh, we responded to 341 domestic violence calls. We made 681 arrests. 111 of those were, were OUI cases. Uh, we've issued about 3,000 citations. We responded to 511 motor vehicle collisions that involved either serious injury or, uh, or injury at all or damage over a thousand. That's just how they divide motor vehicle accidents. So 511 more serious motor vehicle accidents. We registered 183 sex offenders. We processed 305 licensed to carry applications. We installed 118 car seats. We did 38 uh, DART follow-up services. Many of you are surely familiar with our DART program for people struggling with addiction. Um, our crime scene services unit responded to 84 crime scenes in 2019. That's a brief overview of our, our patrol services. And in addition to that, doing a lot of planning, security and traffic control for 
uh, marches, protests, and other large scale events, things like first night or the hot chocolate run that really takes uh, quite an amount of, of planning and personnel to coordinate for the city. Um, outside of our patrol force, a lot of people don't think about our, our detective bureau. We had a number of significant cases in the, in the DB, the detective bureau last year. Um, we had a fatal fire investigation uh, up on Carolyn Street. We had a domestic murder suicide, a lot of trial preparation for any of you that may recall the uh, Asian massage parlor cases that involved human trafficking. Uh, we investigated a, a large series of b &Es breaking and enterings in the downtown Northampton area. Uh, we had numerous uh, child abuse cases, a serious child abuse case involving an infant and a multi-state investigation into child pornography case. So um, just wanted to give you an overview of some of the activities from calendar year 2019. As far as where we are now, uh, we currently have, I mentioned those 65 positions, we have one vacant police officer position out of those 65. I'm always cautious when I say that because we have one vacancy technically, but we actually also have uh, currently a number of people in the police academy. So even though the positions are, are filled, they're not people that are actually working on the street and that you see. Um, it takes about five to six months to complete the police academy. And then it takes about four months of field training after that, where they're partnered up with a field training officer before they actually are on the street on their own and filling a vacancy in a way that actually provides uh, a position to the city. Uh, we put a lot of work into recruiting and retention over, over last year uh, on a national level. There's just a disinterest in becoming a police officer. There's more competitive jobs. At the time last year, the unemployment rate was very low. So there's just was not a lot of interest in the field. We really want to attract great candidates that are gonna to come to our department and serve you all well. So we put a lot of effort into modifying our recruitment, our recruitment efforts and our hiring efforts. As some of you may have heard, uh, because it's specific to the uh, budget tonight, uh, we're slowly transitioning over to hybrid cruisers. So right now our cruisers are all fuel. And now we have two that you may have seen. We did a post on it in our social media to introduce the community to our new hybrid cruisers. We have two of those and we hope to have more coming. We've done a lot of community outreach uh, over the year. We've done some uh, good fundraising drives. We've toned down our, had to tone down our community outreach because we're in the middle of a health pandemic and we've had to reduce our contacts with people. So we're doing a lot of birthday parades, which have been fun. Uh, and that's where we are with our community outreach now. We, last year in 2019, we were recognized by IACP. They asked us to do, they did a mini documentary. Uh, we were chosen as a featured partner in the IACP's Thought Leadership film series. We were selected department uh, to highlight our exceptional work and the film was shown at the IACP annual conference in Chicago. We're really proud of that. Uh, our movie was titled Leading the Way, Responding to the Evolving Needs of Our Community. Uh, two of our officers, Officers Montini and Longley also received awards from MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving for their work at identifying and apprehending impaired operators. Um, so that's an overview of our activity for 2019 and uh, then specific to the budget, which is why we're all here. Uh, we are requesting an increase of 193,579. The largest chunk of that is on the personnel side of our budget, which is $140,042. Uh, that is for contractual salary increases. And then on the operational side, uh, we have requested 8,072 uh, for training. And then on, the, uh, on our vehicle line, we have requested that increase of 45,465. As I mentioned, uh, that is the difference in cost for hybrid uh, cruisers. Northampton spends about 6.21% of its general fund on police spending, just comparing us to other communities similar that puts us just about right in the middle. So that is a, an overview of our budget and uh, an explanation. Happy to answer any questions for you all. Thank you, Chief Casper. Um, Councillor Nash. There we go, I'm unmuted, okay. Uh, thank you, Council President, and thank you, Chief Casper. Um, that uh, I, I want to thank you for your words at the start of your presentation. These are 
really difficult and challenging times. And I especially appreciate it for uh, your particular department that the challenge uh, that uh, you guys are struggling with right now. Um, that um, So um, in the um, narrative, uh, you uh, mentioned um, our training budget cannot meet the ever increasing demands related to training in areas including de-escalation, implicit bias, use of force, and mental health response. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to what that would more ideally look like, uh, because I, I think that particular piece reflects uh, what a lot of people's concerns. I, it, just so you know, you probably are aware that uh, myself, other counselors, the mayor's office has been in, inundated with phone calls um, and emails related to the, uh, the requested budget increase. And so I'm um, exploring where uh, we can have discussion. And if you, so if you could speak to that piece, and then I have another question after that. Sure, thank you for that question. So I know that those are training topics that are incredibly important to our community. They're incredibly important to me. They're trainings that I've been seeking for years and I continue to seek. If you, I posted in social media last week just detailing some of the work we're doing. You know, when I became chief, you can look back and see fair and, fair and impartial policing, systemic racism, de-escalation. This is, the important training that we need to be doing, as well as a wide variety of other training. And this is the challenge is that these jobs are complex. We need to be up on everything that we're doing. And that ranges from use of force and how we're using force, as well as um, mental health, as, as well as dealing with juveniles as well. You know, I, I mean, you can look at our list of what our training topics are. We post that on our website and you can look at all the different types of training that we send officers to. It is a long list. Uh, so <laughs> we go over in training almost every year. And so, and I've, I've mentioned it before in other years and I have put it forward again this year because I just think it's incredibly important. If there's one thing we know from everything that's going on in the world right now, it's that training, having competent, educated uh, police officers is incredibly important and, and ongoing consistent training is how you get it done. Um, I don't believe in a, for these very complex issues, I don't believe in a, a one and done model of someone's just done, a, done something once and that's good for your 30 years. You know, that's certainly not going to address some of these major things we're dealing with. So it takes um, consistent and, and ongoing training. Um, and so a follow up to that, we invest considerable um, uh, finances towards training officers once we hire them. And I'm just wondering how much of this training is actually going on at, at the police academy prior to coming to work for us. I mean, I, it makes sense for us to be undergoing continued uh, uh, training for people, but I'm wondering, you know, how the police academy is addressing these particular uh, issues. Yeah, the MPTC, which is the Massachusetts Police Training Committee, ha has woven all of these different issues into its curriculum. But I don't know about you, but I know for me, when I went to college, I mean, you can study the criminal justice system before you come into it. And then when you're into it for five years, you sure wish that you could go back and learn that all again, because it would be a lot more applicable. So I think providing a foundation on a lot of this is absolutely essential and important and included in MPTC curriculum, but it's gotta be supported over time. So yes, it's in the academy, but that doesn't mean we don't need to still train people over a multi-decade multi career. Thank you. And one more question. So uh, you mentioned that 140,000 roughly of the 200 um, is for uh, staff. If that money were not there, how many staff would that represent? How, if we didn't have the 140 is, those are the step raises. Right. But so if, you're saying if, if you if cut 140 from the budget? 140 from, you know, it, we, I, I'm not saying we can do that. What I'm saying mm -hmm. is, because people are asking for that portion of the budget to go away. 
-hmm. And if it weren't there, what would that represent in terms of staffing? I think I've said it better that time. <laughs> um, it's a reasonable question. If I had to make cuts to the budget, I, I would need to sit down and figure out where that's going to be. Um, I, I don't know yet. I can, you can look at the budget and you can see how much a police officer costs, right? So a vacant position I'm looking at in front of me right. is about $60,000, you know, not counting the, the health insurance costs for the city. Um, that's st a step one officer. And then as they move up, you know, we pay more. So that's the cost of an officer for our department is about that much. So two officers approximately. Okay. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you for all of the good work that the NPD does. Thank you, Councillor Nash, Councillor Thorpe, and then Councillor Labarge. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Casper, for being here tonight. You know, greatly appreciate the work that's uh, being done at your department. So what you're saying is that this increase is only to maintain level services. It's not to hire more police officers, correct? That is correct. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about um, Northampton, the police department's efforts in recruitment of uh, minorities and other people of color? Absolutely. So that was something that, you know, when I came in, it was something that I started paying a lot of attention to. And about a year before that, actually, when I was captain of operations, I think that your best department is one that reflects the community that it serves. It is, that being said, it's incredibly challenging to recruit uh, diverse people into policing, uh, women included in that. You know, women are represented at only about 13 or 14 percent on our department, nationwide, only about 12 percent. So you know, that, there, it, that is a challenge that we face. So what we did early on was we looked at where we, were, where we were recruiting. So where we had been recruiting was really at colleges that had criminal justice programs, which does make sense, right? Because that's where people are who wanna be police officers. But when we looked around at our department, we have some phenomenal police officers who do not have criminal justice degrees. They have business degrees, English, whatever else. We have a lot of different degrees here. So why would we be limiting our recruiting to colleges that have criminal justice programs? And when we were able to expand out to more colleges, there was more diverse candidates when we did that. We also you know, have looked at recruiting differently. Going to a recruiting fair is one thing, but really being proactive about recruiting, you know, finding people and making connections with people um, and recruiting people in individually. We think of it more now as like a, the way a, college recruits an athlete, you know, it takes, you can't just set up a table and wait for people to come to you. You, you want to go out and, and see who you want to attract, find great people and get them to apply. So we made changes in that. We also made changes in just our, our recruiting materials and what people see when they visit our page. And we want, again, we want to attract, we want to reflect what we want to attract. So we made changes there as well. And we've tried to create an environment where everyone feels good coming in and a sense of equality and positive culture in our building. So those are the different things we've put in place. It's a challenge that police chiefs face nationwide. Thank you, Chief Casper. Councillor Labarge. Thank you, Councillor. Chief Casper. I have received a total of 237 emails. And just a little while ago, my phone rang and it was a resident. My phone has been ringing all day and emails coming in from yesterday afternoon up until today. That's all I've been hearing is about rejecting Mayor Narkowitz's proposal to expand police funding of nearly $200,000, okay, which is out of your budget. I think there's some miscommunication going on here of them realizing exactly what that money is being used for. And I think Jim Nash had talked to you about it and you explained about that. I mean, you are not going to be using a portion of this money for 
going out with a, a police officer and doing social distancing and then saying you're going to be ticketed because you don't have a mask on or whatever. Can you explain this? In it, because in it, it says in the budget, this proposed expansion is justified as necessary to mitigate the COVID-19 crisis and enforce compliance with social distancing, Narcowitz 2020. This despite the fact that experts across the country urge against utilizing police as a mechanism to respond to social and health problems, Ganji 2020. Increased policing only compounds public health crisis and the terror of this epidemic, particularly for black, indigenous, and brown people of color who are disproportionately affected both by the current economic and health emergency and by police brutality. So as a resident, which I'm hearing from over 237 residents and a phone call just now at 238 is, they are saying that they're demanding that this money be funded into uplifting our communities, not police. Our community needs housing, health care, food, which we all know. I mean, our all, not just our community, every community is going through the hardships that we're going through. But my concern is, what are you actually using that increase for? Chief? Be okay. Sorry. Yep. Um, before you answer, Mayor Narkowitz has actually asked if he could speak to this question. Okay, fine. Are you there, Mayor? Yes, I am. I'm uh, just activating my video. I don't know if it's working or not, but can you hear yeah. me? Yes, and we can see you. Excellent. Okay. I just wanted to, because I, I've been receiving those emails that are quoting uh, me and quoting uh, my budget and uh, quoting the fact that um, uh, that this expansion um, is justified as necessary to mitigate the COVID-19 crisis and enforce, quote, compliance with social distancing. Um, first of all, we're not expanding the number of officers, as the chief has said. Um, that's actually a quote that's taken from the solid waste um, enterprise fund uh, revenue narrative. Um, and it's actually a quote related to the need for um, um, the need to have had hired police details during the COVID-19 emergency. Um, quotes that have risen, you know, the, due to the COVID-19 emergency, um, costs have, have risen uh, as police details have become necessary to ensure compliance with social distancing rules and handling uh, directing of traffic flow. Um, so that is not, that quote is related to costs of the solid waste enterprise fund. They're not born at all or not part of uh, this increase. So I think there's some confusion about what that meant um, in the budget. So I just wanted to clear that up because I was being cited um, as saying that um, as a justification for the um, increase to the police department budget, um, when in fact it was a, a reference to something completely different um, and something coming out of a completely different um, budget, which has nothing to do with the police department budget. So thank you for the opportunity just to clear that up. Thank you, Mayor Narkowitz. Okay, Chief Casper. So this budget was put together uh, prior to the health pandemic that we're in. Uh, it has absolutely nothing to do with mask compliance. Um, I, I would just like to tell everyone, and I've heard this question on social media, we've written zero citations for, for masks. We, we have masks in cruisers. We've been handing them out to people. We've been reminding people. People are in a learning curve. They don't know. and um, so we, we're not doing uh, that kind of enforcement right now. We're working on education and providing people with the tools they need to keep us and keep all of you safe. We're handing out masks. So this has absolutely nothing to do with that. And just a reminder that, that this budget of 193,000-ish, a little bit more, um, 140 of that, 140,000 of that is contractual step raises. So there's a small amount and the next biggest chunk is for hybrid vehicles. So that's where the money is going. It's three very clear places. It's steps, it's hybrid vehicles, and it's $8,000 for training. 
I want to thank the mayor, and I want to thank you, Chief Casper, because that's why I had to go to our financial director to let her know of these emails coming in and mentioning about this $200,000. I couldn't even find what they were talking about in the budget of a breakdown with it having to do with the mayor saying this because I couldn't find that. But anyways, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that. And um, Chief Casper, thank you very much for explaining where this money is going to. Thank you very much for all your hard work. Thank you, Councillor LaBarge. Councillor Dwight, hold up, there we go. Oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, all right, go. got it, okay. Uh, thank you, Chief Casper, thank you. Um, I think everyone's aware that, and we're going to hear, I'm sure, um, from public testimony that <clears throat> actually the issue is less about financing and subsidizing a department based on the budget and what those budgetary items be applied to, but it's more of a global reaction to how we police and how we are policed in this country. And I think you're going to hear. Um, and I, you have heard of, of a rather loud and clear anxiety. And, and unfortunately, I think, you know, of course, a lot of the global, global response to uh, uh, police actions, most recently in Minneapolis, um, Louisville, and other places, and also in response to uh, demonstrations, uh, it's been protracted onto your department. Your department is not infallible. None of the departments in the city are. And they're, you know, just like every department, there are comprised of individuals that to some, to some extent go their individual ways. But you have established a culture of progressive policing. Now, for some people, that's not even going to be close to enough. Uh, I think you're going to hear from a lot of people that progressive policing is still policing. And there's going to be a call for essentially decommissioning police departments as as and and at this point it just coincidentally happens to come upon a budget review simultaneous with a budget review and this perfect storm of uh basically enforced imprisonment of all of universal force imprisonment for all the citizens who are basically in enforced quarantine and then you compound that with the very overt and technically uh, the overt killings that are being charged as murders and are technically sanctioned lynchings by a police department, not this police department. And you combine that also with the fact that a massive job loss um, and a, a agita and an anxiety that is pervasive and you have a perfect storm and and for better or for worse, your department and this budget item have become the focal point for the discussion. So I think I think it's I, I appreciate you you're making the distinction about these appropriations that are being applied. But I, I honestly don't think that most of the people who are calling for defunding um, really care about those distinctions. Um, I do. I do, but um, I think by and large, most of the people actually um, don't care if it's for lollipops or nightsticks. It doesn't matter. It's for police. So, and I also, and I have worked with your department, as you know, and I have worked and struggled with you to try and recruit and expand diversity and to expand the quality of policing, uh, of police officers to serve um, your department and you have done an amazing uh, effort that's never going to be understood or realized and ultimately I'm afraid necessarily appreciated. So uh, I'm just, I, I'm not even asking a question obviously. I'm, what I'm doing is exactly, I, I think I'm, I, I'm in anticipation of how this conversation is going to go. We have had these conversations before, as you well know. And 
and they always come up during diffi really difficult times. And I've appreciated your, your calmness, your serenity and sincerity, and really when you have been um, challenged, and that's a gentle way of putting it, I'll leave it at that. But I, I just, I, I want you to understand that we are all going to struggle through this in some way. And there will be a conclusion, I don't know what it will be, and I can promise everybody that it will be wholly unsatisfactory because we are not, what most people are asking for is a significant cultural change on so many levels, and this is just the needle point manifestation that we're focusing on. But so be it, unfortunately. This is, this is the catalyst for the conversation, and there it lies and there it shall be. And so I'm um, just letting, I suppose I'm saying I, I, will, I, will, I will participate and have the very difficult conversations with everyone that's required, and I know you will as well, and I appreciate that. Um, uh, before, uh, Councillor Quinlan, I see you. Before we, before I go to you, um, Chief Hatford, there is a request if you could clarify what step what step raises are or explain what they are, or if maybe if Mayor Narkowitz or uh, Finance Director Wright would like to would um, so if one of you could to explain what step raises are, that would be helpful. Thank you. Sure, I'd be happy to do that uh, unless the, the other two want to step in. But uh, step raises are, I mean, anyone that's a, maybe a teacher, for instance. Uh, you negotiate with your union and you establish step raises, which are incremental raises over a set number of years, depending on your, your contract, um, recognizing your experience and, and how you, you kind of get better over time. You know, uh, step raises stop after a certain amount of time. You've gotten, hopefully, maybe you've gotten as good as you're going to get. I don't know. But usually step raises range from maybe eight to 10 steps. So that would be over eight to 10 years. Um, officers would get you know, whatever that step raise is. It's, it's a small, you know, percentage negotiated amount. Uh, we're obligated to that per contract. So then when, when officers reach the end of their step raises, then they just get whatever the negotiated raises would be, cost of living. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question completely? Um, the question came over chat, so I, uh, I, I don't know, but I, I would think so. If not, they will check back in with me, hopefully. And let me know if they have further questions. Um, wait, hold on one sec. Um, the que uh, the clarify. People want to know what is what a small percentage is. Can you clarify what a small percentage is? I can. So, so for instance, uh, an officer who's just entering um, on, on first year is making. Um, 49,317. Um, the next step above that is $51,044. They're usually around two and a half to three percent, but that's what the difference is, for instance, for our department on, on the proposed budget. And can you clarify if the city is, can you clarify how the city is contractually obligated to, to pay those steps and fulfill that um, contract? Uh, sure. Uh, the city sits down at the table and, and negotiates contracts uh, when contracts expire. So right now, that one was FY19. So it's a three-year contract. They're not always three-year contracts. It depends on the budget times, but most of the time, they're three-year contracts. So union sits, sits on one side of the table, city sits on the other, and they negotiate for what they should be paid, uh, usually based on the work that's performed on surrounding communities and what they're making. And then they negotiate and agree on that, sign a contract, and then the contract, uh, city signs that contract saying, yes, we will pay you this. So that's how that works. And are, um, have there been any times, or are, are there situations under which step increases are not fulfilled for, you know, like during economic crisis or is, that contract bound and, and cannot be changed. I'd actually like to let the mayor answer that one because it, it hasn't been changed 
in a long time. So I, I don't want, I want to be accurate. And I think the mayor is best poised to answer that. So basically um, you, you cannot unilaterally alter a contract without impact bargaining. Um, so certainly um, you can have economic crises and we have had that, um, but you cannot, one side cannot unilaterally uh, change the terms of the contract without impact bargaining. So um, that would need to be a conversation if, if in fact, and that has happened not during my time, but um, when I was a city councilor and we were in the great recession um, and there were significant, um, you know, massive cuts in state aid um, and the city was facing a significant deficit, there was um, bargaining that happened um, um, by the former mayor with uh, unions around um, these issues, but it's not something that can just be unilaterally done um, uh, without impact bargaining. And that's that. That's not. That's that's just the laws of of um, of collective bargaining uh, more generally. Um, uh, not something that's specific to municipalities or police departments. Thank you. I'm going to go to Councillor Quinlan. I do want to just say, I just, just want to, it's the, uh, the, co the current contract that we have is FY20 through FY22, uh, 2021 and 22. It was negotiated, it, was, it went into effect on July 1st of 2019, but of course we've got this wacky fiscal year, which is always different than the actual year that it starts in. So um, it's a three-year contract. And that's the, as you know, the council, um, I bring those um, uh uh, contracts to you and discuss them with you and discuss the financial impacts uh, and the council ultimately uh, makes the decision in terms of approving the funding for those contracts. So it is a there is a two step process there. Um, and so that's something that occurred as part of the FY 20 uh, budget process uh, for not just for the police, but for all of our uh, seven city unions um, as well. Thank you. Councillor Quinlan, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, Chief, thanks very much for being here. And I'd like to just uh, echo what, what Councilors Nash, Thorpe, Lavarge, and Dwight said about appreciating your work. Um, I think uh, you face great challenges. And, and you know, I know Northampton Police Department uh, is, really, uh, is really trying. And I, and I appreciate that. I wanted to ask you, this is my first go around with the budget. So I've got a couple of questions here. I was looking at, you mentioned that the starting pay was 49317. And I look, you said there's 10 people in the police academy. Is that right? No, no, uh, not 10. Currently no. in the police academy, there are five. Okay, five. So those yep. five people are probably listed there at starting pay? Yes, yes, yep. Okay. All right, and those, so those five people are at the academy, not on our street, but we're paying them at the starting pay. I just want to make sure I understood that part. Um, yep. Do you have an idea of that starting pay uh, how it compares with, with like communities? Um, I do, because that was a, a part of what we were looking at. For, for many, many, many years, NPD lagged behind surrounding communities. And, you know, while that saved the, the city money in salaries, we just had employee loss. And then we're hiring new employees, and we're paying all that money hiring new employees. So what we've, hopefully, we think what we've done is taken that money that we were spending on retraining new people um, and put it into salaries in a way that will improve retention. Um, so we're right now just about equal with the similar departments around us of the same size. That's what we looked at when we looked at the contracts. Okay, uh, we had a very similar discussion. I, a couple of us have mentioned that we had a tour with the DPW director uh, and we had a very similar discussion with uh, about retention of, of employees once you get them trained uh, and so forth, uh, with the opportunities that, that await them outside of our city uh, and that retention, and how important it is. So, uh, you know, I, I understand that is a great challenge. Um, and I, you know, I think any, any great business winds up going through those uh, challenges. I, I did want to ask a few questions about um, the, the request for uh, the new vehicles. Um, so on, on the police department website, you're listing 18 marked vehicles, 15 of them are, are patrol cars, and then three are truck and, and van crime scene. Uh, so it, is it, it seems to me that replacing 33% of the vehicles in the patrol car fleet is a lot at one time. I saw that, that we bought five vehicles last year, um, you know, and five more. I'm wondering if that shouldn't be uh, flattened out somehow to, 
you know, how long are those vehicles going to last? I guess I wonder. And shouldn't we be buying maybe one or two every year? Uh, is there is there a reason to be replacing a, a significant percentage, especially in light of the fact that the city is facing huge budget sh budget shortfalls here? Uh, right. So working up to we rotate in um, three new marked units every year. That's the way that we've been able to keep our fleet running. Um, I, I know you know this and everyone knows this, but our vehicles run 24 hours a day. Uh, they're uniquely driven, unlike maybe our personal vehicles at home. You know, we get a lot of mileage. It's hard wear and tear. And these vehicles over time, if, you know, if, if they get too old, they cost a lot of money in maintenance. You know, so years ago, our former chief really worked to get a, a steady car cycle going through so that we were able to replace cars, the oldest cars in the fleet with new vehicles so that we weren't paying as much as in maintenance costs. So it, it's been effective. Uh, I, I understand we're in a budget crunch. This is the cycle that we've been on and, and what we've done in order to reduce those other costs. Okay, just, just clarify that for me that we're, you, your request is for five vehicles and you said we put three new vehicles on the road every year. We're just allocating the money and spending it you know, as we move forward. I just wanna make sure I understand that. Yep, good, good uh, clarity question. Usually, so each year we actually by five, but three of them are marked cruisers. So that's a consistent part of that. We have other vehicle needs, our animal control vehicle, or our, you know, we have unmarked cars or a truck or things like that. So those things rotate through at different rates, but our main fleet, what you, what you all see as our police force and our police cars, those three of those are replaced each year. Okay. Um, yep. You know, and, and I, I, I understand uh, the negotiations with the union, um, you know, for, for step raises for the, for the contract. Uh, you know, I, I, I would probably be tell you that I'm a pro union guy. Um, but it, you know, it is, it is tough to look at the raises in light of the fact that people in Northampton are losing their jobs. Um, you know, city employees. Um, it's, it's just one of those tough situations. It's a little bit of a tough pill to swallow. And I'm sure it is for those people that are losing their jobs. Uh, and I just wanted to voice that, uh, so that those people that, that maybe are facing that unemployment know that, that they're thought of, um, you know, and, and that, you know, while they're maybe not represented by a union, they, uh, you know, they are, they are valued by the city. So uh, thanks very much, Chief, for being here and your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Quinlan, Councillor Mayori, then I see Councillor Foster. There you go. So good evening. I might have to turn my uh, video off. My if my internet gets shoddy, I've tried to leave it on because I like eye contact. But th that you'll know why if I have to to shut it off. Um, so I, um, you know, I'm really grateful for um, the the highly trained nature of the NPD, and I was grateful to see uh, uh, your statement, Chief Casper, um, in response to the murder of. Uh, George Floyd. Um, and I just want to take a minute here to say, you know, for all of those, all of you who reach out to us, um, I, I really appreciate living in an engaged community. Uh, many, many of us are feeling very raw. And, um, and I think, well, we know that this problem, this problem of, of, of racial bias, of uh, the murder of uh, people of color by, by police um, is not a new one. But I'm wondering if maybe we can, um, you know, maybe there's something new we can do about it. And I think that's where we're at. Um, so this is less of a, you know, a statement about what's going on in the MPD and really more about saying um, there's structural changes that we have not made. And that's why we keep coming back here. I went to, um, a, one of the rallies, and I had the sad thought when I put my sign away that I was going to have to get it out again at some point. Um, so what I, I see is, you know, actually precisely because of um, the kind of low crime rate that we have in our, our city, as you say in the budget, it's trending downward, and our relatively well-funded and well-staffed and highly trained force um, that has this thoughtful leadership that I actually think we, you know, Northampton is an extremely well positioned place to serve as a model to other municipalities and take a lead on research and, researching and kind of experimenting with alternatives to policing that would complement our force. 
and for um, trying to make changes proactively before we have an incident um, here. And so I think that, um, yeah, I think that there's an opportunity here and I'm not sure, I know you made this budget in earnest, but I don't think that this budget is reflecting um, that opportunity. And I know that, um, for example, the, the Massachusetts Black and Latino Legislative Caucus has put out guidelines about uh, community involvement in policing and in looking at alternatives to policing um, and so, um, civilian review boards. And I think we really need to take this moment to re-examine where we're going here. Um, and that doesn't really even have to be a commentary on what's presently going on uh, I, uh, with, with our police. I think um, the training is wonderful. Um, the Minneapolis police have re received extensive training. So I don't think the training is enough. Um, so I guess I would, you know, I guess I would put to you, I, I guess I would say I'm concerned and I would say, I saw this heartening quote um, from you, uh, Chief Casper, that er, you know, earlier this year, this is quote, earlier this year, we began discussions about strengthening and building new partnerships with members of our community. We look forward to the opportunities to do that. Um, so I just, I guess I'd like to know from you what, what that looks like to you and where is that reflected in this budget? Thank you. So thank you for that question. I, I, I've said for years, I think at the heart of, of all of the issues that we have with police community relations is this, in my opinion, a, a missing link of us sitting at the table and listening to each other. I mean, really, like, how do you develop perspective? How do you develop relationships? And I think it comes from sitting at the table with people. And the problem is we've not found successful ways to do that sometimes. We have been met with, with some difficult resistance when we've tried to do that. And, and we've tried to work with um, you know, outside people to, to facilitate conversations. And uh, you know, I can think of one particularly discussion that we, we wanted to have about race. I, was, I wanted to go, I wanted to listen. I want, you know, um, and it, it was just going to be protested. So the facilitator had to cancel. So th this is the challenge in our community is that we are willing, we, ha we have said that many times we have done that. I am not just a person of words, I am a person of action. You can see that from all the work we've done. And I continue to, to talk with people and say, sure, I've been answering the phone all day as well, to, explaining what, what, why we've done what we've done, who we are, what policies, you know, I, I, I firmly believe in that. It has been really challenging for us to be successful in Northampton. Um, these conversations come up and people, I haven't found success at being able to sit at a table that's open to the community without have just being met with resistance and an inability to, to sit and share perspectives. So that's my answer to that. It's very complex. Um, it, I'll, I'll add on to that, that um, in uh, early March, uh, we were talking about some things we wanted to do and, and relationships we wanted to foster. And we have some of those relationships established with some members of our community. I wouldn't say that they're particularly specific to this issue around race, around um, you know, DEI work. I, I don't think it's around that, but we have other relationships and we want to explore those so that we people you know, we are a part of this community. We are citizens as well. And, and so that we have those relationships. Um, so I'm always open to ideas. I've got a list of ideas written down on my desk right now because I've certainly heard some this week and they're important and like, I will explore them and I wanna bring good things to our community. Um, but it takes time to do that. And it, one of the challenges and one of my fears is cutting our police department down is at the end of the day, this is always the work that gets cut when you when you start cutting people because there's, core work, and I believe this is core work, but there are emergencies on the street that have to be tended to. And that distracts us from this other work that we want to do. It's very frustrating. So that's my answer. I'm happy to answer more on that if you have further questions on it. Professor Foster, did you have your hand up before? I'm trying to remember. Wait, ah. I, I did have my hand up, um, but I see that Councilor Mayori um, may not be quite finished. Oh, hold on. Happy to yield. Yeah. Oh, 
Um, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on that. I, 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 because I, I think I, I did not mean to apply to put it all on you, uh, Chief Casper, in terms of solutions. I think one thing we really need to think about is how, as a community, we want to approach um, what has been law enforcement. And that might come from outside the police. And I think people need buy-in and um, authority over that. And I think our budget uh, should reflect that. And we were going to have to, you know, if it's the budget, uh, our city budget, there's places, you know, we, we could discuss how to fund that and to take it seriously and look at alternatives to policing and, and community, what community policing could look like. I, there's great examples across the country um, and models. And I think we could be a model and a leader in this. Thank you. Um, Councillor Foster, and actually, um, Councillor Jarrett, for some reason, I don't understand the algorithm of Zoom. For some reason, Councillor Jarrett, you were on my main screen and now you're three screens that away. So if you, if you are physically raising your hand, I can't see you at this moment. So I just wanna give you that heads up. Um, so Councillor Jarrett, if you wanna ask a question or jump in, make sure you use the raise hand feature because I should be able to see you that way, but I'll keep sliding around and trying to find you. Councillor Foster. Thank you, um, President Shara, and, and thank you, Chief Casper, for being here. Um, I want to acknowledge that uh, I've, like everybody else, um, have received quite a few communications um, from constituents. And um, something I want to name is that looking on the Zoom call, I see neighbors and names of people I know and many, many, many people who have probably sent the very first email to uh, an elected official and are probably attending their first city council meeting. And um, I think that's kind of amazing. Um, and, and in that way, I really wanna honor, um, you know, how much activism um, is there. And I wanna speak to the pain of communities of color um, and people of color um, who, you know, have historically um, been targeted. And, um, and at the same time, I want to recognize that here in Northampton, I think we have an incredible opportunity with a chief who gets it, um, with a chief who is open um, and interested um, in exploring these issues. We talked yesterday, um, I had, had sent you an email to express some concerns um, about the end of the rally um, on getting my days off, um, the end of the rally on Monday afternoon. And you spent quite a while uh, talking with me about it and um, that your intention with your department was to de-escalate as much as possible. And um, you know, I, I, I respected the way you talked that through um, and recognized that, that what we're looking at here is really the criminal justice system and, and policing and um, you know, criminalizing behaviors like, like mental health, um, addiction services. This is a very large societal issue. And I also see training and action from Northampton Police Department that's targeted toward responding to incidents in the best way that you can. I have a social services background. I used to be a teacher. I worked with at-risk youth. Um, and, and I have been on the other side of this lobbying how for increased funding for education and mental health care um, does lead to a reduction in crime. And yet, I, I get it. Um, here we are looking at a budget for next year and investments in social services and investments in education, they take, they take a very long time um, to show. Um, there are things that we can do right away and there are things that are long-term solutions. And I just want to name that I recognize. Um, you know, the complexity of all of this. It is not a simple uh, formula. It is not a simple solution. If it were, um, you know, I, I have faith. Um, I know you've been working on it and you would have solved it if this were they're simple. And I know that it's not. Um, that being said, I have um, four quick uh, questions for you that have come from constituents and, and concerns that I'm hearing. Um, one is, um, and I should probably know this, but is there a residency requirement for officers in Northampton? Uh, no, there is not a residency requirement. Uh, you have to live within 15 miles as the crow flies to the nearest boundary of the city. Okay, thank you. Um, 
when you're looking at trainings that you're offering, how do you choose which trainings to offer and evaluate them um, for the, the quality and, and the value to the department? That's a great question. And I'll be the first to acknowledge it's, it's likely a missing piece in our training in general. Um, um, not that uh, we do our best to vet trainings by speaking with people who have been to the trainings. And, and if someone goes to a training, like that was an excellent instructor. It was very valuable. I got a lot from it. I bring a lot back. We'll remember that instructor and try to seek out other classes. I can think of a few that I know that are exceptional. There's some organizations that offer training. Um, the IACP, uh, the FBI does lead a training, very good, high standard training. Um, so we try to seek those out. Um, you mentioned, and, and I mentioned on my, on my Facebook post, the, the mental health training, um, all those sorts of trainings. There's some that are just established curriculum, right? Like the fair and impartial policing, that's a national curriculum. So we, we try to, you know, I mean, I don't want to say we cross our fingers, but to a certain extent, if it's a very popular national well-recognized training that's supported by our major organizations, we, we tend to think that that's going to be a good class. We don't always know. I mean, sometimes we send people to training and we don't know what it's going to be. And there isn't really an evaluation system for other than them saying, wow, that really was terrible <laughs> or, you know, them saying that was great. Uh, we don't have a way to measure the impact of training. And that's, I mean, I've racked my brain on that and maybe you have an answer. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's very difficult to measure the impact of great training. For me, when I go to a great training, what it means is I brought back an idea, right? Well, how do you measure that? You know, or whatever it may be, a program or a policy change I want to make or some, you know, a recommendation that's difficult to measure. Um, and instructors sometimes do say, you know, how did we do on a scale of one to four? What did you like? What would you change? You know, any of us that have been to a training ha have seen that kind of survey. Um, to us, that's not going to bring a lot of value to us particularly. Um, third question then is um, a, a constituent reached out to ask me, uh, if the Northampton Police Department or what the history is of receiving federal funding to or, or military surplus gear and federal funding um, for that. We never, I don't believe we ever have. I know that former Chief Sinkowitz had a policy against it. I've never done that. And so I can only speak to that, that short history, right? I know that Chief Sinkowitz didn't and I don't. Thank you. Yep. Um, and then the last, I guess it's more of a offer um, and, and I, which I did on the phone with you yesterday as well. Um, I know that the Massachusetts Black and Latino Legislative Caucus has issued recommendations, one of them being a civil re board, review board or commission. Um, and I offered to you as well yesterday on the phone, if there's any way I can be helpful um, in building police community relations, um, sign me up. I think this is a, a large, this is a large discussion. This isn't um, a, a tonight discussion. I sure wish it were. Um, I'll but let I, you know. I, I will not forget that you offered that. Okay, don't forget. <laughs> All right. Um, and I really appreciate um, you know the the information you brought to us and and that I can bring this back. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Foster. Okay, Councilor Jarrett. Uh, hello. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ke Chief Casper, uh, for your presentation and. Um, I also wanted to thank you for your response uh, to George Floyd and the death of George Floyd and the list of the 13 items that the, um, the department is doing. Um, so I, I feel very confident that as a police department, um, you know, that you're doing a really great job at moving in a progressive direction. And um, I got, uh, last fall, I got to participate in the ride along and meet some of the officers and that was very illuminating as well. Um, the, uh, some question I have, um, I am curious how much of uh, when you get calls, um, you, you would consider a mental health issue um, and then also a, um, an addiction issue, you know, sort of what, like what percentage um, and I'm, I ask that um, both as, you know, how does that, what is the response in that case? Um, and is it always the police that respond to those cases? Um, do you have alternate responders or referrals? Um, I am thinking in particular about a program that Eugene, Oregon is doing. Um, one in five calls there are responded by 
mental health first responders. They're not officers because um, there's an argument that it can be counterproductive to send an armed officer into a, a mental health scenario. Um, so I'm just curious about how your department um, works in in those in those scenarios. Thanks for that question. Um, Craig Kerouac, who's a lieutenant now, did a lot of work partnering uh, with the Department of Mental Health years ago on a grant, really studying our mental health calls to figure out what percentage is it? You know, how many of our calls have mental health involvement? I can only give you the number that uh, it's a rough number because this is not something that we can track easily. It's not like there's a box to check or something, right? Because mental health can fall under lots of different types of categories of calls that we may go on. But when it was being tracked years ago, when someone was reading the log and you know, ticking, ticking that off and checking, it was around 20 to 25%. So it sounds like consistent with what you've heard. Um, and we have had uh, an internship program where we had a, a social worker doing you know, follow-up services. I would love to see a program. We currently have domestic violence advocates. Those are civilians who are on a grant. They're in our building twice a week. They go over the log and if they or they get reports as well, but when they see cases that are domestic violence cases, they provide follow up support and connecting people with resources. I have been a long advocate for having someone like that who's working with people who have mental health issues, because we know what happens is that we'll get a call on a mental health issue for someone that we all know someone that we know we've, we've gone to before, who maybe is beginning some sort of negative cycle, we go there and we provide services usually, you know, initial early on, we may try to connect them with CSO <clears throat> or get them up to the hospital. Um, but we know if that person is not helped, that behavior can escalate into something that may end up with more police involvement. And we don't want that, but there's just not a lot of other resources out there. So I would love to have a full-time, you know, mental health outreach worker a civilian who, who can provide those services and connect people with, with the other resources in our community that they need. But I know that those services in our community, in social services, they're overtaxed as well. And they're not always available to come out. This challenge of our work is that it's immediate. You know, a lot of people who are in crisis, they can't wait for, oh, the next business day for a phone call or whatever it may be. So those sorts of services are absolutely critical. I would love to see that addition to the city. It's expensive. Mm -hmm. And in terms of um, what you would say, you know, addiction related, um, do you have an idea of that? I, I wouldn't feel comfortable giving you a percentage because I, I, I'm just not, not comfortable with that. You know, we definitely have um, calls around addiction, whether it's a family member calling us needing guidance, I don't know what to do, I'm worried about my loved one, or maybe it's an event that has occurred, a theft, which is probably one of our most commonly tied to addiction, people who need money. Um, you know, might engage in shoplifting. So we encounter people struggling with addiction there as well. Our DART officers trying to provide DART services, follow-up services to folks who are struggling with addiction, you know, even in, in the booking room or after they've overdosed up at the hospital, trying to get them connected to those services. We've had some great success stories and some people who aren't in a position at that time to, to seek follow-up services. So I, I can't give you a number, but definitely something that we commonly deal with. Mm -hmm. And then one last question has to do with, uh, you know, the crime rate or the major crimes, and I'm not exactly sure which fall into major crimes, uh, has been declining, which is wonderful. Um, how does that translate into the need for the, your force? And, um, you know, I mean, you could hear an argument that if, if the crime rate is declining, do we need as many police officers? So if you could speak to that. Sure. I mean, the crime rate has fluctuated for years, and really the crime rate is based, uh, impacted by a wide variety of factors, certainly including the economy and, and joblessness, uh, unfortunately, because some crimes are motivated by people who are in desperate times and, and need things or under a lot of stress or whatever it may be. So I certainly have concerns about where we're going from here with the crime rate just in the state of the world right now. We're looking at as a result of, of uh, COVID, uh, you know, a lot of unemployment. Uh, people losing jobs and, and needing things. And I have a lot of concerns about what's going to happen. Um, the nice thing about having a lower crime rate and watching it go down is that hopefully we can get to some of that other really important work that, that we've been talking about uh, in this meeting. There's lots of work to be done. And when we're going on calls all the time and responding to, to crimes and progress and writing reports, 
we're not able to spend time doing those other really important things. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jarrett. Uh, Councillor LaBarge, hold up. Thank you. What's happening? Okay. You're good. Okay. Um, Chief Casper, I have to agree with what I heard um, Councillor Rachel Mior talk about. And I feel it's really, really important that we all come together and we need to show many people in our community of color or your skin's brown or whatever, whatever the color of your skin is, that we all want to work together. Work together. That's what it's all about here. And we need to bring back back to our police department because for some reason our police department is being targeted at again and i i don't like seeing that happen but i agree with what i heard from councillor rachel muir and also from um, councillor foster i think we need to get together you do have counselors i am very willing also of sitting down and getting a community advisory commission of people of color or whatever the color of your skin is. And be like able to know if there is a problem of racial problems going on, it can be put in the butt immediately, immediately. I, I just feel we need to start somewhere and we need to show that our police department does care. And I think that's valuable here for all of us to get together and work together. I mean, I mean, what is happening today right now with the protesting? And I think I learned a lot just from George Floyd's brother speaking. When he said if his brother was alive, he never would want this to happen. Never wanted this would want this to happen that if you're going to be destructive that is not what this is all about it's what we call justice and equality for everybody so i think we need to get together in our city and go and start in a direction of going and going in the right way and i know it can happen i know we can open the doors and that we can have people not be afraid to talk and say, this is how I feel about something. That movement can happen. I, I'm very surprised when you mentioned tonight, which I didn't know, that you have tried to sit down with certain groups and it has not been successful. I've never heard about that. And I think now you're seeing counselors who are very willing to come forth and help you out in your department in any which way we can. And I, I think we all mean that. Thank you, Chief Casper. Okay, thank you, Councillor the Barge. Any other questions or comments from counselors for Chief Casper? Huh? What? Okay. Um, I just want to say, I know that people are trying to ask questions through chat. I feel your frustration. Um, you know, I, I said at the at the beginning that I was going to use the chat function only to help people if they were having difficulty raising their hands or participating from the public. Um, it, it, my goal is to get to the place where we can open this up for public comment. I know that there are things that you want to say. And my goal is to get us there. We have two more department presentations. So um, I, I understand that you have questions. I also know that Chief Casper is, um, has always been very responsive to questions. And I, a lot of these questions you have are specific to the department and the department's budget. Um, I know the mayor's office is also responsive to questions. A lot of the questions I'm seeing can be found on the police department website answers to that or in the budget book. Um, so, but I, I feel you, 
I wish I could answer all these questions, but also it's really important that everyone have equal time. That's our goal. So I'm trying to get to a place where everyone can have their time to make their public comment and have three minutes. And I can't go through all of these questions. I'm sorry, um, but I, I feel your frustration and I know you wanna speak and I wanna get you to that place. Um, if there are no other questions or comments for Chief Casper, then I'm gonna thank you very much for being here this evening. Councilor Maori, did I see a hand? Oh shoot, hold on. Did it again. Hands up. Okay, okay. sorry, we did it together. Now I was just going to say, you know, uh, just reiterate uh, uh, what I was saying earlier that I think we need to look outside of the police department and the mayor could also comment on this because there's lots of ways to lower the crime rate and perhaps investing in housing, um, jobs and social services is another way. So I, I, I get uh, I, I get that this isn't something the police department can do alone. And I, I would be anxious to hear what the mayor has to say about funding those kinds of initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mary. Uh, mayor Narkowitz, I'm going to unmute you if you'd like, or I don't know if you'd rather address this tomorrow when we take up the budget for deliberation. But no, I, I mean, I certainly agree that that, um, and I, and I think Northampton has been working on investing in housing. You know, we just did a fair access to housing analysis that we released at the beginning of the year that our um, housing partnership had begun to work on, obviously before this crisis. But we've been uh, we've been allocating. Um, significant amounts of funding, uh, both CDBG as well as um, CPA monies to try to support affordable housing. Um, our, our CDBG program, public services program, uh, we've been dedicating significant resources to support local social service organizations um, and, to, and to provide uh, programming, to provide legal assistance, to provide housing assistance. Um, so we are involved in those. And obviously, um, it comes down to resources. And we've you know, we've seen, I don't have to tell you, we've talked about it, um, about the amount of resources that we've seen decline from the state and federal government um, to our cities and towns. Um, and then it comes back to um, a funding structure relying on property taxes. And, you know, we know how that works. Um, so it's, it's part of a larger issue, but we are just definitely committed to um, focusing on all those areas, because I think a lot of this is falling on the police as we see the cracks in our social safety net that have just opened wider and wider. We have whole agencies that have sort of left, uh, you know, Hampshire County. Like we don't even have, um, you know, a job, uh, a job training center anymore in in, uh, in Hampshire County. Uh, we don't have um, mental health offices in Frank in Hampshire County. We've lost. You know, we used to have um, unemployment here. They left. So I mean, we've seen all those agencies be defunded and move away. Um, and then we, we then um, are, are dealing with the results and trying to figure out how we support those folks in our community. And often uh, the police um, end up being on the front line of that, trying to work with a lot of overworked social service agencies. So we're definitely committed to that work. And, and um, so, yeah, that's definitely part of it. Thank you, Mayor Narkowitz. Okay. Um, again, thank you, Chief Casper. And, um, you know, I, I know that there's there's certainly interest in this group. There's interest in our, the group of the council, obviously, that's been expressed, but in this, the larger people on this call to, um, to try again to have a forum or, um, a, you know, a way that we can come together and talk as a community around these issues. So um, I join the other counselors who have said that I'm, I am available and willing and wanting to have that conversation as well. So we will, um, we will work on that. But thank you so much for being here this evening um, and for presenting your budget to us. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a good evening, all, and thank you for having me. Thank you. OK. Next up, we have Fire Chief John Devin. And I am going to locate him. Go 
had it. Okay. Uh. Heather, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Chief Tevin. Thank you for joining us. Oh, well, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to be here to uh, discuss the uh, fiscal year 21 uh, fire rescue budget. Um, I took over, I guess you could say I was lucky enough to take over on uh, March 13th. And, uh, you know, as you can imagine, you know, our department has been uh, constant uh, pandemic COVID type work since then. Um, it's, it's starting to slow down a little bit, but I'll be honest, we are now, we are planning for the fall. Uh, we're, we're assuming that it's going to be just as bad in the fall. So uh, that's kind of where we're at right now. I think one of the interesting uh, statistics I can tell you this evening is to this date, since this has been since uh, March 1st, we have transported 191 COVID patients. So uh, we've been transporting some very sick people in the city. Um, so we're up to that 191 is current as of about two hours ago, they just did another one. So, um, you know, that obviously that's a number we track. Um, the budget this year is pretty much a level service budget. Um, I do have three vacancies. Uh, and I think the reason, you know, I've had a, uh, a bunch of older firefighters retire, you know, and obviously they're at the upper end of the pay scale. And when we replace them with a firefighter that's coming in a lower pay rate, you know, we've, we've been able to, to uh, get some savings out of that. Um, we're not adding any staff. Uh, we are just maintaining our current staffing level. I have 68 sworn positions for uh, firefighters, captains, deputy chiefs and staff and I have two civilians. So I have uh, an administrative assistant that works here in the office with us. And we also have a fire service mechanic who is a full-time mechanic just for our department. Um, you know, we were fairly moderately busy last year. You know, we did 7,395 calls. Um, we responded to 84 fires, including 23 structure fires. And, you know, we had a fire loss in the city last year of over half a million dollars. Um, you know, a big part of our job here, and usually it's consistently at about 70 to 74% of our calls are EMS. So last year we did 5,496 EMS calls. So we're, you know, we're a fairly busy department right now. Our call volume dropped down a little bit with this, um, with the stay at home order. You know, obviously people aren't going out, you know, they're not calling 911, they're afraid to go to the hospital, but it is picking back up. We average usually, and, you know, our folks work 24 hour shifts. They're averaging about 19 to 20 calls every 24 hours. So, you know, we're, we're, we're a fairly busy department. Um, but I would uh, answer any questions that anyone has. Thank you. Okay, I'm looking for counselors. Counselors, anyone have? Counselor Quinlan. I knew I wasn't going to get off that easy. <laughs> Chief, no way. Uh, Chief, I wanted to pay you a compliment to start, uh, which is I have a, a friend that works in uh, fire rescue in another city, and he was recently in your in your house, and uh, he noted that the guys were the, the people working there. Pardon me, not just guys. People working there were were all kind of exercising and talking about how the department takes being physically fit and being prepared uh, very seriously. He commented that at, at his house, uh, the only thing they lift are forks, um, but he was really impressed with, with your team's commitment uh, to, to being prepared. So I just wanted to compliment you on that. But I did want to ask you a question uh, just because we spoke when, when we discussed your, your you know, new role at city services, we talked about it was the day before the override vote. And we right. talked a little bit about the budget impact if, if in fact, uh, it hadn't passed, but, but we were fortunate that it did. I know that you still have three vacancies listed there. Yes. Uh, do you have candidates for those now? Uh, where, where does that process lie? Yes, so currently I have three vacancies. I do have, uh, we just actually yesterday made an offer to a, a candidate who's actually a full-time firefighter down in Florida. And he is looking, originally from East Hampton, so looking to get back up, up here. So we did make him a conditional offer of employment yesterday. Uh, so we're hopeful, you know, he's going to have to quarantine for a couple of weeks when he gets here and we have to get him through all the medical and, you know, his physical agility tests. We're probably looking at probably by the time we, we get him in the door for training, probably be August. Uh, the other two vacancies I will not be able to fill currently because I have two members that are, that are out injured and are awaiting uh, the retirement process. 
So that's going to take some time. So I, I won't be able to fill those vacancies until those two folks actually retire. Okay. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll talk to you again, I'm sure. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I see Councillor Thorpe and then Councillor Labarge. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Councillor Sierra. Chief Devon, thank you very much for being here this evening. Thank you. How has it been with the fire department and recruitment and recruiting uh, people of color and minorities? That's a great question. Um, historically, you know, we were talking about this the other day, actually, with our command staff, and you know, we we haven't had a, a lot of luck re recruiting uh, minorities for some reason, and you know, I think. I don't know if it's the paramedicine part that people just don't want to get involved in. You know, we do get a lot of folks that, you know, hey, I really want to be a firefighter. I want to fight fire. Well, you know, as I just said, that's, you know, three quarters of our business is EMS, you know, so, you know, we need good qualified paramedics. Uh, one of the things we have done is partnered with Greenfield Community College. So they have a, a, par a student paramedic program up there. And when their students are ready to go out and ride with an ambulance and actually ride with a, you know, a certified paramedic and, you know, they have to sign off on certain skills. And we've developed that relationship with Greenfield Community College. So we get all of their students actually have to come down and ride with our department. And that's kind of our chance to, to sell our department, you know, as Chief Casper had said, you know, trying to make it, you know, friendly and a place that they want to work. You know, and I think we've done a great job. We have the best equipment. We've got the smartest people. Um, and honestly, we're, we're struggling right now with finding good qualified paramedics. And every time somebody retires, I, I panic because, you know, we're lucky that, you know, we had this kid from Florida that, that wanted to come up, but we just, for some reason, people just do not want to be paramedics. And I, I don't know the answer and we're, we're struggling. And it's not just our department, you know, and it's, it's sad, but we actually, you know, I try to poach firefighters and paramedics from other departments and, you know, and as um, I think Chief Casper was talking with, with the, with the pay, you know, sometimes, you know, some of these people, they just, they'll go to the highest bidder, you know, if, if Agawam's offering a couple of bucks more an hour, you know, they're gone, but we have not had a very good, had very good luck at all with recruiting minorities. Are there any right now in the department? Um, there are, no. My, I had uh, my last Hispanic firefighter just retired in February. Yes. Well, we'll and if, I think, honestly, I think the two, since I've been here 22 years, um, two Hispanic firefighters is what we've had. Okay. Got more yeah. work, but thank you very much for your time and your service. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Labarge and then Councillor Dwight. Yes, um, Chief Devine, I want to congratulate you on your position. Um, I was unable to attend city service due to a family illness, but being on the committee for the fire department way back. As counselors, we learned a lot from the previous chiefs and so forth. I have a question in regards to response time with sure. the ambulances. And I remember at one point we used to have a problem trying to get that response time better than what it, what it was. How is it doing now? Our response time, actually, counselors, is doing very well. Um, we are well within the national standards. Um, I think, you know, in Florence, our, you know, we have an ambulance in Florence and, and a fire engine in Florence. And some of those responses to, you know, leads and some of the, the further, you know, out in your neighborhood, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a ride, right? So it takes a little bit longer to get out there. Um, the response time in, you know, city center down here when the, when our folks are responding here out of headquarters is, is obviously a lot faster because, you know, we're closer. So, you know, I think we're doing a good job of getting there on time and doing it safely and not putting anybody in danger on the roads and, and not destroying any of our equipment. So I'm happy with the, with the response times. I have no concerns about those whatsoever. 
I'm glad to hear that. And um, also, too, I want to thank you and thank all the men and women in your department working under such a critical time throughout our community and for everything that you are doing. Do you still have classes for the public for like CPR and so forth like that? Um, you know, we were, we were still doing CPR stuff. We were doing some first aid training for, you know, we are you know, like uh, some communities, community um, clubs, uh, like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, stuff like that. Um, obviously, we haven't been able to do anything in the last few months with this, with this yeah. pandemic. Um, we're not even allowing anybody in the fire station. Mm-hmm. You know, um, our folks get their temperature taken every morning before they come on shift. And, you know, we're not even allowing family members to visit. So, you know, we will get back into it. I just, I just don't know when. But we do have plenty of folks that are certified to teach CPR and and stuff like we do the car seats still and you know so we have all that stuff going on too thank you for everything that you're doing in your department thank you i appreciate it you're welcome counselor dwight Ooh. chief gavin hello how are you i'm good how are you <laughs> i'm pretty good i you you came on around the same time i came on actually yeah. and, and in that time the <laughs> culture the culture in the fire department then and now fire and rescue was vastly different. And in fact, actually your department's uh, undergone remarkable changes, uh, you know, external changes, pressures from outside and then with inside. And I have to say, I mean, for instance, uh, 22 years ago when you came on, all your responses were fire responses. There were, there right. weren't uh, EMT or ambulance responses, didn't have any. Right. Um, and then it became very clear. I know that we had these discussions over the time, over time, that actually fire safety had had improved to the extent that your fire calls were going down, and that it was in that it turned out that, as you point out, one of the more critical elements, and one that actually has a better service and a return and a contribution to the community that's more, is the ambulance transportation EMT response, which is you get a quality trained EMT responding as opposed to somebody who's moonlighting it as an ambulance driver picking you up and not knowing that necessarily the difference between a a nosebleed and a massive hemorrhage. And so (laughs) you you actually, as I said, so I I appreciate the fact that you are the chief because you and and also all your hazmat training as well. I don't want to oversee that. But the fact that you have a deep uh, understanding and knowledge about the challenge to the face to face the fire department and you have you have been there during really tough times, really and, and improving times. And it, usually our conversations used to be budget season every time was talk about fire department overtime. Right. It's no longer an issue that we don't we don't have that uh, kind of panicked feeling we used to have all the time, knowing that the FD was going to come in with an enormous overtime bill. And that's largely due to recruitment, also the way you guys train and the way you change shifts. So I just, I, that's just, I, I, I'm just saying, I, I suppose I'm saying all this just by way of, uh, for folks who actually don't understand how this department has evolved into the real crackerjack professional system that it is. And maybe hopefully understand and appreciate the level of service that we receive. I mean, you know, hopefully for most folks, they never have to experience your good work. But uh, when and if they do, they I, I do hope they understand and appreciate the uh, commitment you and your department have, have made to this community. And just saying thanks. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Dwight. Bet. Other councillors. Okay, seeing none, I also want to add my thanks, Chief. Um, You know, I I feel like, uh, so five of the counselors here are brand new counselors. This is their first term. And I feel like we we feel you in what it's like to start in a new position. It's really challenging time. Um, So thank you so much for your department's work. Um, And thank you for sharing those those statistics about um, the COVID 
patients that you have transported. That was really powerful to hear. So thank you so much for that work and for um, for doing it safely and, and all that you do. Thank you. And hopefully when this, uh, when this is over, we can get the new council on the station and get you folks a tour and, and show you around. So thank you very much, everyone. I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you. Okay, I am going to give the floor back to Councillor Jarrett, briefly. Uh, thank you. I have another conflict of interest to announce. Um, as a member of the Petal People Cooperative, I can't participate in the central services item um, because Petal People has a pre-existing contract with the central services department. So I will turn off my video for this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jarrett, for disclosing that. Okay, so the our last departmental presentation is Director David Pomerantz from Central Services. I'm gonna use the tool people, think, first of all, thank you everyone here. So many of you are trying to help me and give me, send me new um, Zoom tips in chat and thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate it. This is a challenging thing to do. So thank you, I'm gonna deploy one of them, which is, searching and there he is brilliant thank you so much everyone for reminding me that there's that option okay director pomerantz all right good evening Hi. everybody thank you counselor good to see you good to see you as well so i hope everybody's i hope everybody's well uh for those of you who i have not yet met I uh, welcome you to the council and uh, please feel free to contact me uh, at Central Services with any questions, more details on what we do. Uh, I did include the budget narrative in this year's budget book, which talks about the myriad of functions and activities that Central Services does. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the schools tonight. So if you look at the personnel side of Central Services in the budget book, uh, keep in the back of your mind that there are also 36 uh, custodian supervisors and maintenance staff on the school side that are under central services for the daily work that we do in the schools. They're just not listed on the central services budget page. So just wanted to throw that out. So I'd like to spend a couple of minutes um, talking about central services budget for fiscal year 21 and also the parking maintenance budget uh, because parking maintenance uh parking revenue uh, as far as the collection side and parking lots and garages are also under central services um, before i i start on a couple of items in both of those budgets uh, just a few words about central services and what our world has been like since march 17th um, we basically have had custodians in uh, to a lesser extent in the schools, but more so on the city buildings, uh, doing both security, uh, some maintenance, restocking and cleaning offices where those essential personnel have been working since March 17th. Um, it was also heating season when city operations were basically shut down. So we've had to monitor you know, energy management systems and then move out of the heating season mid-April. Um, we've continued our both heating and cooling and electrical work uh, on an as needed basis. And with warmer weather now here, finally, we're starting to ramp up with both outside landscaping and maintenance work on the school side and the city side, uh, as well as the, the cleaning schedule. Um, maintenance and, and landscaping activities in the garages and the parking lots is also slowly starting to ramp up um, with no parking enforcement right now. And, downtown obviously being as car free as it has been since March. This has been a great time for the parking maintenance staff to get in and do line striping and repairs in the garage um, as needed. Um, and the other thing I just like to mention is when we stood the uh, shelter up at the high school for the month plus that it was in operation, um, eight, uh, public school custodians uh, volunteered and rotated shifts uh, seven days a week to keep that facility disinfected and clean while the shelter was in operation. Um, so a real pat on the back to them. 
So let me say a couple of words about some key areas of both the central services fiscal 21 budget, um, and then talk a little bit about the parking maintenance budget, and then um, ask, uh, open it up for any questions or comments that you might have or clarification for information. So the central services budget um, shows a 2% increase for fiscal 21, and that is on the personnel side. Uh, and that is strictly due to um, salary and, and contract related increases. Uh, there's no increase in the operations costs, I'm sorry, operations dollars for fiscal 21. Um, I will note that right now uh, we have two custodial positions on the city side that are open. Uh, we had an individual recently leave and then with the current status, with the uh, senior center being closed for obvious reasons, uh, we are shifting the second shift custodian from the senior center um, to work more at the police department, which is obviously a 24 seven facility. Uh, the individual is still doing work at the senior center because they think they have five or six staff that are, are in there working but we've scaled back his time there and uh, added him for more hours over at the uh, police station for 24-7 uh, cleaning, I'm sorry, 24-7 operations uh, and increased cleaning and disinfecting in that building. Um, if things change, uh, we are gonna go ahead and try to fill that position where the individual just left um, because we will be ramping up, obviously, as city operations begin to ramp up again. Um, some comments on the uh, operations and maintenance side of the central services budget. Uh, you'll see that both the um, utility side for both natural gas and electricity, uh, we just inked two two-year contracts for both natural gas and electricity with new suppliers. Uh, we do a solicitation every two years and uh, we like to use two years because it, it helps with uh, the finance director and, and budget cycle planning uh, to look at two years. Um, so we have co new contracts. Uh, the figures you're looking at include both supply cost and distribution and transmission costs that we pay for separately. Um, the rates, um, sorry, I, I thought I hit the mute button for a second. The, uh, the rates that we're paying are a, a touch higher than we paid for the last two two-year contracts, uh, but because we are, are soli do solicitations uh, in a large pool, uh, we normally get very good rates. Uh, and this year we're using a constellation for our electricity and um, um, direct energy, I'm sorry, uh, Spark Energy is gonna be providing our uh, natural gas moving forward for the next two years. Uh, we have not burned oil in any city building uh, for probably seven or eight years. Uh, when I came on, um, we started doing a conversion to natural gas and we are oil free across the city. Uh, we have been for about uh, seven or eight years. Um, let me talk a little bit about street lights. So about three years ago, we did a major streetlight conversion project in the city. We converted 2,000 plus of the existing streetlights, uh, which the city owns, to LED fixtures and bulbs. Uh, we were no historically paying about $250,000 a year in streetlight costs. Uh, at that point, National Grid provided maintenance for us on an annual basis, which we paid for. That was included in our bills. Um, we are now paying because of the savings uh, and the longevity of the LED fixtures. You look on the line, our streetlight costs are down to about $125,000 a year. Now, that is not all energy costs because when we did the LED conversion, the city had to absorb doing the maintenance on streetlights. So we have a company uh, in Belchertown, electrical contractor. We have a contract with them, multi-year contract with them to provide maintenance. So whether a lamp blows, which is very seldom, a fuse goes, which is more likely, or National Grid decides that they wanna put up a new pole, 
we have to change the fixture in the arm on the existing pole, we bring this company in. So about $25,000 of that line item that you're looking at for street lights in the fiscal 21 budget covers the maintenance aspect. But we've really slashed the street light costs for the city by 50% uh, in the ensuing three years based on the rate tariff, the longevity of the, of the uh, lamps and fixtures that we installed. Um, one clarification you'll see in your budgets that there is a line item for repairs and maintenance, as well as repairs and maintenance buildings. Um, we separate that because repairs and maintenance is uh, work on our buildings and systems where we bring in an outside vendor, uh, a heating contractor, a plumber, um, an electrical firm where my city electrician doesn't have the time to go in and do the work. Uh, whereas repair and maintenance buildings is all work that we're doing for the most part internally. Um, most of my staff have either construction supervisor's licenses, uh, they're licensed HVAC or electrician. And because of that, we can do a lot more work internally, office renovations as an example. Uh, it saves the city having to pay prevailing wage costs. So we keep those costs down from having to hire outside contractors. Uh, we get the work done faster because we're not dealing with bidding and procurement situations. So I just wanted to make the distinction. You'll see two different lines in the budget for repair and maintenance and then repair um, and maintenance buildings. Um, trash removal, just to call your attention to that, we are finishing a three-year contract uh, for removal of trash, recycling, and some composting, uh, both, both the schools and city buildings. Um, we were going to go out to bid this spring for a new three-year contract, uh, but because of the situation we found ourselves in with COVID and the trash contractor was basically reducing our cost because there was no trash being picked up because operations were so curtailed, um, we are going to do a one-year extension uh, with some operations changes, but a one-year extension with the vendor uh, and then go out to bid for which would be fiscal year 22. Um, so that's trash removal. And then the other item I wanna mention is it's a large item in the budget, contracted and inspection services. Um, we have multi-year contracts for a host of uh, vendors that need to come in and do work on our systems. Uh, some are regulatory and required by the state or federal government, and some are just maintenance, uh, uh, work, maintenance work on an annual basis. So example, uh, regulatory required inspections covers fire extinguisher testing, elevator inspections, generator inspections and testing, sprinkler system inspections and testing. Um, and then we also do boilers and a, uh, AC system maintenance on an annual basis. Uh, the geothermal system at the senior center gets tested annually, uh, it covers pest control, our energy management systems maintenance. Um, so the increase you're looking at between fiscal 20 and fiscal 21, uh, about $10,000 is for cost increases from the vendors and their contracts, insurance costs on their end, labor costs on their end, et cetera. Uh, but I just wanna make the distinction that there are two different types of contracted and inspection services. And then as the narrative talked about, um, we do more than just take care of the buildings. So Central Services has a centralized uh, photocopying and copier program. Uh, we have about 16 copier systems uh, spread around the city uh, buildings. We do bulk purchasing for office supplies, custodial supplies, which all allows us to keep our costs down, uh, more efficient operations. And um, uh, just wanted to note that, that that's a central, those are centralized programs that we've run for years uh, through central services. Let me just shift over to parking maintenance for a minute. Um, similar to central services, the cost increases you're looking at for personnel on the parking maintenance side are again, due to salary adjustments. Uh, we are not increasing positions. Uh, we have one maintenance person in the parking maintenance, on the parking maintenance staff that covers downtown work 
and is part of the city's contribution to the DNA system. Um, you've probably seen this individual early in the morning, street sweeping, uh, dealing with plantings, dealing with the brick sidewalks in front of the businesses, uh, tree trimming, things like that. Um, so that person is part of the parking maintenance staff. A um, couple of operations and maintenance points. Uh, trash removal um, is the pedal people contract that Alex was talking about. Uh, we have a three-year contract with the pedal people. Um, we had a base year and then two one-year renewals. We're in the second year of that three-year contract right now. Um, that is for their services downtown, picking up trash from all the trash receptacles and putting that uh, material in the various compactors and uh, containers that are spread either in the Armory Street lot or the Masonic Street lot. Um, the rest of the contract for trash under parking is for the contract that we have and we're going to be signing a new five-year contract for disposal of uh, the, the trash in those parking lots that I just mentioned. So that's included under trash removal. Technology services, uh, we now have 36 of the green multi-space uh, pay-by-plate systems around the town. We have eliminated many of the parking meters in the downtown core. Um, the systems that we now have, you know, take credit cards, um, and we, because of the credit card capability, we have monthly data costs for those units. So you can use your credit card. So that's what technology services covers. And then just to mention site improvements, if you look down at the bottom of the parking maintenance budget, site improvements covers random maintenance that the parking staff does, painting, uh, crack sealing, uh, miscellaneous equipment and, and supplies, and then equipment parking and parking garages that covers maintenance on parking machines and meters, uh, supplies for the green machines as we call them, the parking kiosk, uh, computer equipment for the parking garages, um, security cameras in the garages, um, and then any work we need to do on the ITS garage revenue system uh, with the gate system and uh, uh, pay stations along the uh, various floors of the parking garage. Um, one note, uh, energy management and renewable energy projects also comes out of central services. Uh, we're doing a number of uh, capital projects this summer involving energy. Um, just a couple to let you know that uh, uh, where we're headed. Uh, we're gonna be doing uh, system and envelope assessments of city buildings. Uh, this is going to help us prioritize energy reduction capital projects, which are going to help us meet the mayor's uh, recent directive for net zero by 2050. So we're going to be surveying seven city buildings this summer and do the schools next year to identify everything from air sealing to uh, windows problems, projects rather, uh, insulation issues that need to be addressed, heating and cooling systems, that can be prioritized. So we fold those into the capital schedule moving forward. So we're addressing the most needy projects first, the ones that are gonna give us the best reductions, the fastest to reduce either electricity or natural gas consumption. Uh, Chris Mason, who's the energy and sustainability officer for the city. We've been extremely busy with green communities work doing lighting upgrades in parking lots, the garage, garages rather, uh, parking lots at the schools and all the schools um, based on green communities grant money that Chris has been bringing in. Um, a lot of that besides the grant money, we get extensive rebates and incentives from National Grid. So it's a real home run for the city to do those lighting conversion projects. Um, if you've gone by the senior center this winter and early spring, we put up a uh, solar system to complement the work of the geothermal well system for heating and cooling. Uh, so the senior center is now gonna be generating electricity uh, for its building needs. And that project will be coming online in the probable, probably next two to three weeks, I think. And then lastly, we are working on um, 
solar canopy systems, one project for the roundhouse parking lot and the other for uh, main fire headquarters. Uh, the main fire headquarters project uh, is intrinsically tied to resilience and climate adaptation work that the, a lot of departments in the city have been working on. So this is a system with battery storage and a solar array. So if power goes down besides the fire department having to use their generator, this is gonna give a stored electricity via the, uh, a uh, solar system to help run operations there and especially the emergency operations center, which is where we run that out of main fire. So that's it, Councillor. Um, just a brief overview of the two budgets and I would be happy to entertain any questions from the group. Thank you. Thank you so much for that overview of your remarkable department. I just wanna take a moment to celebrate your department um, in, and always, but particularly in the last three months, I think you don't get the celeb you know, the, the thanks and celebration that you all deserve for the work that you always do, but, but have been doing tirelessly since we've been in this crisis. So thank you very, very much, Director Pomerantz. And thanks to your whole- Thank you, thank you, Councilor. Um, I am going to go to Councilor Dwight and then I see Councilor Labarge. David, hello, how are you? Hello, Councilor. So I, I think, you know, it's worth noting, you know, I have to say, and I'm sure folks who are watching this, yeah, your presentation's a little dry. It's not on you. It's what it's the the magnitude of things that actually your department addresses, and some of the more and the one that's probably more critical that would have been more critical, honestly, if COVID hadn't happened and then all the other ensuing crises that we're experiencing now, you would be your department would um, probably get acknowledged a lot better than it than it would normally, particularly in this in this hearing, because. You're where the rubber meets the road, if I may use that horrible metaphor, when we address climate resiliency and climate change. And I don't know if anyone, not everyone knows that or necessarily appreciates it. It's your department that, and under your aegis, that where we have actually the significant reductions of energy consumption uh, that municipal buildings have, you know, they're basically antique creaky oil uh, heated systems with sealed windows for cooling that people couldn't open and you have modernized antique buildings and created and lowered our footprint significantly and but not stopping there because it's also worth noting is that uh, as you said, Chris Mason is under your aegis, and he, he, between you and Chris and your operation, the community should appreciate the fact that our objective towards 2050, of course, which for some people is you know not adequate, but given the sense of urgency that we have of climate change, but it is the more practicable one, the one that that we can apply. And as I said, this was the burning issue pre-March, this is what we were focusing on, was the existential crisis that climate change uh, presents. And not only uh, the fact that it, it threatens our very existence and our lifestyles, but it also it, it impacts people in frontline communities first, people who, who are, are more vulnerable. And everything that you and your department have done, which is, I, I have to say again, is, is breathtaking and honorable is, and the fact that you guys aren't stopping you're going as you know full bore with a, a very very complicated issue and enormous challenges and you guys do it with uh, without complaint and with vision and compassion and understanding about the breadth of the challenge and the breadth of the impacts that climate change has on us so I, I felt you guys needed your proper respects on that point. It's not just the guys uh, painting lines in the parking garage or the people pulling money out of the meters back to the old meters, and then it's it's or or the custodial staff, the custo all every person who works in your department is devoted to the same mission, and that's 
that's on you and congratulations and i think it's worth worth uh worth a little bit of applause thank you councillor dwight councillor labarge thank you councillor gina louise Sarah. A little bit louder, Councillor Labarge, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, but you've gotten very, even lower than before. <clears throat> I, maybe it's something, I don't know where your microphone is, but is there maybe papers on top of it or? Moved. Oh, it just got very loud. That was me. That, that was, was our <laughs> I have a cold too, so that might be it. But um, David, I want to thank you and all your staff for everything that you have done for our city of Northampton. Can you hear me, Jada Louise? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm trying my hardest. Thank and, you. Um, I have a question about Ryan Road School um, with the um, bathrooms at the school. I noticed on page 46 about the upgrades of the bathrooms at Ryan Road School. Could you talk about that? Oh, wait, hold on. Thanks, Councillor. You're welcome. Okay. Um, yes, Counselor. So we have um, capital money for the upgrades to six of the bathrooms. Uh, so the common student bathrooms, uh, some of the faculty and staff bathrooms. And before March, the plan was to go in this summer and do all the work. Now, depending on what we're gonna be looking at as far as reopening protocols and timeframes for cleaning the building. Um, I'm in discussions now with, with my managers about how much of that is gonna take place based on what other issues we're gonna to have to deal with. Um, so it's a priority. The, the bathrooms do need attention. Uh, this is all cosmetic work, but yes, they, they do need an uplift, uh, but we also need to factor that in with everything else that's gonna be going on or that we need to address uh, based on what could be happening come August. I have a question about um, one of the bathrooms, which I know that capital improvement is involved in it. And I had talked with um, Sarah Madden, the principal, also the Ward 6 school committee member um, last year of several children who are in wheelchairs and just with a disability. And they have to use the Hoya lift in the bathroom. So I had gone to the school with a couple of the teachers and saw the nurses room, which they said was the right room to be able to put a toilet in there and enough for room for two people to bring in that young child into the bathroom and be able to motivate that Hoyer lift. That's my concern about that bathroom because of the children with disabilities and the concerns of that small little bathroom with the Hoyer lift, which is not a good scene there. So I'm certainly familiar with that proposed project, Counselor, and we did some initial designs and ran some initial uh, estimates on doing the work. Uh, based on the proposed dollar cost to do the project, um, we also were working with the superintendent on looking at spending that money in the building versus other needs. Um, so it's, it's still a project to be looked at. Um, there is no firm construction schedule at this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other counselors. Okay. Um, 
Oh, sorry, Councillor Thorpe, I see you. Hold on, there we go. Got it? There you go. Got it. Director Pomerantz, thank you for being here this evening. Can you talk to me a little bit about the uh, compliance and accommodation line item? Page 49. So compliance and accommodation, it's an old budget line. Uh, it was here when I, when I came in, in 07. And uh, we normally uh, treated that as sort of a, uh, a miscellaneous line where if we needed some additional supplies or we needed to purchase some uh, items that didn't fit in a uh, more standard budget line, uh, like trash, uh, we would just carry a small amount of money there. Um, I think in retrospect, we could probably fold that into building and maintenance um, costs or, or, or funds rather, uh, but it's, it's an old line. It's sat in the budget for years. Uh, it, it has, it sounds regulatory in nature and legal, but uh, it, it, it's nothing like that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillors. Oh, Councillor Mayori. Wait, 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 wait. You're, you're still muted. Director Palmer, it's just a very quick thank you for the, the, the well-run uh, shelter that at the high school it was really an impressive and uh, speedy effort and, it, uh, I, and you kept everyone safe and healthy and I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let, let, me, let me just say, Councillor, that um, I also have a background in emergency operations and um, have found myself working with departments across the city since I came here, you know, on, on various uh, unknown planned situations that have come up, weather related uh, emergencies of, of various types. And um, the caliber of the departments that I've had the opportunity to work with since March in both the emergency management side and now the reopening committee that I'm on uh, exemplary professionalism. So it's to say it's a group effort is is not to to do it justice. But uh, amazing people from the mayor's office on down. Um, just want to let the counselors know that it's a pleasure to work with with these department heads and these departments on a day to day basis. Thank you. Okay, counselors. Last call for Director Pomerantz and Central Services. Okay, seeing none, thank you so much, Dr. Pomerantz. It's very good to see you. Thank you for being here with us this evening, and we look forward to seeing you someday in person again. All right. Thank you, counselors. Pleasure to see you tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so those were the five departmental budget presentations. Um, thank you. I First, uh, I just, Chief Davin um, sent me a message saying that he, there, he, wanted me to amend saying that he'd said, he said, I misspoke, I do have one minority firefighter. So he wanted that to be known. Um, so again, we've finished the departmental presentations. I wanna thank everyone for your patience. This is what a budget hearing is. Um, it's involved and it's dense with information, um, but that's the, the work that we need to do. And so um, I thank you all for sticking through it. I hope that this has really given you an idea an, um, an insight into what your city budget is. So with that, we are gonna move to public um, testimony. And again, I'm gonna call, I'll call on people and um, I will unmute you. And I'm gonna set the clock for three minutes. You'll hear a tone when the three minutes are over. I'm sorry that you can't see it. Um, and then I'm going to ask you to please finish your sentence so we can move on to the next person. Again, feel free to just say ditto or I agree with what's been said before. Um, and we're going to try to get through as many people as we can because we really want to hear what you have to say. So thank you so much for sticking with us. And I am going to start. And, and if I mispronounce your name, I'm deeply sorry. My name gets mispronounced all the time. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I'm going to start with the person who has had her hand up the longest, which is 
Gaza Abazi, I hope I'm saying your name even close to right. I'm going to unmute you. Did that work? You're still muted. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Gaza. Um, so I have three minutes and I'm going to try to make the best of them. Uh, I'm really grateful to my uh, council members who are exploring alternatives to police. Um, I'm going to sort of start off by saying something that, you know, everyone already knows. I feel like everybody already knows that the police is basically an institution that at this point is just killing black people. And I feel like all of my council members already know this, but I feel like, you know, you guys are still sort of sympathetic to, it's like kind of shocking to me how sympathetic you are to expanding the budget of the police in the middle of a global crisis um, in which like the police is continuing to kill not just black people or like still killing black protesters on the streets who are protesting the killing of black people by police. Um, when, you know, the, there's like in the middle of a global recession, I have to say I am very surprised. Um, but anyway, quickly, I'll just, uh, I'll try to be as quick as possible. So just as a reminder, um, I remember two years ago, I was here and I cited the same statistic. <clears throat> uh, so the U.S. has the largest uh, population of incarcerated people in the world. Uh, from 1980 to 2015, the incarcerated population of the United States went up from 500,000 to over 2.2 million people. Um, so the United States has 5% of the total global population, but it has uh, more than 20% of the world's prisoners. So it's just like this gigantic carceral state and just doesn't want to do anything else except to imprison its own people and generate a lot of profits for carceral corporations like Geocor and other corporations. So it's a lot of like you know, we think that this money doesn't matter. We think that it's just Northampton. It's just a small pool of money. It's not the NYPD, but it's like across the United States, all of our public money is going into funding like these gigantic killer corporations who are profiting off of black debt. Like, is this the country, is this the country that we want to live in? Is this, is this a part of the system of necro capitalism and black death and white supremacy like legalized state sanctioned white supremacy that you want to uphold, I'm asking you. Um, I mean, there are massive racial disparities in policing. Um, African Americans are only 12% of the population at large, but um, they are 34% of the correctional population. Um, one, they're incarcerated at five times the rate of white people. Um, African American women are incarcerated at twice the rate of uh, white women. 32% uh, of the children who are arrested are African-American children. As we know, um, cops, kill, uh, cops kill, you know, black American children. I also want to point out one thing, which is that um, everything, all of the stuff that we heard from the police department about trainings, we need money for trainings. The Minneapolis Police Department implemented trainings on implicit bias, mindfulness. That was the time. Please finish your sentence. Thank you. Um, and a lot of trainings and, never, and none of it worked. Uh, none of it worked. Neither do new technologies. Body cameras don't work. Um, and none of, no trainings about diversity, hiring um, cops of color. Uh, two of the cops who killed- uh, Thank you, thank you so much for your thoughts. We have over 300 people on, so I need to stop you, but thank you. Okay, next we have, um, Sakia, hold on. Me. Hi, thank you. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to, sorry. Um, I want to speak to, I know that this is just a budget hearing, but like, and maybe you all think like, oh, like this is just like, however much money, $10,000, but I think that it, it really does start in these kind of like small local government things. And I think like, if, if you see the turnout for this, it's like, we understand what this is. And also you need to not give this money because it, that is like a small part of it. And I just wanted to share a personal experience that I've had with the Northampton Police Department um, because it's, it's, um, not just 
but it also it's not just about specific things. It's just the whole system of policing. Like it doesn't do anything for the community. If, if the people, like as they've even like said, the people don't trust them, like that's not, they're, they, they're not gonna be able to do anything. So why give them money if they can't do anything because nobody trusts them? Um, why not just do something else? Um, but in, in January, uh, a mental health call, one of my housemates tried to commit suicide and um, the cops came and like pounded on our door at 4 a.m. And uh, I, I answered the door uh, in just a robe and I did not open the door. I was asking if they had a warrant and they were belligerent. They didn't tell me it was a mental health call. They just demanded that I open the door. I didn't even announce themselves as police until like almost a minute into the conversation. Um, uh, demanded that I open the door, they were gonna burst it down. Eventually, I opened the door, tried to back away up my stairs out of the way as two men charged into my house at 4 a.m., grabbed each of my legs, pulled me naked down the stairs as I was screaming for the entire house, the entire block to hear me. And then they finally let go only because my housemate was holding me back and screaming. And then they go to my housemate's room where he, and they didn't even fucking do anything. They didn't even move him into a recovery position. They didn't do anything. There was no reason for them to have come into the house in the first place. And I don't understand why we need to keep giving money to a department that only harasses people, that like, there's not any reason for this. Everything they do a social worker could do it better. Don't give them money. Don't give them more training. Just please get rid of them. And I hope you'll listen to this. Also, their names were Officer Nicholas Limoges and Kevin Cook, and thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, next up, we have Tom Gregg. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yes, you're unmuted. Hi, so I guess I just wanted to start what I have to say by saying that the dramatic attendance here is a product of a sustained community effort to defund the police. This is not a reactionary thing caused by the events of the past week. As Gaza stated, two years ago, there was a public hearing that was very well attended about the police budget and this expansion of access to riot gear. Um, and so, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why I don't think that the police should have their budget expanded, much of which is contextual, having to do with the lack of funding from other departments, like the superintendent stated, and like Councilwoman Scalia stated about the DPW having very underfunded access to quality vehicles and everything. And so I would like to echo what other council members said about the necessity of new hybrid cars, especially during a global pandemic that doesn't seem very necessary. And also I very much would like to be corrected if I'm wrong, but I was looking over the budget earlier and it looked like senior services were cut by 25% for year. 21 and given that senior citizens are so vulnerable right now that does that like really scares me and i really think that the money could be directed elsewhere um i also would like to actually echo what council member dwight said which is that yes we don't i can definitely confirm that the community is not asking for more comprehensive training and better technology that's not what we're asking for much of what this community represents is a sustained vision towards a future that does not need police officers. There are alternatives out there, like Councilwoman Mayori said. Um, Amherst has a team of trained street medics that's a volunteer community of people who can do like really intense stuff that police officers say is an essential thing for them to do. Um, so this is about the $200,000 and this is also about something that's really, really huge that a lot of people believe in. And so I really hope that you'll hear that. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for those comments. 
um, Cora. Uh, Cora was there a moment ago and now it's not there. Okay, Cora, if you did want to speak, um, let me know. Okay. Mimi Odgers, you, you are unmuted. Okay, thank you. Um, Mimi Odgers, I live in Northampton, Ward 6. I'm here to speak in favor of reducing the budget for the Northampton Police Department. The murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, followed by numerous acts of police brutality across the country, and the numerous forms of violence inflicted on black and brown people in just the past few years should cause Northampton to rethink and reshift what policing means and looks like in our community. I am angry and terrified at the militarization of police across this country. I have heard firsthand accounts and seen multiple videos of police using excessive force against peaceful protesters. I realize that we have not had the same type of violence in our city yet, but let's start to look at other better practices already occurring across the country. For example, instead of policing, instead of police officers responding to calls related to mental health, we can shift to a model that relies on mental health professionals. Many areas are finding success in doing so. Eugene, Oregon's crisis assistance helping out on the streets, the CAHOOTS program, relies on social workers and medics instead of police for responding to mental health calls. Not only does it save money, but it also ensures that the person in crisis does not feel threatened by the presence of police in uniforms and with guns, tasers, and batons at the ready. Additionally, in a model like CAHOOTS, a person in crisis doesn't wind up incarcerated due to any possible charges related to the encounter and instead receives services provided by area nonprofits. I recommend that the city create a panel to study how we can reduce the need for police officers and to institute a civilian oversight board for the Northampton Police Department. In our current economic outlook, I think that any increases in the budget for the police department should be shifted to other areas, especially to our schools, which was the number one reason people supported the override. Take the proposed $200,000 for police and use it to make sure we have adequate testing and tracing for students to return to the classroom. Be willing to reduce police staff to ensure our schools have smaller classroom sizes by not laying off teachers. As for the current budget, in looking at it, I see the police department has a budget line that states, police department supplies $92,537, but there is no transparency as to what those supplies include. Uniforms and office supplies have their own line items. Does this supplies line item mean weapons then? Residents should know what type of weapons and for how much our taxpayer money is being used to purchase. The fire department also has a supplies line, but that is listed at $20,000. This appears to be a huge discrepancy between first responder departments and as a taxpayer, I would like to know what NPD is buying with my tax dollars and my community's tax dollars. There needs to be a true reckoning on the values of Northampton and what we spend our money on and how we envision what the enforcement of law should look like here. I will close by saying that I personally have never had a negative experience with any member of the Northampton Police Department. I also know that the police officers go through training to try and reduce bias. However, in the current moment, every municipality across this country should take stock of what currently is and how we can make it better. Every community should take stock of how much they invest in police compared to how much they invest in the residents who are most likely to be policed. I do not want to live in a city where the police have riot gear and military weapons. In our current political climate, it does not make me feel safe, and I believe our tax dollars should go Thank to you. community intact, not purchasing weapons that could be- Thank you for your comment. Okay, I am gonna go back to Cora. Um, first, I also, I should have reiterated, when you begin to speak, you need to state your full name and your city or town of residence, please. Apologies for not reminding people that. Um, okay, Cora, you are unmuted. Hi, um, yes, my name is Cora Siegel. I live in Northampton. As someone who has feared for my safety in Northampton, I have never felt safe turning to the police. I have always found the best care and protection from my neighbors and community members. When the police and the city council met mention acknowledging the ongoing police murders of black people and police violence against black communities, it's really not enough to pay lip service. We need to take action by starting off with rejecting this proposal and defunding the police. 
Also, even if Northampton is a model of so-called progressive policing, under that model, I want to remind people that in December of 2018, the NPD had had a planned trip to Israel um, to work with the Israeli Defense Forces to gain surveillance and counterinsurgency tactics um, and equipment from a brutal occupation. And this happened under the heading of so-called progressive policing. We do not need vague lip service, a divorced police force, or more training. We need material changes, defunding, and ultimately abolishing the police. Thank you. Thank you, Cora, for those comments. Um, okay. All right, next I am gonna go to Danielle. Hi there. Um, Thank you. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, Tony McDade, and Nina Pop. I say their names because I would like to invoke them into our record for this meeting and for the work that we do here tonight. If you don't know who they are, please look them up. Um, my name is Daniela Amadeo. I live in Ward 3 in Northampton. I am also a member of the Northampton Arts Council as a mayoral appointee. Um, I'm on this call to address the issue of police department budget um, specifically, but before I do so, I call attention to some work that is happening in the arts and cultural sector um, that many of us haven't heard about, but is, is tied to emergency relief for folks in our community. Um, the Northampton Arts Council, under the leadership of Executive Director Brian Foote, has raised $40,000 and allocated that in emergency relief to artists. I think we awarded um, over 100 grants, so I'd like to give him kudos for that work. Um, vision is, is a little bit easy, execution is tough, and he did so um, splendidly. So thank you, Brian, and just want to let people know that that work is happening. And I'd like to cite that as an example that work of work that is happening outside of police, outside of emergency response that provides direct support to our community in times of need. And I'd like us to think about using that as a potential model for the ways in which our other human service departments might provide immediate aid to our community. When we're thinking about the mission of transforming the mission of police, as um, Chief Casper said, to one of um, community outreach, education, and service, I'd like to think about the ways in which we, we value police and we pay police to reflect those, um, <laughs> those services. So I, I ask um, our, our council members and our mayor to, to go back to the police department budget with Chief Casper. And as Mimi said, look at where those supplies budgets are actually going look at where those, those raises are going. I would implore you maybe to think about um, implementing impact bargaining to see if in this time of global um, economic crisis, we, we rethink giving raises to our police at, at this time. I don't think that that's appropriate at all. It's not the message we wanna send as a community. Thank you, Council Member Maori for, for imploring leadership. And, and I would ask you to do the same. I believe I have close to a minute of time left and I would really like to yield that um, Council President to any, um, Black or Indigenous person of color who's in the queue. So please try to call on someone else. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, okay, next we have, oops. Next is Mac. Hi, uh, my name is Mac Godinez. I live in Northampton, Ward 3A. I'm here to demand that the city council reject the increase for the Northampton Police Department and to move to fully defund the police, diverting these funds into social services, education, housing resources, and other areas which foster public health. This is step one in moving away from policing. There's not evidence that police reform works, as many other people have said. Moreover, like police departments across the nation, the Northampton Police disproportionately arrests Black people actively working alongside the anti-Black system of mass incarceration, which plagues our country. I have never once in my life needed police to keep me safe. Every single time that I have needed help staying safe, it has been loved ones and kind strangers and community members who have kept me safe. It is not only impossible, but imperative to fund and build strong trauma-informed social services, community, community grievance councils, and accountability programs to take the place of the inherently anti-Black and white supremacist institutions of police and prisons. Council members, Northampton residents are tonight making it very, very clear where we stand. It is your absolute duty to represent us and we will be paying attention and holding you accountable in your time. Thank you for the comment. 
Okay. Um, the next person to speak is Aspen Bay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, I am Aspen Bay. I live in Ward 5. Um, I'm a resident of Northampton. Um, I would like to just say that I also am here to um, say that I do not support the rates in or the expenses allocated towards the police in the budget. Um, I also find that they have um, been very violent in their responses um, and heard the person who spoke of um, the violent experience they had that evening in their home um, and have many people in my life who have also had experiences like that with the Northampton police. Um, and I don't think that that, like Cora said, is under progressive policing at all. In fact, I think it is violent um, and pervasive and, um, you know, leads to <laughs> things like we saw this last week. Um, in fact, I've had friends who have been violently arrested when having mental health crises as well um, and things like that. So I totally don't support it. Um, and I think that we as a community can move towards things like trauma-informed um, mental health uh, organizations that can come in and respond to things like that rather than police officers um, who are untrained to deal with uh, mental health and things like homelessness and um, economic stress and all of the things that affect our community. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. Next, we have Grace Simmons. Hi. Hi. I'm, I'm using my friend's laptop. Uh, my name is Ashley Ginsberg. Um, I am currently resident in Amherst, but I've been living in, I lived in Northampton from 2011, 2018, went to high school and middle school in Northampton. Um, and I was also at the protests on Monday, I believe. Uh, and I'm here to remind you all that a budget is a reflection of our values as a community. That is what a budget is, as where we allocate our funds. And um, I'm frankly shocked that there are things that we have not spoke about in this meeting. I've been on since 5 p.m. And I have not heard a single reference to the fact that the police maced peaceful protesters on Monday. And I'm wondering if people actually care that our neighbors, children, friends, under the age of 18, were maced after the police took a knee with us. They took a knee for a photo op, let's be, let's be frank about that. They took a knee and then they stood up and they turned around and they maced young people. They maced your friends, they maced your neighbors, they maced your children. Those are chemical weapons and I have absolutely no idea why that is an appropriate thing to do in this country why we are fine with that. Um, I would like to know um, why Joy is no longer on this call, or um, Police Chief Casper, um, why the mayor is no longer on this call, if certainly if citizens are sitting here waiting for questions, to very legitimate questions, uh, waiting for answers to very legitimate questions um, that she is posting about on Facebook, trying to give us answers to, then I would love to see her on here answering these questions. Um, I would like to hear about Eric Matlock, who the police, uh, who was, who sued the Northampton Police Department for $700,000 because on the steps of the Northampton Police Department, he was dragged for peacefully and legally protesting in 2017. Um, if anyone is truly worried about addiction, which has been echoed by um, addiction and mental health and things like that. Why are we not funding tapestry? Why are we not funding wet shelters in the area? Why are we not funding community resources to help people with mental health issues instead of throwing them in prison? Like, how is this, what, these are no brainers. Let's, why are we still having these discussions? Um, yeah, I yield the rest of my time to uh, minorities that would like to speak in, have much more profound experiences than I have with the Northampton Police Department. Um, I've never personally felt unsafe. I've worked at a wet shelter in Amherst and um, I've dealt with mental health issues and addiction in people of all ages and 
and I've dealt with the, the police in responses to several incidents at the shelter. And my experiences with them have been excellent. However, I am a white person. And so I will have no idea what the reality is for the rest of our community. That's, that's all I have to say. I have a lot of questions that no one will answer. Okay, thank you, thank you. For, for those comments. Yeah. Next is Dana Goldblatt. N not very well, actually, very low. Um, say something else. Uh, can you hear me now? It, it's still incredibly low, okay. slightly better, but still very, very low. I'll just try to talk really loud then. Okay. Does that help? A little bit. I'm on my laptop and it's hard. So it's, uh, it's oh, not a very good speaker. It actually just got a lot better. I don't know why. Great. I don't know either. So my name is Dana. I'm a Northampton resident. I want to pick up uh, what Gazal was saying before when she was cut off, uh, she had her three minutes about the Minneapolis police. They have implemented every single reform that Jody Casper was bragging about her police department having done. Every single one, the implicit bias training, the de-escalation training, the psychological testing, the whole business. And this is what they got. And every single study says that's because none of that works. When you send an armed paramilitary, and that's what they are, they have titles like sergeant and a corporal or whatever the paramilitary titles are. They're an armed paramilitary organization. And the things that they told us that they were doing were, uh, let me see, they made this list of things that they were doing. They install car seats, they hand out masks, they do administration like registration and public health education. They put on birthday parades. We don't need an armed paramilitary to do those things. This is officially insane. The fact that we got to the point that it, we justify an armed paramilitary because they're like, well, we're trying to be less paramilitary-ish and we do birthday parades is insane. We need to defund them a lot. They are sucking up resources from tapestry they are sucking up resources from housing. The reason they deal with the homeless is because instead of housing the homeless, we pay the police to deal with them. It is cheaper to house the homeless. And I don't mean provide tax credits to small businesses that build housing that provide 10% of 15% of 82 people who have uh, vouchers. I just mean house the homeless like they did in Minneapolis when they took over some hotels. Because we're not doing that, we pay the police to, to quote, handle them. We pay the police to handle mental health instead of, financing for, instead of financing mental health counseling and mental health treatment. So this is all insane and it needs to stop. And it can stop today because you say it stops. You can stop it today in Northampton. And I'm not just talking about the 200,000. You cut the police budget by 25% and you give that money to organizations like Tapestry that do real work in the community and you are gonna see an improved society with less disorder and less crises. And also when people come to Northampton, they won't see an armed paramilitary parading down the street in bulletproof vests, which is about as clear a sign of we endorse white supremacy as you can have in your town right now. And that's what we have. We have these armed patrols stamping through our streets and it's, it's terrifying and it's wrong. And I don't think it's what we need in Northampton anymore. Thank you for those comments. Okay, next we have Emily Coffin. Hi, I'm Emily Coffin. I live in Northampton um, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, so like others said, you know, the fact that the chief has left, she said she's been trying to connect with community. Here we are. It's not on her terms, it's not with her power, and that's why she has left. Um, and that's really a problem. And the mayor said that, you know, the police are filling social services cracks, which is again exactly the problem. And the fact that he even said that is illustrating that he does not understand the problem. Um, 
you know, we are living off old ideas that fear can help the collective we and living our best lives. There's an assumption that a police officer keeps us from doing bad things, but what it does is it triggers fear, it triggers trauma, it triggers a fight or flight response where nobody makes good decisions when they're faced in front of a, of a police officer with a gun. Everything you said illuminates the way that police are trying to act as the front line for social problems. Our front line of social problems should not carry guns. If you step back, scale down the police department, you will leave room for social services and community organizations to fill the gap. If no one steps down, there is no gap for us to fill as social workers and as, social, as community organiza organizations to fill. We are defaulting to police to solve the problems because that is where the money and the power is. We need to put power and resources elsewhere. And the first step is police handing over that power and those resources to people who are more equipped to solve social problems, the community, the people, the people who are spreading love and safety and calmness rather than fear. And the, the, what it takes is you guys are, you know, we're talking about this one moment in time, it takes pre proactivity and you guys have had time. We told you two years ago to not buy them riot gear. We've told the city many, many times when Eric, Ma Eric Matlock got arrested, we told you guys that we do not want the police to solve these problems. And yet you did. And Mayor Narkowitz, you had the time to work on these problems and you've chosen not to. Do not tell us now that, oh, this is just a budget hearing that's popping up at an inconvenient time. This is a fight we've been fighting for years and you guys have had time and the, the time for abolishing the police and finding other ways. It, it means the police need to take a step back so other things can fill the gaps because we're relying on them because they're, they have money and they have resources and other places like social services don't. So step back police. Thank you for those comments. Um, next, we have Annie Ricotta. Ricotta. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Um, so, I mean, I hope that y'all are listening closely. It's unfortunate that um, the public comment period is coming so late. I'm seeing like a lot of glazed looks on people's faces, but also there's a lot of passion here. Um, it is shocking that it took almost four and a half hours for anyone to mention the minors being maced by the NPD, but I do appreciate that um, the person who spoke earlier finally brought it up. I just like to say every time I go through downtown Northampton, cops are harassing houseless people um, and the money that that cop is getting paid could go towards supporting uh, the people getting harassed instead of criminal criminalizing them for being homeless. Council member Dwight, uh, thank you for mansplaining this incredibly painful situation in the most dismissive terms possible. That was extremely valuable. Uh, it's nice that you can acknowledge the historical moment that we're in and the desperate need we have for deep structural change while conceding that you have neither the courage nor the imagination to take part in it. Chief Casper multiple times offered up the notion that training is a way to address some of the serious concerns that people have expressed about policing, but failed to name a single specific benefit uh, that she had gotten from training aside from an idea, which is far too nebulous and vague to be satisfactory, especially as her and police forces around the country have continued to use the notion of more training to hide behind criticism, especially when on top of whatever soft power training the NPD has participated in, they've also trained with the disgraced former sheriff of Maricopa County, Joe Arpaio, who has bragged about his tent city outdoor desert prison by calling them concentration camps. Uh, Jody Casper is weaponizing the low hanging fruit of this pandemic to say that joblessness is going to lead to an increase in crime and therefore a sustained relevance for the police but the amount of money you're requesting for salary increases alone could significantly benefit more important and proven responses uh, to joblessness and other problems. Chief Casper mentioned trying to have conversations with the community about race and other issues. Um, and she said that those conversations have been shut down or not been successful. The reason those conversations haven't been successful, successful is because we don't want there to be police. We don't want reformed police, we want no police. Every interaction I've had with police in Northampton and elsewhere has been escalated by them. The time has come to think boldly and imaginatively about a future without police. What we need now is not to increase the police budget, but to drastically decrease their funding so that those funds can be directed towards efforts that actually have a clear and proven benefit for public health. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. 
Thank you. I need you to please uh, state your name and your city or town of residence, please. My name is Annie Ricotta, and I live in Great Falls, Massachusetts. Thank you so much. OK, next we have Liz. Oops, sorry, hold up. Uh, we good? Yes. Uh, hi, uh, so my name is Liz Walber. I'm a Northampton resident in Ward 3. Although I am here uh, working this meeting um, as part of Northampton Open Media, I am speaking as an individual, not a representative of Northampton Open Media. Uh, the conversation we heard between counselors and the Northampton PD chief has been from the inaccurate vantage point of progressive outsiders watching human rights atrocities occurring elsewhere. But on Monday, the NPD maced a 15-year-old protester near the, ear of the, near the end of a peaceful protest in our city. This problem is and has always been here as well. It's surreal to hear justification for an increase in the police budget sandwiched by the DPW, the superintendent of public schools, and central services, all explaining how they're going to finesse the cuts to make up for COVID-19. It is appalling that the police will receive a budget increase while providing no essential services to address the most important health crisis in, in modern history. With that said, policing has nothing to do with public health and the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and countless more black people across the country at the hands of police officers exemplify that the police are in fact a danger to the public health and the very existence of black communities. Giving the police new hybrid cars at this moment would be an embarrassment, a travesty, and an official announcement from the city council that they are not listening. It would essentially become a meme about our city. To be frank, pedal people does more good on community for our community on bicycles. It is a familiar mistake by public, uh, public officials to look for the police for leadership to solve this issue. The police institutionally are this issue. The only fix to this issue is abolishing the police. A band-aid would be simply disarming, and a budget increase would be pouring salt on the wound. We have several new counselors who ran as progressives, and I ask them to meet this moment and prove themselves. I trust independent like organizations to independent organizations like Tapestry Health to help members of our community with op opioid addictions more so than the Northampton Police by far. If domestic guidance counselors brought in to the assist to assist the police work, why do we need the police officers? Why can't we just get more of them? It's short-sighted to say that there should be support mental health counselors to serve the community as an addition to policing instead of an alternative. There could be an initiative separate from the police department and we can imagine a world without policing. Councilor Maori said that she would like to see Northampton be a model for this moment, but counselors need to be aware that this model is unpre unprecedented. This is a very brave stance that all 500 people who have signed in are taking and they're taking it together for a reason. This cannot be like the response to police violence under the Obama administration with more money to police departments. That obviously didn't work because here we are again. Now is the time for municipalities to align themselves with the, the people over police and police unions that are tearing our country apart and bringing up to bear American fascism. Uh, the counselor is suggesting that there is a need for the community to meet police at the table. I'd like you to look at the numbers of people in this chat right now and see that this is the meeting at the table. They don't want the police to be at the meeting, as uh, Annie said uh, just now, if I'm, I hope I said the right name. Um, additional funding does not work. We do not need an advisory board to meet with the police. We need our local representatives to listen to the people about the police, and the people are here now. Uh, I yield my time. Uh, it was one second. Um, thank you, Liz. Um, next is Veronica Douglas. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Hi, my name is Veronica Douglas, um, and I do. I live in Northampton, and I'm here to speak against the increase in the police budget. On Monday, I witnessed Northampton police officers pepper spraying children at a peaceful protest. Was that progressive policing? No, it is unacceptable. I demand that the council not only cease to attempt to raise the police department budget, but that the council cuts the police budget by half. It is clear that this money would not be used in the public interest, nor in public, nor for public safety. Instead, these funds would be used to line the pockets of people who use chemical weapons on children. If pay raises and hybrid cars are so important, the Northampton PD should cut their pepper spray and riot gear budgets to fund them. I demand these funds be redi redirected towards services that actually help our community, including public schools, health, and housing. Why spend money on hurting children when you could spend that same money on educating and helping those same children? Thank you to those who are still listening to the public, unlike Jody Casper. Thank you for those comments. Next, we have Annie Wood. 
Hi, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Cool. Um, I am a Ward 3 resident in Northampton. My name is Annie Wood. Um, in the time that I've lived in Northampton, I've personally witnessed two instances of police brutality. Um, one was spoken to earlier by Sakaya, and the other was on Monday when they pepper sprayed children who were protesting against police brutality. Um, I also am a shelter worker and have seen many instances of uh, frankly, disrespectful, rude, and aggravating behavior that was not trauma-informed towards my clients. Um, I want to emphasize particularly that no amount of shallow photo ops, hugging protesters, or um, sensitivity trainings or internal reviews will put a band-aid on this. We need to defund the Northampton Police Department. Um, I have been frankly found the council's response, the entire council's response, out of touch and condescending for this entire meeting. I don't think you fully understand the moment that we're in or the way that the community is feeling about the Northampton Police Department. And I ask that you all seriously consider what you are being asked of here. Defund Northampton PD and reallocate their budget towards things that actually matter, which is not policing us. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Next, we have um, the name just says iPhone. So I'm going to unmute you and then I need you to say your name and the city or town where you um, reside. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shelby. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you give me your full name, please? Yes, um, my name is Shelby Dean. I'm currently a resident of East Hampton, but I lived in Northampton up until uh, four months ago and I lived there for three years in downtown. Um, first of all, I'd like to echo those in my community calling for a decrease in the budgeting for the police department. I would like those funds to go to public services. As someone who lived in housing, public housing in downtown Northampton for two and a half years, the public housing desperately needs funding. I would never live there again, and I would never live there with a minor child. Secondly, I want to thank the DPW and Central Services for being incredibly clear and transparent with their budgets and honestly on top of it with the crises we have going on economically. Incredible. And thank you for the counselors for listening. Um, I want to also address the counselors now. Um, Counselor Dwight, I'm really disappointed in you and also with a lot of members of um, the community here. Um, for not representing the voices of their community who are clearly asking for very specific needs for a long time. And um, just the clear disrespect of the people not participating in the public comments when you have an unbelievable, unprecedented turnout of people who want to express what they want. I'd like to yield the rest of my time. Thank you for those, <coughs> excuse me, thank you for those comments. Um, next, we have Elisa Klein. Elisa? Good evening. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you, city councilors. Thank you for your service and all the time that you put in. And I also want to thank everyone from the community that's spoken. Your, um, your words mean a lot and it's really nice to know that so many people are in solidarity around um, uh, reducing the budget of the police and defunding the police. I have a few comments. Um, I'd like to look at what we call public safety or policing. It's um, actually public terrorism for many in our country and here in our community. Current day policing everywhere is actually a threat to the safety of people of color in particular, but to all members of our society. This is not a commentary on the integrity or lack thereof of our local police department. It's an articulation of the very tangible and brutal effects that systemic racism in our society and as such in our governmental and societal institutions has on people of color. People 
Uh, police are the institution in our society that is authorized to use force in our communities, supposedly as needed. But what it comes down to is that police are the institution that very visibly and tangibly expresses the systematic and societal racism that is rampant throughout all of our systems and structures. Police behavior and actions are a tangible expression and symptom of racism that is expressed through violence against people of color and at its worst, the murder of people of color. So why not reduce the possibilities for that racist violence to be inflicted? It's among your responsibility counselors as elected officials to do your part in turning this around. It behooves you to rethink what true public safety should and could look like. The scope of policing in this country has become overly broad and deeply misguided. For instance, policing is done in our schools through so-called school resource officers. Policing is the go-to for addressing people who are houseless, people who ask for money in our downtown, for people with mental illness and behavioral issues, for addressing addiction and for addressing youth violence, all things that should have other prevention and response resources in place. The issues surrounding these populations rarely, if ever, need sirens and armed officers in militarized gear. Criminalizing students, poor people, people who are houseless is not what these folks need, nor is it humane or effective. Having worked for two decades on issues related to interpersonal violence, that is sexual and domestic violence, I have had person after person contact me to ask about alternatives to calling the police. They want the violence to stop. They want their family member or loved one to get help. They want help for themselves, but they don't want to engage with the police. Very rarely in my 20 years doing this work have I known individuals and families who are dealing with family that, violence to actually want to call the police. That was the time. They just haven't had other resources. We need to shift that, our understanding of what I, real public safety can look like. Thank you. I know you know the, the, the time and that we're trying to get to other people. So thank you for those comments. Okay, next is Emily Hunter. Well, I'm gonna do a hard, a bad job on your name. I apologize. It's okay. I just wanted to point out again. Can you say that, your name for us, actually, and tell us your the city or town of um, residence. Yes. It's Emily Hunterwaddle. I'm a resident of Northampton. Um, I wanted to just kind of echo what's been said and also point out again how ironic it is that Chief Casper would say that they've tried to open up a dialogue when they then left this meeting. Um, and also that it was mentioned that the police are relevant because there's going to be an increase in unemployment and so therefore an increase in theft, but we're not increasing the budget for unemployment or other human services the same way that we're increasing the police. Like that doesn't make any sense that we would treat the symptoms instead of the cause of the problem in our society. And I just wanted to point that out, that that is just insane that we would just be treating like ban doing band-aids for deep hurt in our community. I wanna yield the rest of my time. Thank you for those comments. Next is Sophie Maki. Hi, my name is Sophie Mackey. I'm a resident of Northampton. I live in Ward 3. I'm also um, calling to support defunding the police, particularly I'm deeply disturbed by um, the budget that increases funding to the police during this time when there are so many budget cuts in other departments. I'm hearing city councilors, I'm hearing many people name that systemic racism is an issue. I'm glad that we're naming that as an issue. But if we're going to say that, we also need to be talking about systemic solutions. Training cops is not going to work. That's not a systemic solution. And I don't want cops trained on mental health because I don't think cops should be um, giving mental health care to people as it's deeply inappropriate for someone with a gun that can kill someone to be providing mental health care. Instead, I want systemic solutions like defunding the police, and focusing on other creative solutions that are alternatives to policing. This can mean investing in housing, investing in healthcare, offering rental support, and providing other social services. 
Um, I appreciate that the, the calls for creativity from the city council, and now is a time to show up for that. The ask to defund the police is not radical, especially at this time when we're, there's, we're in the midst of a global pandemic and there are many cuts across the city budget. Reduce the funding for the police and ultimately we need to abolish the police. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Next we have Woody and Eric or Eric. Hi, you're unmuted. Hi, awesome. Woody Woodger in Greenfield. First, I'd like to say that it's an act of cowardice for Jody to not be here. Um, and I wanna say abolish the police it should be the end goal of where we move socially. Um, I wanna speak directly to some of the things that the police chief mentioned. Um, many of the, the movements that she's suggesting that the police could make um, are refuted in a Guardian article that says that the Minneapolis police and um, Dana, Annie, and Liz have already brought these things up. Um, the Minneapolis police, this is a quote from a Guardian article, uh, the police implemented training on implicit bias, mindfulness, de-escalation, and crisis intervention, diversified the department's leadership, created tighter use of force standards, adopted body cameras, initiated a series of police community dialogues, and enhanced early warning systems to identify problem officers. And still, we have this issue now brought by that exact same police force that had those systemic uh, uh, changes put in place years ago. It, it's Policing is not a matter of um, uh, moderation or, or changing how the policing happens. Policing is a force of violence. It's the violent arm of the state, and it is used to keep people, specifically um, people of color and minority groups, in a specific uh, marginalized space so that the ruling class can continue to hold power. It's not a matter of how do we fix police. It's a matter of how we abolish a violent system that uses coercion and, and bodily harm as a way to keep people from being able to be fully actualized and participate fully in any kind of uh, social system that we have. So um, thank you and I yield the rest of my time. Thank you very much for those comments. Next we have Alex Western. Hi, um, my name is Alex Western. Um, I just graduated from Northampton High School. I live in Northampton. Um, I First of all, I heard a lot of things from um, Jody Casper today about things she's doing that um, didn't seem accurate. She talked about um, how they're, or she was asked about diversity. She kind of deflected the question, but um, if you go to the Northampton Police website, it says they have four cops that are non-white. Two of them are black, one is Latino, um, and they have one. Asian detective out of, I think she said 65 officers that they have sworn in, um, which is clearly not diversity, even for Northampton, which is 95% white, it's still underrepresenting those communities proportionally. Um, and obviously we need more than proportionally in order for minorities to have a real voice. Um, beyond that, she was asked about how she vets trainings and she kind of said um, that it's a, uh, a process where they just go and find out and I think part of the problem is even if we do theoretically do progressive policing even if we do um, have a, a valid police system we're still supporting the the national network of unjust policing like in Maricopa County Jail where they abuse prisoners and by going to those trainings we are as a city supporting and enabling that oppressive structure and by going to trainings in Israel with the Israeli Defense Force, which is shown to shoot protesters and has been condemned by the UN for doing things like that, we're enabling globally human rights violations. And even if our city individually does not do those things, which is obviously a whole other issue, but even if we don't, our police system is enabling those things. And that's something we need to take really seriously. Um, because I don't want my tax dollars. I've been working since I was 16 and I don't want my tax money going 
to support a national and international network of oppression that um, we see a lot of times. I yield my time. Thank you for those comments. Next is Felix O'Connor. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Felix O'Connor and I'm a resident of Northampton Ward A. And I believe my statement will mirror much of what others have said tonight, um, commenting on the proposed budget for the police department. Considering we are still in the midst of a global pandemic alongside a national uprising that leaves that is calling for the defunding of police, I think that a budget proposal that leaves the police budget untouched is downright irresponsible. Any comment that has been made tonight regarding the death, let me be more specific, any comment that has been made tonight from city council members, as well as the mayor and the police chief regarding the death of George Floyd and the understanding of concerns people are raising are empty words without engaging in true reflection on the nature and structure of policing as a whole, regardless of the trainings that have been shown to not work as we've heard directly in this, this evening in testimony from others. There was a time before police, there are alternatives to police, there are proven alternatives to policing. For example, as Counsel Counselor Jared mentioned and as many of the people on this call tonight have echoed, there are cities who have deployed social workers rather than police where that has been absolutely successful. And uh, Chief Casper mentioned that social services in this city are overtaxed and would be expensive to import. And alternatives like this would be um, expensive to implement. And so I'd like to thank her for the excellent suggestion as to where the funding for the police department would be better allocated. Although as was previously mentioned, she is no longer here. We are seeing in this current moment where people in Minneapolis are giving out food, medical aid, childcare items, and helping their community after being directly after being brutalized by police. The funding for police belongs in the community, especially the communities that are systematically under-resourced, where crime often becomes a necessity in order to meet basic needs. Reform does not do enough to get to the roots of the issues present within policing. We've all had to find new jobs. We've all been unemployed, especially right now, and police officers are welcome to do so as well. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you. Next, we have Jonathan Goldman. Hello. Uh, my name is Jonathan Goldman. I am in Northampton in Mary Ann's ward. Uh, I am formerly one of the, Demo the Democratic State Committee member for the Hampshire Franklin Worcester Senate District and also the former uh, chair of the mayor's Northampton Mayor's Youth Commission, among various other things that um, I was involved with. Um, and what I really want to point to are two different things. One, what it means to be someone who is elected to represent people. Um, and two, to really think about um, what we can do in this moment. So the first on what it means to be someone who is elected. Um, one thing that I have been hearing as I've been talking to city councilors and state representatives and senators across the state has been this constant response of, you know, we hear you, we wanna do something, but, but what is the issue that you want us to tackle? And one of the things that I learned from being in an elected position is that it's our responsibility when we're elected to turn back to the people who are saying they're hurt and say, here are some various policy positions that we've thought of, that we've talked about, that we know work out there, and here's what we're going to do. So I would love to hear and, and give the opportunity for all the city councils that are on this call to say, are there you know, various types of ordinances that you are thinking about that can be implemented, things that you are going to do beyond even the budget and thinking more broadly beyond that, because I think that's something that a lot of people here want to hear is what action can people really implement in this moment. Uh, I think the other part, in addition to that, is it's not just about hearing people, not just about listening to people, but also thinking about, um, you know, how can we bring in those voices, not just saying, hey, here's a table we'd love for you to join, but coming to people and joining them. 
And on Saturday is when this next action is going to be. And I imagine many of the city councilors here will be joining for that next action on Saturday. And I think that while I would love to hear from many of you now to see if there are any ordinances or petitions or anything like that, that any of you are envisioning could be brought, um, I think it would be particularly powerful if that's something that could be committed to for Saturday and people could see what action this council is going to take. And all in there. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm gonna remind you that we don't respond during public comment time. Um, it's the time for other people to speak. We are gonna be, we have a council meeting tomorrow and um, we'll be deliberating on the budget then uh, during the meeting. So um, that would be an opportunity where counselors could speak, but also they could also follow up with you individually. Um, next, we are gonna go to, hold on, let me turn off this before it goes off. Um, Esther Dalvaloy. Yes, hi, um, my name is Esther Dalby Valois. I live in Ward 5 in Northampton. And I would just like to talk a little bit about the comments made tonight about trying to improve the police and community relations. As much as people in Northampton would like to claim that we are a progressive paradise where there is no evidence of racial biases uh, exhibited by our police force, that is absolutely not the truth. In 2017, Eric Matlock was pepper sprayed and then dragged off the steps of the Northampton Police Department for peacefully protesting his child being taken away from him. He sued the city claiming that the police were racially profiling him and also alleging that they had lied in their reports by failing to interview witnesses, even with video evidence of bystanders asking the cops to stop hurting Matlock. Four years earlier in 2013, Jonas Korea was arrested outside of a Northampton bar simply for filming a police officer who was questioning his friends. Korea was maced by the officer, then tackled and arrested. Both of these men and their lawsuits claimed that there was an excessive force used against them because they were black. Matlock's case is still ongoing as he's seeking $700,000 in damages and Korea was awarded $52,000 in 2016. While these men completely deserve every single penny they get from this lawsuit, these lawsuits, this money should not have been spent compensating a preventable incident. Think of all the money that could go towards education or social work where it can be used to uplift communities of color. In addition, these two men were able to get the monetary sum they deserved because of the unique situations they were in. There are so many more people who don't have the means for lawyers or video evidence that they were discriminated against. If you search Northampton, Massachusetts police on YouTube, the videos that come up portray our city as a racist and unsafe place. There are videos of both Korea and Matlock's arrests, as well as other videos of people being pulled over or questioned for no apparent reason other than their race. A video uploaded only two days ago showed three Northampton police officers not wearing masks or wearing them incorrectly, which is violating the Northampton Board of Health mandatory COVID-19 policies. This was during the protest on Monday. These officers ignore and walk away from protesters asking them to correctly wear their masks and to take a knee. Is that really how we want our city to be portrayed? This is our reality. We can't hide behind the promise of being progressive and non-discriminatory. We need to fight hard to make real change, which will only come when there's greater education and less members of the police force, not with more weapons and new cars. Please do not approve the increased funding. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next, we have Eddie Gorey. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, I'm Eddie Gorey. I use they, them pronouns, and I am a resident of Florence in Ward 6. And I am here to, or, to um, strongly urge the city of Northampton to defund the Northampton Police Department um, first of all, I am really disappointed in the city councilors here tonight who have repeatedly suggested, um, especially Councillor Dwight and Labarge, that their own constituents are merely angry without actually having a full and nuanced understanding of this issue. It is a complex issue and we are very aware of that. Um, clearly, clearly the people here tonight have expressed a deep understanding of policing. And I do hope that some of the folks on this call will take that as an invitation to run against them in the near future. 
I take issue with the idea that Northampton is capable of so-called progressive policing, um, especially with the incredibly disturbing track record of violence that our community here tonight has done a great job of highlighting. Um, Chief Casper um, was not even able to provide us with any data-driven information about uh, why their style of policing works or about even why they go to specific trainings. Um, whether or not an officer feels like a training was of value to them is actually an embarrassingly bad rubric and is frankly unacceptable. There are data-driven um, trainings that they could look to and frankly the data is that policing is not the best way to be responding uh, to uh, mental health crises, uh, to homelessness, and to um, other social um, justice issues that are facing our city. So again, I urge the city to reject, to reject this budget um, increase for Northampton police and to take bold steps to show us that you're the innovative leaders that Northampton needs right now during this literal crisis, but also during this moral crisis. Um, Otherwise, frankly, I think that you can expect for this opposition to continue to grow. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you for those comments. Next is Briar. Hi, um, my name is Briar Lake. I'm a resident of Montague, but I'm concerned about the policing in Northampton as it's close to me in my community. I'm here to ask the city council to deny Mayor Narkowitz's proposed budget and defund the police. It's frankly insulting that you would even consider this increase with what's going on across the country with black and brown people putting their lives at risk, calling for massive systemic change. Based on the conversations tonight, I don't think the council understood that our demand for the budget to not be increased is quite literally the bare minimum we could ask at this moment and that we as a community need way deeper change. There are so few jobs that Casper, Casper listed that the police serve that could not be done by someone without the authority to restrain and arrest and mace people, mace teenagers. I don't want someone with a gun driving by my house for my birthday, and frankly, I see that as a cheap photo op and pacification and distraction tactic. Casper, who's not even here anymore, when Mayori asks you about your thoughts on how we could care for our communities and transform what police are, you sorry, I said you because I thought that she would be here. They responded by acting as a victim, accusing the community you are supposedly paid to work for for not working with you. With that response and with the repeated framing of Casper as a victim by all of you, you showed us how ill-equipped the police are to even consider the impact they're having on the community or take responsibility for the violent systems they stand for and uphold. We are past the point for reform. And you say you want money for trainings and yet Casper admitted you can't even predict the usefulness of any given training and that there's no system to evaluate them. If we don't know they help, and in fact, through Minneapolis, we know they don't, why would we funnel money into them instead of into our community? There's been independent volunteers giving each other mutual aid these last few months because the needs of our people are so far from being met right now and police have been actively agitating to these efforts. Many counselors are pointing out that they think we are projecting what we see other police forces do, but we know full well while we're here. It is not about how progressive or diverse this department is. We don't want police at all. Many of us, trans, black, brown, immigrant, disabled people do not call the police when we need help out of fear for our lives. How can we stand to pay these people 60,000 at entry level for work we cannot even ask them to do? I'm urging the council to vehemently denounce the mayor's budget proposal, and I would like to see a major decrease in funding for police in the next budget. And I would love for police to not exist at all so that Northampton can act as a model for my town. I yield my time. Thank you for those comments. Next is Franny Choi. Yes, hi. Um, my name is Franny Choi. I live in uh, Northampton in Ward 1. Um, like so many others, I'm here to demand that you reject the proposal to expand police funding um, and instead to severely decrease funding to the police. Um, I want to echo what so many people have said about the importance of defunding the police, which, as a reminder, is a violent, racist organization that has direct historical roots in slave patrols. Um, as many have said, those funds should be redirected to community-led led restorative social services um, and to, in, to invest in alternatives that grow our humanity rather than terrorizing Black people as well as people of color and other marginalized folks writ large. 
And then, but the one thing that I really wanna say is that on May 7th, the Northampton City Council passed a resolution denouncing anti-Asian, anti-Asian American and xenophobic discrimination. In that resolution, the council invoked the 2016 resolution that you passed, declaring Northampton's commitment to being a safe and accepting community in which, it, uh, in which you stated um, that, it be that you believe in, quote, the rights of people to lead lives of peace and dignity free from fear, harassment, and violence. These resolutions are beautifully worded, but they are meaningless unless you actually do something to divest from the organization, the organization that is directly responsible for perpetuating fear, harassment, and violence. To pass a resolution like this and then not only do nothing to back it up, but to actually give the cops more money is an insult to the lives of Black people murdered by the police this year and in many years prior. It is an insult to the Asian Americans whose lives you invoke in order to prop yourself up as, an, as anti-racist progressives. And if you do choose not to decrease funding for the police, but instead to increase it, then I ask that you retract this resolution. I will not have the myth of my well-being invoked in order um, to create a myth that the Northampton the Northampton City Council is a body that believes in the in the uh, the right of people of color to live in dignity um, and safety. Another thing I want to say is that I know that the influence of the chief and the FOP are strong, um, but I'm asking you to be accountable to the people that you represent and not the people who just who simply have the easiest access to your ear. I'm asking you when they come back to you to talk about the funding that they supposedly need in order to train themselves, and they will, but of course that's the only solution that they can imagine. Um, when they inevitably do this, I just want to ask you to try to be brave and to try to remember the over 500 people who were on this call and the over 300 people who stayed on it for maybe nearly five hours to talk to you and the friends and family and community that we represent. Um, uh, and, and then I guess I, the last thing that I'll say is to the, to the people who are left on this call, um, just to say thank you to all of you um, and to remind us all that this is something that we can do and um, this does matter. Thank you all. Thank, thank you for those comments. Uh, next is Alex Alto. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Alex Alto. I'm a resident of Ward 3. Um, I'm here to echo everything that has been said before me. I want to propose the proposed increase to police funding and to um, echo the sentiments of people before me demanding that we defund the Northampton police. Um, quickly, before I get into everything else, I'd like to point out that uh, one of the things Jody Casper so vehemently uh, styled herself as a proponent of was um, that we simply have to give these public servants their step raises. Um, I am also a public employee who's represented by a union and I'm one of literally thousands in our city right now who is on a furlough and pending a layoff because that's literally just what everyone has to deal with if you're not a cop. Um, and in addition to being economically entirely ineffective, we know for a fact that Northampton police specifically are racist antagonists who don't actually serve our community in any way, shape or form. Um, in addition to the testimonies of everyone who's spoken before me tonight and to the experts who have given their testimonies to that account as well. Um, personally, in my own anecdotal experience, I, like many other people here, have seen Northampton police harass and hassle houseless people on our streets. Um, I personally also um, was subjected to cops trying to intimidate their way into my apartment um, on a bad tip for a crime that was had never actually been committed um, and I was told that I should let them in without a warrant and that if anything were to happen um, I would I would be charged because I was criminally responsible and I'm a white woman in Northampton so it's the fact that I'm such a marginal this isn't about me in any way but even I have this story is just a resounding testimony to the fact that Northampton police are not good at their jobs and that they are actively harming the community. Um, if Northampton wants to tout itself as a progressive utopia or better yet, actually just be a safe and equitable city, um, I urge you strongly to reflect the exceptionally clear desires and demands of your constituents, including everyone who's spoken before me on this 500 person call and the child that you recently maced. 
um, not only to deny these proposed increases, but also defund Northampton police and reallocate that funding towards resources that actually serve the community um, that are already in our community, like safe passages and tapestry, public housing, education, literally anything that actually serves our community. I yield my time. Thank you for your comments. Um, next, we have Amelia Chalfont. Hi. Um, my name is Amelia Chalfont. I am a resident of Ward 1 uh, in Northampton. Um, and I want to echo the sentiments of a lot of people who've spoken tonight, um, and especially thank Councilperson uh, Rachel Mayer for her uh, comments about structural change. Um, a disbanding of the police, as I think many of us are calling for, requires sustainable, safe, and strong alternatives, um, which is why we're proposing these alternatives to the policing system. Um, I want to talk about a potential framework of restorative and transformative justice practices as a productive way to envision stronger communities without the need for a police force. These practices come from Black and Indigenous communities who do not have the option to call upon the state to respond to violence, as many people have attested to on this call. They've been developed and strengthened by Black women, and these practices at their core are based in strengthening communities and valuing community response instead of police presence. Um, restorative and transformative justice practices seek to address harm without creating more harm. Um, many people have given examples of our police um, inflicting further harm in order to protect us as they claim to do. Um, these are not merely ideas either. These practices have been used across the country to build more just and trusting communities in response to instances of crime and harm. They're used in schools in Chicago as an alternative to punishment and they've been pro proven to reduce continued violence and conflict as these students build community and empathy. Transformative justice in particular seeks to move beyond instances of harm and transform the conditions which allow for the harm to be perpetuated in the first place, specifically through community-based response and strengthening social services. Our social services, such as education systems, our public health sector, and others are severely underfunded institutions in Northampton and are not addressed with the same urgency or care as our police department seems to be addressed in this budget. I understand that this budget also needs to meet the needs of our city as we continue to respond to this pandemic. Um, and noted in a recent Gazette article, uh, these supposed nonviolent arrests or interactions with our police um, that appear to be peaceful in addition to those that have been proven to be violent are um, by nature of occurring more dangerous and violent in the time of this pandemic, um, as it requires people to be in close contact with police who have been shown to not follow um, mask wearing protocol as noted by our health department. And without a doubt, our city is experiencing and will continue to experience hardship in the coming months. But these practices that I've mentioned and that many of the other callers on this call have mentioned, um, they're already in place in other parts of the country, give us a productive framework to build off of. There are ways to strengthen our community to meet our needs and build trust and to follow up to our claim that we can support our Black, Indigenous, people of color, poor and queer citizens. Uh, not only do I call to reject this budget and redistribute these funds to our social services, but I also want Northampton to re-examine how we can best support our community and eventually abolish our police. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Um, thank you for those comments. Next is Sarah W. My name is Sarah Weber. I'm a resident of Ward 1 in Northampton. Um, I'm here to express my disapproval of the budget allocated toward the Northampton Police Department. Um, I've been on the call the entire time, although I joined on a different device um, during, for the comment period. Um, I'd also like to echo what Emily said about how our police chief pointed out that a rise in unemployment correlates to a rise in crime, which necessitates a need for police. Um, I just was in awe of that um, statement, wondering why the response to poor people stealing what they need is criminalized when the root causes is what should be addressed. Um, I really appreciated what um, Councilperson um, Rachel Mayor said about how our community is in a position in that where we have the ability to explore alternatives. Obviously, the responsibilities that the police department takes care of um, are essential, such as um, responding to emergencies but policing as an institution has a racist history and continues to be racist as evidenced by the murders of black men and the incarceration of far more people of color than is proportional to the national US population. There are ways to respond to these emergencies without police. 
Protesters nationwide are calling for police to be abolished, and you've heard tonight from social workers who are eager for change and residents advocating for services like tapestry to be funded more. Defunding police will not happen overnight. There will likely be a transition period, but it has to start somewhere. A town without police is also not the norm, but it will not be the norm until a community makes that change. Um, like other people have said, Northampton is a town that is pr progressive in a lot of ways, and we could be the change that we want to see. Strong, well-resourced communities make police obsolete, and I hope that we can be one of those communities. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Emma Goldman. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, um, this is Ala Sonder in Northampton. I'm just using Emma Goldman's um, Zoom. So um, some people on this call have stated that the Northampton police are not doing their jobs well or, or are not good at their jobs. And I just wanna say that the police here are doing their jobs. The job of the police, structural descendants of slave patrols is to protect whiteness, capitalism and private property. Migrant and incarcerated black and brown labor is the very foundation of that capitalism is built on and will forever be built on. Some of the people that I love and care about the most in Northampton and in this valley are escaping U.S. violence and imperialism in the Northern Triangle of Central America coming to this country and they live every single day of their lives in danger of the police here. How can you have progressive police if their jobs will always be to enforce the border and to enforce deportation? No matter if you have a lesbian police lady, a black policeman or a brown policeman, they are enforcing white supremacist capitalist laws. Do not tell me that a diverse police force is good for my community when I am terrified every day that my sisters and the people that I love the most in this community could be deported by the police. They have done nothing wrong. They enrich our community here. Councilor Maori actually invited the Trans Asylum Seeker Support Network to speak at the Women's March this year because she wanted to create a valley that was safe and inclusive of undocumented trans women of color. And me and Councilor Maori have a personal relationship and she has expressed to me her desire to be radical and she's clearly the most radical council person on this call but I just want to make a call out to her from heart to heart to say if you want to create a valley that is safe for me and my sisters the people I love the most defund the police completely find alternatives to dealing with violence restorative justice and transformative justice and abolish the police thank you thank you for those comments Next, next we have Jake Maginski, perhaps it's all one word. Hi. Hi. My name is Jake Maginski, and I'm a lifelong Western Mass resident. I live in Ward Three. Uh, I'd like to first echo a lot of the things that have been said by fellow community members: Tom, Aza, Cora, Danielle, Mac. Mimi, Dana, Annie, many others. Uh, I've waited the five hours to say clearly uh, to the city councilors, reject this budget and do not increase the uh, funding to the police department by nearly $190,000. Um, I'd also like to echo the notion that this is simply not about finding ways to deliver reform or training. And additionally, while there is an immense amount of justifiable anger and grief over the recent police murders, I would say maybe over 700 people who came and went over the course of the evening tonight um, showed up because there is in fact a sustained movement to divest from policing in Northampton. Um, I'd like to actually just say for the record, I would like to know how many people came and went throughout the, the night um, I think if we all were shown up at the, at the city hall, this would have went very differently. 
So I want that entered into the record. Um, people came and went all throughout the night. It was unclear in the beginning that we had a moment to speak and what, would, what the protocol would be. Uh, I hope that's made clear to the people and the residents and community members who show up tomorrow. Um, all right, so I believe in the power of a police-free future. From my perspective, a world without policing is a world where law is not enforced through the punitive use of force and justice is enacted in a restorative way. If we define policing as part of a social relationship made up of protective practices and interventions that we all agree are for the common good, then I believe there are alternative structures and different groups of professionals that can more effectively deliver those interventions. I do not believe the current model of policing, not only in Northampton, but all around our country, protects us from violence. In fact, I believe it creates more violence on the planet. Additionally, the roots of this policing model we have here in the States, as has been said, is closely linked to the capture of people escaping slavery and the enforcement of a racist, capitalist, violent, and post-colonial structure, which we have a clear responsibility to dismantle, not just acknowledge. <clears throat> what areas are patrolled, who gets arrested, what laws are enforced, and for whom, how, when, and where deadly force is used, and how the institution of policing manifests generally is related to this history. When I say abolish the police, I'm not talking about doing this in one fell That's the three minute mark, so if you could please finish your sentence. I'm talking about a gradual process of reallocating resources and responsibility away from the police, away from the police and uh, towards emergent community-based models of safety, support, intervention, and prevention. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Next is Brian Zayats. Yes, that's correct. Uh, my name is Brian Zayats. I live in Hadley. Um, and first, I just wanted to commend the counselors on your ability to um, just continuously misunderstand the things that your constituents are asking of you. Um, our demand is, is pretty simple. We're asking for a radical defunding of the police. And it seems like that is either being willfully misunderstood or, or, or something. But uh, let me just say, we're not here because we're angry or not just because we're angry. We're here because we're organized. We're not angry, we're bored. We've been here for five hours. We're going to abolish the police and you have the ability to do so now peacefully. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next is Samantha. Oh, there we go, now I'm unmuted. Hi, thanks for all those who have stuck around. Um, I, I wanna echo a lot of things that have been said uh, prior to me. Um, uh, most crucial, I think, uh, is uh, how uh, reprehensible, I think, the uh, response from the council has been. Um, in particular, like, again, I'm, a lot of people have said this, uh, previously, but um, the the idea that this uh, this town I'm sorry I'm I'm from uh, Ward Three in Northampton. Uh, the idea that Northampton sorry, uh, can you give us your full name. I apologize. Uh, yeah, Samantha Riedel. Um, I'm I'm a white trans woman. I'm a journalist. I live in Northampton Ward Three. I have since 2016. Um, it, to believe that this is somehow uh, a, a, an isolated incident because we are uh, feeling very strongly about George Floyd in particular, um, or that this is just coincidentally uh, lines up with COVID-19 and uh, feeling stuck at home. Um, that's insulting. Uh, it's insulting to every single person here. Um, it's insulting to the black people who are dying around this country uh, every single day. Uh, because of the issues that we're trying to bring up here uh, to your attention. Um, the uh, Councilwoman uh, Bolger, 
um, uh, Labarge, sorry, uh, is one of the council members who was at uh, the first council meeting that I went to in 2018, uh, when we were having this conversation about uh, the police department wanting to expand uh, their collection of riot gear uh, and excusing that uh, with the explanation that, oh, well, this is just, uh, it's a routine uh, budget uh, item uh, and we need that so that we can handle meth labs. Um, this is ludicrous. Um, we shouldn't, police are not equipped to, uh, to deal with the systemic uh, problems facing the Valley uh, with regards to drug crime. Um, and you know, I, I wanna bring up a name that hasn't uh, come up in this call. Um, uh, apologies, uh, Douglas Bradford um, in 2018, uh, was allegedly using heroin in Pulaski Park uh, and police officers responded, pulled their weapons on him uh, when he took out a knife and held it to his own throat uh, saying that he had nothing to lose uh, because he had three warrants out on him. Uh, they pulled their guns on him uh, and that was their initial response to, uh, to try and stop a suicidal person. Uh, and they, the way that they got him uh, to surrender was to bring out a 40 millimeter, not less lethal gun. This is not the way that we need to be uh, solving our problems in society. And for all of you to sit here and tell us that we don't know any better and we're coming from a place of emotion, uh, that's insulting to every single person. Uh, and you need to do a lot of soul searching right now. Thank you for your comments. Next is Jamila or Jamila Gore. Hello. Hi. Hi, my name's Jamila Gore. I live in Ward Two. I just want to say that I agree with every single person who spoke before me, especially Emma, who talked about the history of the police and how it's a systematic uh, form of oppression, especially against people of color and people of African descent. Um, I am a person of African descent, and I would like to say that if you are not a person of color, um, I don't think you can speak on whether the police are biased on racial, uh, you know, basis. Uh, I don't really think you have that authority to, to talk about that. You can, um, you know, so the other thing I wanted to say is it was sad to hear Dr. Provost apologizing for asking for a 5% increase in the Your um, funding for for school. Your um, you can't hear me anymore. You were you you were breaking up for a second, but it may have resolved itself. Yeah, I just also wanted to say that um, I am surprised that there's so many people on this call, and I'm glad that people in this community are. I'm sorry, we can't hear you at this moment. We, unfor we unfortunately, we can't hear you. Um, if you can figure out what's wrong with the sound, um, can you can message me? and I'll put you to the front of the queue. But right now we can't hear you at all. Okay. Just let me know if you can come back on and I'll put you to the front, okay? Um, next we have 
Sam. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Sammy Cunningham. I live in Ward 3 in Northampton. Um, I'm calling to provide some testimony to ask the city council to veto this budget and to uh, divest in police services in order to invest in social services, specifically mobile crisis is something that I've seen specifically. Um, my testimony is that I work with the local homeless community and um, I'm specifically, I've heard, uh, I was in a, I was on call for a substance abuse emergency where a Northampton police officer responded. Um, they were very verbally abusive to the homeless person who was experiencing the substance abuse crisis. Um, many police officers were holding this person who had a physical disability very roughly. Um, and it was, I was, thankfully I was involved in the scene. I was able to help deescalate, but it took a half an hour for me to move through what the cops were incredibly unprofessionally pushing to do in order to have this person safely transported someplace that they wanted to go. Um, the police only assisted in escalating the situation and creating a much more unsafe situation. I'm really glad that Mimi Ogden um, talked about CAHOOTS in Eugene, Oregon. It's a mobile crisis service that actually responds to people who are having mental health issues or whatever other assortment of issues and effectively supports them. Um, I think that Northampton could really learn from this. Right now, there's a crisis contract with Community Support Options, CSO. <laughs> this is not a call about CSO, but I want to say the correct crisis services in Northampton and surrounding areas are incredibly ineffective. We could really be moving this money towards a service that supports people in need, including the homeless, including people with mental health issues, including people with substance abuse issues. Um, so once again, I think we should veto this budget increase divest in police and invest in social services, specifically mobile crisis social services. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you for those comments. Um, again, Jamila, if you um, just let me know or have someone else let me know if you can get back on. Um, Daniel Kennedy? Hi, my name is Dan Kennedy. I am a Western Mass native. Um, I've been coming into Northampton for a very long time and I've been a resident of Northampton since early 2019. Um, I just wanna start by giving a sort of personal experience of it. I have a lot of, a lot of options to choose from, but I'll start with the fact that in 2014, when I participated in the Mike Brown protests and March in Northampton, while I was there, I was followed by a police officer with their hand on their weapon for 10 minutes. That's pretty bad. It took my white friends to stand to the right of me in front of that police officer before they left. I didn't start any problems because I didn't want to be shot. <laughs> now, Chief Casper has talked about training and about how great it is and that um, they're evaluating trainings and having more people go to trainings. I think that's really wonderful, except that it doesn't work because I'm still followed by police when I walk through Northampton, the town I live in. When I walk home from work, I get followed through Pulaski Park um, by officers that are standing outside. That can't happen. And if that's supposed to be something that trainings fix, why hasn't it been fixed in the five years that it's been? That's unacceptable. We already know that trainings don't work. So if you're putting money towards trainings, my big question is why? Why? Right? If, that, if we're just talking, I don't assume you're going to defund the police. I would be shocked if that happened. Um, I don't assume that any real change is going to come from this. But I do ask you to think about what you're attaching to your budget increases, where that money is going, and making sure that there are measurable improvements before you approve more, let alone approve the continuation of those funds. I ask all of you to think closely and carefully about what you intend to do, because we will all be watching. I yield the rest of my time. 
Uh, thank you for those comments. Oops. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back and see if we can get Jamil back on. Um, Emily? Yep, she's, she's on speaker. Okay, please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I think we can. Okay, just a couple things more that I wanted to say. Um, especially about um, the budget for Northampton Public Schools. Um, I wanna commend Northampton High School for organizing the march that took place on Monday. Um, I was uh, shocked that they had to protest um, while uh, kind of being in the presence of police in riot gear and also having to uh, deal with tear gas. Uh, that really saddens me. And what also saddened me was the fact that um, Dr. Provost kind of was apologetic about asking for a 5% increase in the budget for Northampton schools. And that's where we need our spending to go right now, to go to schools, to health services, to mental health services, to social services, and to housing. And I think we need to look at the problems that face our community in Northampton. And we need to focus on, you know, issues that are here, like addiction, like domestic violence issues. You know, I live right across the street from where the murder uh, suicide was last winter. And those are the issues of our community. And those are issues that cannot be solved by by bringing in police that often escalate uh, issues like that. Um, so I want to, to say that I'm really glad to see so many people on this call. And it is from years of being organized against these kind of things that happen in our community. This is not an overnight issue for most of the people on this call, I don't think. And um, I appreciate you letting me speak. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Thank you. Thank you for sticking with us and making it work so we could hear your comment. We appreciate it. Uh, and thank you, Emily, for your assist on that. Um, OK. Back to the list, we have Molly Smith. Hi there. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Molly. Um, <clears throat> I'm Molly Smith. Um, I'm a resident of Northampton. Um, I've lived here for about the two to three years. Um, and um, I, I wanted to echo what everyone else has said. I think that everybody ha is bringing really great points and I'm like very encouraged to see so many of my fellow community members um, and people that I know from my job. Um, and a lot of my own friends here testifying. Um, I, um, as a white person, don't feel as though I have anything additional to add as how to protect black people um, and other people of color, but I do feel as a disabled person that I can say that our city is not meeting the needs of disabled people and we can redirect funds that way. Um, when I had surgery, I tried to go outside during COVID and tripped on the sidewalk because all the sidewalks are uneven. And I know that we have a disability um, commission now, but I have yet to hear a comprehensive plan of how we're addressing um, all of the issues that um, folks with mobility issues face when they go out on our sidewalk. Um, and the fact that there is not a comprehensive plan to make sure that snow is plowed and all of that, and that affects all of us. Um, so I think all of these points brought forth and all of these other emergency services and stuff that we need money funneled into, I don't understand why we're not, why we're talking about increasing a police budget when we know um, police to be rather violent, racist, um, homophobic, transphobic, um, when we could be investing that in both infrastructure and helping our community um, to grow during this time. Um, I yield my time, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next is Erica Roper. 
Hi, uh, I'm, my name is Erica Roper. I am a resident of Somerville, but I lived in Northampton for uh, more than 10 years. Um, I'm a victim of brutality by the Northampton police. Um, I was held down and handcuffed naked when they came to my home for a well-being check. Um, and I just want to uh, show up here at this meeting from the voice of, of, of folks who've been through this. Um, I know that the only question that's really on the table at this meeting today is the proposed budget, and I do not support this increase. Um, I wanna thank the people that have shown up here, and I hope that there is an opportunity for a true negotiation that involves the public, not just a hearing. And I'd like to see something from the, the city that makes us feel more like you're actually hearing us. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, next is Patrick Wait. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Patrick Wait. I am from Ward 1 in Northampton. Um, I first would like to point, uh, like reiterate the point I do feel as though it's incredibly inappropriate for many of our elected officials, our mayor, our police chief, to not be here since we've sat through the, the presentation on the budget to hear what the residents of Northampton are saying collectively and pretty much unanimously at this point in time, we are calling for our councilmen and women to reject this proposed increase, to divest monetary spending on the police department. And the issue for me on a personal level, because I am painfully white, I cannot understand and I cannot speak to the tragedies that are going on. For me, as someone who has a beautiful black partner, I am terrified of what the police can do. I am terrified and it shakes me to my core. So for all, any person in the audience, in this collective, in my community, I just want you to know your voice has power. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, I just want to note that actually Mayor Narkowitz is on in this meeting and has been the entire time. Um, next is Ian Busher. Um, sorry, uh, Ian, I'm going to unmute you in a second. Um, Mayor Narkowitz is in the meeting, as I said, um, and uh, Chief Casper is is watching the meeting, um, so is also listening to everything that's being said. Ian, there you go. Hello, um, my name is Ian Busher. I'm a resident of Deerfield and don't you dare pass this budget. I think the counselors might think that police abolition is just a passing fad among young people. Well, it's a motivating force behind the biggest uprising in this country since 1968. So you should really ask yourself whether it's really so hard for you to read a book about restorative practices and take it seriously, just in the context of what's going on. Um, basically, it's time for you to pick a side. I know the whole subtext of your conversation um, with the police chief is this lie that you tell yourselves that Northampton is special, that it's different, that bad things don't happen here. I'm appalled that you'd maintain this near days after children were maced. Increased, uh, and I, I'd like to get to this point about unemployment um, because the police chief believes that unemployment justifies police repression. Um, and I think that's nonsense. Increased unemployment doesn't lead to increased crime. That's not what's really going on here. It leads to increased missed rent payments. This is all about stopping people. Increased unemployment means people can't pay rent. The chief doesn't want more cops to stop crime. 
she wants more cops to evict Northampton families from their homes. Um, so if we wanna like survive this crisis, what we need to do is stop paying cops to harass families, to harass people who are poor, to harass people who are black, to, to, to harass people who are marginalized. Um, so at the very least, don't increase the budget for the police. Thank you for those comments. Next we have Irene. Um, my name is Irene Cho and I live in Amherst. And I think um, Emma already like talked about this, but I want to really acknowledge the historical context of how the police and the whole criminal justice system in this country is um, founded on anti-Black racism and how the police, the origins of the police comes from slave patrols and um, how after the 13th Amendment, um, it transformed into like this racist criminal justice system that still oppresses and brutalizes Black people today. And um, this is an institution that's anti-Black to its core. And also I want to like address this good cop, bad cop narrative that we've heard from kind of like as this, oh, this is a progressive police force. But um, to like try and like separate good cops from bad cops is just trying to like obscure the is issue because these they all they all choose to take part in state in state sanctions sanctioned violence and this is an institution that is racist and um they all choose to take part in a criminal justice system that's built on institutionalized racism and um. I like ask Noho to defund the police. Um, yeah, I yield my time. Thank you for those comments. Next is Jenny. Hi, uh, my name is Jenny Landon. I live in Ward 3, Northampton. Um, I just want to first thank everybody who shared their experiences of police brutality at the hands of the Northampton Police Department. Um, I thought that was incredibly brave. So thank you for that. Um, I also just wanna make the point that um, Chief Casper is probably gonna make the case that this budget increase is inevitable due to contractual obligations from the union. Um, two years ago, it was like so necessary to get this big increase for budget gear. And every single year there's going to be an excuse. Um, and I think at a certain point, we all just have to make a decision of where we draw the line. Um, and this is a great moment to do that. Um, and so like so many other departments, they could just have no new hires, no new vehicles, even if they're hybrid vehicles, um, and slash the budget for riot gear, chemical weapons, um, or even better, like sell back the riot gear that they bought two years ago that we didn't need in the first place. So thank you. Thank you for those comments. Next is Maddie Hammer. Hello, my name is Maddie Hammer. I'm a resident of Northampton Ward 4. Um, I cannot think of a more blatantly insulting and inappropriate time to be increasing police department funding than during a worldwide period of protests by a massive number of people calling for widespread police defunding and reforming after another in a series of countless murders of unarmed black people at the hands of racist and violent, violent police. It is clear that every council member on this call has learned nothing. I would like to call attention to every council member who refused to push against Chief Casper's deflection and inflammatory defense of the need to fund the police department in spite of the massive uprising revolution that is happening in every state in the country right now and around the world, which you should be paying attention to and you should be learning from. You are all cowards. You are all pushovers. You are all traitors to the people you serve especially Chief Casper, who I'm assured is listening to this call on the live stream. And if she is, I hope she can't sleep tonight after hearing, I am sure, not for the first time, the disgusting behaviors of the officers whose salaries she protects against Northampton residents. This is shameful. The Northampton Police Department are no different from any other police department. They disproportionately protect the, the rich, white people, while over-policing black and brown people every day. You have heard testimony on this call about experiences from people who live here, who have had experiences with the Northampton police. You should understand now 
that this is not an isolated problem. It is a widespread white supremacist organization of violent police. If you are disgusted by the racist violence of police officers in Minneapolis or Louisville or New York City or Los Angeles or Ferguson, you should be vigilantly critical of the complicity of the same system in our city because they are the exact same thing. These are gangs of lethally armed, legally unaccountable, inherently racist and violent police who are just following orders and they have completely outlived their usefulness. There is this mind boggling paranoia that police and police sympathizers have that so many of the roles police play in our community and society can't be replaced by people who aren't police and that is bullshit. There's this widespread belief that if we take officers off the street, if we take away their guns, if we defund the police, things would devolve into chaos. And I want you to know that if you hold that belief, you are a bigot, you are a racist, you are a classist, and you don't believe in the power of an organized community. What you believe in is instilling the fear of death or incarceration into the hearts of innocent people uh, by the hands of police. And that is something that you should be deeply ashamed of. Healthcare professionals and community leaders, public health workers, people who don't carry weapons, who don't have the right to arrest, brutalize, or kill black people, who are trained who they are trained to think are inherently suspicious, these people are much more better served to serve the community. The job attracts a certain type of person and if you give a certain type of person a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. I urge the council to vehemently denounce the mayor's budget proposal. History will not be kind to you if you do not take seriously the importance of abolishing the police now. Trust your community, trust your community members and never trust the police, I yield my time. Uh, thank you, that was the buzzer. Thank you for your comment. Um, our co is next. Hey, um, my name is Rachel Co. I live in Ward 3 in Northampton. Um, I was born and raised in the Valley, have lived here pretty much my whole life, and I'm now a professor at Smith College. Um, I'm commenting to urge the city council to make it Mayor Narkowitz to make a plan starting this year to systematically decrease and ultimately eliminate funding for the police in the city of Northampton. Um, it's not enough to refuse the $190,000 increase in the budget, and it's not enough to do a one-time decrease of funding. We need a multi-year plan that culminates in the complete defunding of the police, and the faster we can do that, the fewer people will be brutalized and murdered along the way. I wanna to talk too about why so-called progressive policing doesn't work. Um, I am not a black person or an expert, expert on policing. So I'm gonna use the remainder of my allotted time to read a short excerpt written by two people who are. This is from a recent op-ed titled No More Money for the Police by Philip McCarris and Tenjiwe McCarris. Quote, um, more training, or diversity among police officers won't end police brutality, nor will firing and charging individual officers. Look at the Minneapolis Police Department, which is held up as a model, as is Northampton, I might add, of progressive police reform. The department offers procedural justice as well as trainings for implicit bias, mindfulness, and de-escalation. It embraces community policing and officer diversity, bans warrior style policing, uses body cameras, implemented an early intervention system to identify problematic officers, receives training around mental health crisis intervention and practices so-called reconciliation efforts in communities of color. George Floyd was still murdered. The focus on training diversity and technology like body cameras shifts the focus away from the root cause of police violence, as many others here have alluded to, and instead gives the police more power and more resources. The solution to ending police violence and cultivating a safer country lies in reducing power of the police by reinvesting the money spent on policing in alternative emergency response programs. Community organizers, rather than police officers, can help manage the responses to the pandemic. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you for your comments. Um, next, we have the, it's the number ending in 2755. So someone calling in on the phone. Ending 2755. Uh, hello. Hi, how are you? Gotcha. We can Hi, hear you. Um, you can hear me? Yes. Oh, hello. My name is uh, Joe Migan from Ward three in Northampton. Um, 
the history of police brutality, protecting property over lives, taking black and brown lives, um, abolish prison industrial complex, abolish ICE, defund the police, um, community-based practices are proven to work, peer support systems for mental health issues, funds to community support such as Borough Food Northampton, the Survival Center, AFIA, Recovery Communities. Um, I um, hope that you were able to decrease and eventually defund uh, the Northampton Police Department. Um, I echo and agree with everything that everyone has said before. Uh, thank you so much for people sharing your powerful statements. Um, I yield my time to people, other people to get everyone else in, uh, but thank you so much. Thank you for calling. Okay, next we have C. Kuhn, PhD. Hello, yes. Um, I am a resident of Ward 6. I'm, my name is Claire Kuhn. I'm a licensed uh, psychologist at the doctoral level. Um, I work as a public employee in the field of human services. Um, the thing that shocked me, um, even in learning more here, is that uh, there was training that was done in Israel. I, I never in my mind would I request such an expensive training knowing that it would result in less money for other services. Um, I, it's, it's selfish um, and I feel like it was an irresponsible decision, whoever made that decision to allow that to be, um, that money to be at, at such an egregious expense. Uh, moreover, there is evidence that exposure to violence and violent technology that that training actually increases the likelihood that it will be used. Um, if there was to be any training, um, I would think that you know they would want to learn from a country like South Korea, where there's practically no crime at all. Um, the police, most of them, don't even wear guns, even in Seoul. Um, so the the idea of going to where you have probably the most violent police um, in the Western civilization it is, is amazing to me. Um, uh, and then past that, um, you know, if you want to use money towards um, decreasing problems, why not develop something like the community crisis response team that BHN Crisis has developed in, in their area? Um, and. Uh, look at ways to include crisis clinicians right on the spot. You know, they have access to the radio so that they can join in on, on crisis calls as need be. Um, and this is also something that overall the sheer number of people that are on this meeting, and as I am a voting resident that has a significant in income, I can tell you, I, I'm looking at moving if this is where the country and the city is going, because it's just, it's absolutely crazy to me um, that we would want to consider ourselves as an advanced civilization when there's this level of violence and that there is, that, that there is training that is being used for increasing that, that's absolutely, it's an oxymoron. It really is. And so I, I hope the elected officials take note of this because I will be voting. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your comments. Um, Emily, oop, hold on. Sorry. Emily uh, Hunderwaddle. Emily Hunderwaddle, uh, Northampton resident. I don't want to take up space. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I don't want to take up space, but I do so again, even though I already spoke to point out that I have never 
been in my life to a city council budget hearing. I have never been to one. I don't strongly vote for, for local leaders, but now I am activated. So if this response to this meeting doesn't shake you to your core as an elected official, I don't know what will. But I also wanna point out just another logical fallacy of the chief statement, because um, I'm sure you've raised the budget before for the police department. So I'm sure part of that argument, since we're such a progressive part of the country, had to be increased training and bias. So you invested in increased training and bias, but then when you ask the chief what the evaluation was for that training, the answer was basically, I don't know, or like, it's how we feel about it. There was no like, actual protocol for how that's being evaluated and nothing was spoken to as to who is choosing what meeting or what training is happening there was no formal protocol for all of that so you as like even just business people invest like investing in this institution you've made a bad investment so you should defund them now. You shouldn't reinvest in a service that has done poorly for you. And also I was at the protest Monday and beyond just the macing of teenagers, which I also witnessed, the cops made fun of POCs who were like saying things to them about their experience. It was beyond just the physical violence of it. It was to like emotional abuse and a cop tried to apologize and say that he would intervene. But all of these are post the fact. None of this is preventative. And you as councilman, you should be sh like just shaken to your core by the response to this meeting. I yield my time. Thank you for your comment. Um, okay, next is Jake Wise. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. I am Jake Wise. I'm in Ward 1 of Northampton. Um, I pro probably properly moved to Northampton about a year and a half ago. And I what Molly Smith said earlier, kind of like I was going to open with this anyway. But ha has anybody, uh, it's a rhetorical question, I guess, since no one can answer. Has anybody driven up and down King Street at like 3 AM and like counted the number of, of cop cruisers? Well, I have, and they're just sitting there and they're driving up and down. I'm like the only person driving past. And then in the middle of the winter, I go walking and the sidewalks are icy. I'm 35, able-bodied. And I'm thinking, where are this town's priorities? I'm not from Massachusetts, um, but I've also, I've never lived in a place that was so self-congratulatory about how enlightened it is. Um, so I just, I just want to like emphasize that and say, like suggest humbly or not humbly, I don't know how humble I am or not, but that it might be blinding some of you to like what, what's going on and where you sit. Um, I also have an experience from a friend who, he's a white guy, I won't disclose the distinguishing characteristic of him that he thinks is a minority that caused it because he's still probably afraid of it. He was chased down and beaten by police several years ago in Northampton because he was having a mental breakdown um, and he still won't come back. He's afraid to set foot in Northampton or drive through Northampton. Um, I agree with, um, I think there should be models from Eugene, um, Oregon used here that should be looked at. I. I understand that the union contracts don't allow actually the budget to be decreased with the current level of staffing of the police department. So I think that means that you all ought to look at like the amount of the number of people hired by the police department. I think that's the next, next logical thing to look at. Um, and I wanna see a more systemic conversation. And also I'm Jewish, I'm white, um, growing up, the role of police that I saw was they were they were guarding the synagogue as people were going to and from and they were not guarding from people of color they were guarding from like skinheads you know but I want to say even then like I I want to just name that there's a kind of like 
um, deep sort of dissonance in there for me and say that even so, like with the institution of police being so geared towards, um, you know, coming out of the, like the keeping down of slaves and stuff, I still think there has to be an alternate solution even to that. Um, and uh, finally, for the council member named, uh, oh shoot, she went away. Uh, oh, Marianne. Uh, express surprise at how this could be happening. I want to let you know that I'll email you. I'm happy to talk as much as you need and there are plenty of resources that can be read and that, that I'm, I'm happy to talk to you. And so I'll, I'll, I'll be emailing you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Mary Alice Jester. Hi. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Mary Alice Jester. Um, I live in East Hampton, but I went through public schooling in Northampton. My family lives and votes in Northampton. Um, I just wanted to start out with, uh, I personally, uh, along with probably the rest of the 500 people that showed up tonight, do not believe that progressive policing works. Um, I also wanted to bring up the fact that the people that are receiving these raises um, are people like Captain uh, Robert Powers, who at the uh, protest on Monday um, said, and I quote, one bad hamburger at McDonald's does not make McDonald's bad. Um, and this was in relation to um, the murder of black people. So I just would like to bring up that I do not think that police are capable of being sensitive about this, these issues. Um, I also wanted to bring up that uh, Officer Casper was not specific when it came to funding for the Northampton police when it came to COVID. And we do know the things that the budget are being used for are, are two things, raises and hybrid cars. Um, and I think that's just completely inappropriate for what's happening in our current time. That's all I have to say, I yield my time. Thank you. Next is, it just says DL. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanna say how proud I am of everyone here and everyone who's spoken before me and I won't, I don't need to repeat um, anything that's been said. I just wanna say that I support it and, and stand behind that. And uh, I want y'all to defund the police. I want you to not increase the budget. Um, I live in East Hampton, but was a resident in Northampton up until this last year um, for multiple years. And I also worked downtown at the Green Bean and um, had an experience where I was working and helping people get sat and the police um, pulled up multiple cruisers um, and jumped out, immediately pulled out their guns in the face of a houseless man who had a fucking cat with him and was holding a sign because they thought he robbed the bank down the street. Um, I guess they, you know, used their detective skills to, to really figure out uh, that that must have been the man that robbed the bank. Um, and so uh, I just want to say that um, they're a joke and you need to defund them. And I don't need to be all fancy about the words I use. If the, if whatever, um, I'm sorry, what is her name? Um, if Jody Casper is listening, I just want you to know that your staff, your team, your, your fraternity of policemen are fucking jokes and they deserve to be defunded. Thank you, I will pass. I'm gonna need to ask you to please state your name. Sorry, I'm gonna unmute you again. Hold on, here you go. DL Grant, thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Matthew Grimaldi. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Great, I'm Matthew Grimaldi. I'm from Ward 6. And I wanna talk about how progressive policing is a paradox. Cool, let's begin. So let's consider what progressive means. Progressive means that there's a future in some capacity to this organization. If the future of the police is not the eventual abolition of the police because they've solved the problems for which the police are necessitated, it means that they are either A, at best ignoring those problems or at worst, deliberately perpetuating those problems. So the only logical conclusion to that is that we need to abolish them before they 
don't abolish themselves. Now, what are some things that we can do with the money that we use to defund the police? We can, we can put in stopgap measures, right? We can establish civilian review boards in the meantime. I have an article from 2001 written by the Department of Justice that states that with the $200,000 that we have, we could have a very effective civilian review board. It would do great with even less money than that. So I can send along that link for you. Also, I would like to use that money instead to hire mental health professionals and addiction experts in place of cops who are asked to do the work that they are not adequately trained to do. And finally, I would like to ask that the council members make the decision right now to defund the police, take the first step to defund the police and make sure that we never have to deal with this shit again. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I'm gonna remind people to please not use profanity. Um, next is Amanda Hecht. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, so my problem with um, policing in general is um, I've noticed that it sort of comes from a platform that they seem to demand respect rather than asking for it. Now, um, I'm an educator. I work in a classroom. I've noticed that teachers who demand respect from their children don't build a good community. Um, teachers who give respect first um, to their students and their classroom community can forge that strong and powerful community. Um, I, I definitely agree with what other people have said that we need to work on solving systemic problems of um, poverty and um, mental health that's not done with a gun. Like I've been hit by my kids and then they're crying because they're sad that they hit me. I don't punish them. I tell them that was wrong and I deescalate the situation. You don't deescalate a situation with a weapon. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, but, and thank you again for um, everyone's time and comments. I yield the rest of my time. Uh, thank you. Before you mute, um, I'm going to have to you and I, get your name in. Sorry. sorry. Did you say it? I'm sorry, I missed it because I was talking. Uh, I live in Florence. Thank you. Appreciate it. No problem. Um, next, we have Ezekiel Baskin. Hi. Yes. Um, I, Ezekiel Baskin, Ward 2, Northampton. I agree with pretty much everything that everyone has said. And I just want to talk about the idea that this is being, that the budget hearing is not somehow the appropriate place for this. I think that this is the time in the year that the city council has the most power to do its job. This approval or veto of the budget is in some ways the most important task that's laid out for you as city councilors. And I think that it's vital that you veto tomorrow so that there can be time in the next two weeks before the second hearing of the budget to redraft, to make something new. We're not at the deadline for the fiscal year yet. We have time to work on something else. And the only way that that time will really be useful is by vetoing some or all of the budget tomorrow so that space can be made to craft something new. And I think this is the, this is the place where US city councilors have power, have voice, and can use it to help make real change. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Lachlan's phone. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. We can. Okay, awesome. Um, my name is Lachlan Thompson. I live in Ward 5. I am a trauma educator, a peer support specialist, and a survivor of police violence. I'm calling on you to defund the Northampton Police Department. I'd like to take the time to note the enormity of time survivors of police violence have spoken out today. If that hasn't shaken you to your core, I do not know what will. And if that has not felt traumatic, I don't know what would. It should not take people disclosing their trauma for this government to act. It shouldn't take people of color disclosing their trauma to act. 
how would it feel to live under the terror of white supremacy every day of your life? We probably cannot fathom that. Numerous studies have shown that those wit that witness and live in proximity to police violence score extremely high on PTSD disclosure tests, upwards of plus four and plus six. How can we justify the traumatization of our community? How can we continue to justify the targeting of black, brown, and indigenous people as we know, and we should not need studies to know this, that police do target them? We can't, especially when alternatives exist. We know that restorative justice works. We know that transformative justice works. We also have organizations in our community, both in Northampton, East Hampton, Amherst, and the surrounding Pioneer Valley that do the brunt of the work to set up those systems. We have support networks like Tapestry. We have Survivor Arts Collective. We know that this is possible. We just need to be courageous enough to defund the police and redirect those funds towards social work. And in fact, if the Northampton PD is so aggrieved by need to fill the cracks of social work, isn't the response to fund social work? Isn't the response to fund our community? It has to be. So please, please do what is right and be courageous and stand to protect black, brown, and indigenous lives right now, and not just black, brown, and indigenous lives, but our entire community. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next is uh, Rowan Crocker. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Rowan Crocker. I live in Northampton. I agree with the comments so far, and I do not want the proposed budget for the police department approved. I urge you to defund the Northampton Police Department and reallocate those funds to social services and alternatives to policing. Um, that's all I have to say right now. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you so much. Uh, next is, it just says GGG. Hi, my name is Laura Howard. I want to echo, um, and I'm a resident of Amherst, sorry. I want to echo previous requests for the establishment of a citizen review board to defund the Northampton Police Department and to make that decision tomorrow, um, echoing Ezekiel so that you have time to redraft. Um, I would also like to highlight that with these demands, um, the Minneapolis City Council called for or had discussions for abolishing their police department in 2019. Um, they were not successful. This, the certain city council members that um, had led those discussions, um, and I demand you to join them in their continued um, interest in defunding their police department. And I demand that you be bold and brave and recognize that all of your constituents are watching you. I save the rest of my time. Thank you for those comments. Next is DW. DW? Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes, it sounds like you might be breaking up a little, but try. Uh, well, I'll try to speak slowly and clearly then. Uh, my full name is David Stern. I live out in the hill towns, but I work in North, so I have a vested interest in the policing of that community as I live there, or as I work there, rather. Uh, my own police experience uh, with the police response came when I was about 17 years old, and two cars full of drunk high drivers tried to run me off the road to kill me. And when all three of her cars ended up crashing as a result, the police officer who responded tried to charge me with reckless endangerment of the vehicle and put points on my license and said, gee, why didn't you call nine one someone from running me off the road who was attempting to rear in my car? So police uh, have never, in my experience, helped de-escalate a situation or make problems better or go away. Uh, they seem to uh, meddle. 
So that's been my experience. Uh, and I had a proposal I wanted to make based on some of the commentary for other people state. Uh, they're saying, gosh, they need this raise uh, in the budget so they can give their officers a promised raise. Well, you know, gosh, I wouldn't want to deprive these guys of their raise. So go ahead, give them the raise. And with the resulting budgetary shortfall, just do less policing work and then you've already started phasing out the police so what you do is you take the budget that you have set aside for training endlessly while getting away with it or other ways instead train them to do a different job train them to be do whatever it is that the community needs to be done and that way as you go through this phase out plan you have a police force that is no longer policing has been trained to do something non-violent and productive for the community and you don't have to worry about the uh, budgetary shortfall because it's all part of the phase out people still get paid nobody has to worry about where their next meal is coming from the community saves money saves lives saves harassment it's win 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 furthermore I'd like to end by just pointing out the Los Angeles City Council just proposed legislation to reduce funding for the Los Angeles Police Department by 100 million dollars and to transfer that balance to social services for the community so are we going to be on the right side of history as a progressive community in Western Massachusetts or are we going to be on the wrong side I yield the remainder of my time if there's any left thank you thank you um next whoops let me stop this before it goes off uh next is amy francis um yep yeah. hi can, am i on yes you are hi um my name is jesse hassinger um i'm with my wife amy francis who's going to speak momentarily after hi. i i Here read my thing um, as downtown business owners and Ward 4 residents, I would like to echo some of the points brought up by Councillor Rachel Mayor and residents Tom Gregg, Mimi Rogers, Matt Godinez, Elisa Klein, Esther Dog Valois, Franny Choi, Sarah W. Arco, Jake Majinski, Amanda Hecht, Ezekiel Baskin, Lachlan D.W., and others have previously said. There are far more better ways to support our communities, especially those underserved among us. Transferring Northampton police funds to other organizations and creating new and better groups to help these individuals needs to happen this fiscal year. Despite some of the name calling done tonight, we hope that the true call for refusing the budget increase to the NPD will come through. You have heard from so many of us tonight and there are hundreds more behind us who are not voicing an opinion at this moment. Thank you for listening to us tonight. We will be back tomorrow to witness what we hope will be a refusal of the Northampton Police Department budget. Um, and I'm just gonna chime in, Amy Francis, uh, business owner, Ward 4 resident. Um, I'm echoing everything that Jesse Hessinger just said. And I wanna thank all of our council people for being on this call until 11.20 PM this evening and however much longer it goes along with tomorrow as well. Thank you for your service. Thank you both for joining us. Um, next is Dana Osterling. Hi, uh, Dana Osterling, Ward 2. I live in Northampton. And I, I agree with and stand in solidarity with all the statements that people have made before me. Uh, I also joined this call to voice my strong opinion that the budget proposal should be shut down as per the $200,000 suggested increase to the police budget. Uh, my recommendation and hope as a resident is that that money could be spent elsewhere and reallocated for social services. I'm also a state employee. Um, I work in healthcare and provide services for many members of this community. And especially in such a difficult time in a pandemic, and as others have stated, this is a historical uprising. I think that our community can be a model for how 
to move forward in a progressive way. We have resources. We have so many people who spoke tonight, including council members who deeply care about the community and want to make it better. And the way to do that, as so many others have stated strongly, is not through more policing. So thank you, council members, and thank you, everyone who has spoken so far tonight. Thank uh, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you for your comments. Next, we have Bo Clark. Uh, hi, my name is Bo Clark, and I live in Hadley. Um, I'm a lifetime Valley resident, a Cooley baby, a Northampton High School alum, and I've lived in Northampton for the majority of my life. Um, I want to start by saying that I agree with everyone who has spoken before me, and I urge the council to reject the police budget increase, defund the police, and divert the funds to departments that actually help the community and keep it safe. Um, living here, growing up here, Northampton has always been toted as progressive while being extremely segregated and despite ample racism and racial profiling. We have seen the attitudes of many council members that truly believe Northampton to be so progressive and of the chief of police, Jody Casper, that the Northampton Police Force participates in progressive policing despite well-documented incidences of excessive force that have been mentioned tonight and the pepper spraying of a minor at this week's weekend's protest. These have happened under Casper's so-called progressive policing. Um, the NPD posted a 13-point plan on Facebook on Monday about how they are not like the bad and racist police forces defending themselves, preparing for a public outcry, and then proceeded to pepper spray a minor at the protest over the weekend. These have happened under the guise of progressive policing, and we're telling you as your community and constituents, it's not good enough. Uh, LA City Council just today proposed a motion to slash police budget in response to their people's wishes. Uh, Minneapolis is cutting its school contract with the police. Other cities are taking action. If Northampton is truly progressive, let us lead the way in defunding the police and coming up with creative alternative solutions to community safety, many of which have been suggested to the council. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next, we have Hannah Mohan. Hey, oh, hey, everybody that has spoken before me. I would also like to just echo what everyone has said. And um, I'd really like to not give the police more money. I really don't see why that's necessary at all during a pandemic and uh, a historic uprising. Like people have said, like this is seriously ridiculous. There's no reason to increase the budget. Please don't, please don't do it. And please, if you could divest even more money from them into social services. That's all I have to say. Uh, before you meet, sorry, could you, um, I don't think that you stated your name and your city or town, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My name's Hannah Mohan. I'm from Ward 7A. I've lived really all over the Valley and all over Northampton my whole life. I'm a Cooley baby as well. So I vote in 7A, please do what I want. Thank, thank you for your comment. Uh, next. We have today uh, Martin Gonzalez. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm today. I'm also a Northampton resident, um, Ward 6B. Um, so I agree with everything that has been said before me and thank those who have spoken out uh, about their trauma at the hands of police. As a white, abled person, I've been fortunate not to deal with police violence but I can certainly speak to my experience as a student and my outrage that funds from our schools are going to an inherently racist and harmful institution. Like many of my fellow students, this isn't the first time we have stood here pleading for desperate change. Almost exactly a year ago, we came out to testify about why our schools needed to be funded. We were told that as a city, we were up to our necks, that there was simply no way we could fund the schools without the override and how, even if that was passed, there would still be ongoing difficulties. And now here we are again with the override passed and our schools still struggling. Well, some of the override money goes to the $200,000 increase in police budget. As compared to the budget last year, our schools are facing down what is to be a historic year. Huge numbers of classes cut. Students only able to take a fraction of the normal math classes. Staggered schedules. In addition to being a graduating Northampton High School student, I also sit on the Department of Education's Return to School work group. I am one of two student reps, but one of a 60-member committee with five police chiefs. I am frankly worried that the department will leave the districts to pick up so much slack when it comes to facilitating school-wide safety and security and quality of education, especially for the most vulnerable members of our district. 
demographics that are hardest hit by the coronavirus are also those we supported by our schools and already are most at risk of dropping out. Let us look at his example. For example, AP courses enable many students to actually afford college. But this year, the school sent out an email asking students to take advanced classes at a community college where only one class would be paid for per student because of budget issues. For many students, they may need to take more than one to remain on the same AP track they plan for in order to make college affordable, but the school will likely be putting them in a situation where they cannot pay for said classes. I'm not going to skirt around the bush. The police need to be fully defunded, but let's consider what we can do with a fraction of the 200,000. Instead of spending the money on new hybrid cars, let us leave let us as a city lead the way by investing in new text textbooks so we can facilitate a more inclusive curriculum. Let us pay for increased mental health services within the high school. Let us pay for calculators and other technology that our ELL program does not currently have access to. There are so many little things that our school simply does not have the money for and we are told time and time again that we just won't have access to. Um, so I just really, I stand with everyone um, and really calling for the defunding of the police because at the end of the day, it's um, our education system and other social services that will prevent uh, the root causes of these crimes instead of violently dealing with the symptoms. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Elliot. Uh, hi, thank you. My name is Elliot Oberholzer. I live in East Hampton, but I work in Northampton. Um, I first, um, I want to say uh, to Councilman Thorpe, um, I just want to acknowledge that there's been a lot of people, many of us white, yelling at you about how you don't understand white supremacy, and that's weird and messy, um, and I'm really sorry about that, because um, that's, that's not great. Um, and the, but the, the main thing that I wanted to say is that in my time in East Hampton, I have seen a lot of our or Northampton, a lot of our Northampton business owners using the police to enforce um, who they don't want in and in the vicinity of their stores. Um, and the houseless people um, who uh, spend time in Northampton are just as important a part of that community as the business owners. And there's never going to be an equitable relationship and there's never going to be an effective conversation about what public space is in Northampton and who gets to use public space and what we want our public space to be, as long as the police continue to be used to enforce a really violent, unequal relationship in that way. And so I think um, it, when we talk about defunding the police, probably a lot of the pushback that you're going to see is going to come from some business owners. And I just wanna really hold that up to the light and say that it's, it's not going to be easy, but it's still worth doing even in that respect as well. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. Um... Next is Rafaela. Hi. Hi. Can me? Okay. Uh, Rafaela Wade. I um, I live in Florence. I think we're there. Okay. Um, I don't want to take up too much space. I just wanted to offer the small piece of information that I have that hasn't been mentioned yet. Um, I know from a former colleague in the Northampton Public Defender's Office that they are not receiving raises this year and are still awaiting news about possible layoffs. Um, they're funded by the state, so I understand that that's a completely different pot of money and that's not the issue that I'm raising. I just think that it seems tone deaf and inappropriate to discuss raises as obvious and inevitable during this crisis when the arm of the justice system here that has a huge positive impact on the marginalized people in our community is sitting in uncertainty with the rest of us. And I wanna voice my support for the people had it that have been brave and voice really traumatic stories and um, well-researched points of view. Um, and that's all I yield my time. Thank you. Um, next is Ali Mizels. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Ali Mizels. I'm a resident of Enfields, Connecticut, and a student at Mount Holyoke College. Thank you to everyone who has shared their comments and stories. As a five college student, I would like to speak to my experience as a college student in the Valley. I believe that restorative justice combined with the use of specialized unarmed community members is a far safer alternative to policing, especially on college campuses, and especially in cases involving mental health. 
It is imperative to me that the Northampton Police Department is defunded. A police-free future is possible, and we in the Pioneer Valley and Five College community are more than ready for it. Please, please vote tomorrow to reject the proposed budget. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a. Taylor? Yes, good evening. My name is Ace Taylor, Ward 3, Northampton. Uh, I would like to echo the majority of what has been said tonight. I would like to thank the council members for their patience and hope that they understand that a lot of people are speaking from a great deal of emotion and that any invective against them can be filtered out to listen to the things that are being said underneath. Finally, I would like to point out a particular line item within the budget that has not yet been brought up, namely the chief of police's yearly income, which is $150,278. This is more than the mayor makes. In fact, the chief of police, the captains and the lieutenants all make more than the mayor of Northampton. If the chief of police is very worried about balancing the budget, then I would encourage her to take a pay cut of her own to prioritize the trainings that she claims to so strongly support. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That, um, so that's, those are the last people whose hands are raised. Oh, one more. Um, Jake Wise. I, I spoke already, but I oh, couldn't. I'm sorry, Jake. Then I'm going to have to see if there's somebody else um, sure. that, that sure. hasn't spoken. I apologize. Thank you. Um, OK. Flannery Weiss. Hi. Um, I'm actually using Flannery Weiss's device right now. My name is Rene Cruz. Um, Rene, if you can't roll your R's. Uh, I'm a queer, non-binary Afro-Dominican uh, who moved out to Amherst uh, and have been, or I'm currently living in Amherst, uh, have been living in the area for almost a decade. I escaped New York City uh, where I faced re regular persecution from police forces, which has unfortunately been brought back um, through my recent experiences in this area. I've pursued my undergraduate and graduate degrees. I've done everything that, uh, you know, uh, Western society has told me to do uh, to make sure I could uh, not only survive, but thrive in this society. And I've moved to an area that was quote unquote, a utopia, a safe haven for people like me. As I now look to continue my career professionally, look into buying homes, I've been looking into Northampton as a place that I've always uh, admired uh, in many ways because of the voices that are there. I want these voices to, to impact change. Um, as I said, my trauma has been brought back through my own experiences with Northampton police being pulled over last summer, um, wrongfully so, I might add, um, and through trials and through trauma that was proven. Um, I don't think that these police need to get increased funded. Um, I think that we're hearing emotional stories that back it up, we're hearing personal stories, but we're also hearing uh, the data, the larger research, um, everything combining to say that this is not what we need. Um, and even that, a surprising, beautiful number from Los Angeles, that's only the first step in showing that we can also um, be progressive. We can also, you know, defund our police. It is a realistic thing. It is not radical. It is not radical at all. I want to thank all my brothers and sisters, um, Black, Brown, Latinx, queer, disabled, um, and native folks, uh, I hear you. I hope that you council members hear us. Um, and 
and I hope we see change. Um, we'll keep showing up in the streets, we'll keep showing up and, and doing this action, and, and, and I hope to be, become a proud resident of uh, Northampton and a proud of the area. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. Um, Bob Wilson. Yeah, hi, uh, Bob Wilson, uh, resident of Northampton, Ward 3. And, you know, I, I obviously with uh, what, what's going on with the pandemic, <clears throat> this is a whole new format for this type of thing. I remember being, I don't remember exactly how long ago, but everyone packed into the room when it was uh, us, you know, a group of people uh, pushing back against the purchase of all the riot gear. And I can't get over what a great effort everyone's done to stick on for five hours um, to tell their stories and to be very rational and very prepared. Um, and I, I just applaud them. I'm so thankful that I live in a community where that's true of this many people. And I have to say, I'm very disappointed in the condescending tone uh, that we got from Bill. Bill, I'm very disappointed in you. I'm very disappointed in you, David, for your condescending tone. Uh, and and Chief Casper is so tone deaf and so, you know, I, I can't imagine working in an environment and that's someone's evaluation of training programs is it's just so unprofessional. It, it's, I'm like, what year is this? 1964? Like that, you know, we've really come a long way, baby, kind of thing when it comes to, to, to just that kind of process. So I have it's zero faith for me in her ability to lead. There's no leadership in the way that she's handling this or the way she responded to questions uh, today. Uh, that's it. I will yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, Jake Carroll is next. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm Jake Carroll. I'm a resident of Ward 3. Um, I came in a little bit late to this meeting because I was at the protest in Springfield tonight. Um, I grew up in the Springfield area. I now live in Northampton. Uh, I think if I wish that you had all been there to see the absolute failure that policing is. Um, it was a beautiful protest with lots of people marching of all different colors and chants and all sorts of stuff. And people got to the police station and justifiably voiced their frustra frustrations and concerns. And it was um, emotional, but it was under control until the police decided to in mass um, line up in front of the protesters in their riot gear for quite frankly, no reason. They were under no threat. We were there for five plus hours. There was never any threat to them until they tried to escalate it. Um, I think that this is just emblematic of the role that police play every day in society. I cannot imagine what it's like to be a person of color, especially a black person in this country. I am a white person. And when I am around police, I am nervous every single time. I consider the way I walk, I consider the way I move. Does this look normal? Am I doing anything wrong? I cannot even imagine what it must be like to be black and to actually fear for your life every single time you step out the door. I think it's time for us to be progressive. If we really want to be, be, be progressive, we need to not just, not just take baby steps. We need to take big steps. We need to do something big. It's, it's time to make a change, I think. And I hope that we can start with this budget tomorrow. And that's all I need for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, next is Lucy Sloan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, my name is Lucy Sloan. I am a Ward 4 resident, and I would like to thank everyone for their highly researched. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I would like to thank everyone for their highly researched ideas, and I I uh, just want to throw in one last one that I don't know if I've heard, and um, that would be police officer liability insurance. And I just want to throw that out for a suggestion for money, uh, where that money could go and be invested instead of towards the police department. And that's all I yield my time. Uh, thank you so much. 
Um, is there anybody else who has not spoken? So, Jake, I know that you want to speak again. I need to explain. So, our process is that everyone has equal time. So, I'm sorry that I can't give you more time because um, there'd be no way to be equitable about it. Um, everyone gets the same amount of time on the clock. Um, is there anybody else who would like to share a comment this evening? I, um, I'm trying to look in all the different ways I can look. And I don't see anybody else indicating so. Um, hold on one moment, there's a question. Yes, good point. Um, let me remind people how you raise your hand. Um, at the bottom of your screen, there's a toolbar for Zoom. If you click on the thing that says participants, I think there's like a little symbol of a person. Um, that's going to open up a participant window. At the bottom of that window, there is a raise hand uh, button. If you press that, then a, a hand pops up and you kind of float up to the top and I can see that your hand is raised. Okay, I don't see anyone else. Um, and so uh, we're gonna start to wrap up. I wanna remind everybody that um, we're not closing this public hearing. We are continuing this public hearing till tomorrow's meeting at 7 p.m. Um, and you can access the link for that on, um, on the agenda on the city website. So, um, so the meeting, the hearing will be continued to that point. Um, and you, I'm just sorry, I'm trying to say this and just make sure people are sending me messages. I want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Um, and if, if uh, one more chance, if, if someone wants to raise their hand, also, if you are on a phone, if you hit star nine, that should raise the hand too. Um, okay. Oh, wait, there's a phone. Hold on one moment. Phone number ending in 3653. Hi, I'm um, sorry, I was trying to before I was clicking the wrong number. Um, I'll make it quick, but I'm Carissa Regali and I am a Northampton resident who lives in Ward 1. I just want to thank everyone um, for staying on tonight. And it's really been powerful to hear everyone's messages. I do want to um, reiterate that I would like to defund the police department um, and redirect training, um, sorry, redirect um, funding, especially to social services and mental health services. I've experienced working in uh, mental health services in this area and have seen the turnover and have experienced what is now minimum wage for a position that requires a degree and just know how many obstacles there are, especially for um, black people and people of color who need to be represented in those positions to help heal this community. So um, just hoping to redirect funding to more productive and effective change. So, thank you. Well, thank you. I'm sorry, did you um, did you state your name and city or town where you're from? Yep, I'm Carissa Regali and I uh, live in Northampton in Ward 1. Th thank you so much. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. I will keep an eye on it as we um, start to wrap this up. So, counselors, I am going to need you for me to get back to where you are. None of you are on my screen in front of me because you've all been pushed elsewhere. Um, let me explain. So, again, this is being continued tomorrow till seven o'clock. Um, for this, the hearing will be continued, then the hearing um, will be closed. <laughs> and then um, we will go into the council, we will be in the council meeting and that in that council meeting is where the budget is on the agenda for the first vote um, and for deliberation. Um, okay. 
So I'm going to find counselors like fun game. Eleven forty seven. Um there's another one. Motion to uh hold on one sec, let me make Sorry. sure. Yeah. Still doesn't make you all visible to me, which is frustrating, but I think I have you mostly unmuted or all of you unmuted. Okay. Um, so the first thing we need to do is um, move to continue the oh. hearing. Motion to continue the meeting until tomorrow. Second. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded to continue the public hearing until tomorrow, which is June 4th. Four. Today, um, June 4 at 7 p.m. And we need a roll call on that motion. And the hearings are actually advertised for 7.05 p.m. Thank you, 7.05 p.m., apologies. And, okay, Councillor Foster? Yes. Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Councillor Labarge? I think she may have had to step away. Okay. Councillor Maori? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Wait. Hold up. Oh, you're not muted. Councillor Thorpe? I said yes. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, and Councillor Dwight? Yes. Okay. So the public hearing has been continued until tomorrow at 7.05. Um, now we need our final motion of the evening. Make a um, motion to adjourn. Oh, right. Second. Motion's been made by Councillor Quinlan, was that you? Yes. Yeah. Seconded by Councillor Dwight. Laura, roll call, please, when you can. Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Councillor Labarge, who stepped away. Councillor Maori? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. And Councillor Foster? Yes. Okay. Here, here, I want to just one more time thank everyone who joined us, who spoke, who stuck with us this entire evening. We are so thankful for your participation. Um, and thank you to everyone for your comments that only I could see um, and for your help and your tips. Um, I really, really deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Good night. Good night. Good night.